Hello, Vlad. Can you hear me, Vlad or Saeed? Saeed, are you there? Stephanie, are you there? Good morning, Doctor. Yes, I am here. Oh, I okay, good. Well, welcome. Well, welcome. I just, want, I just wanted to make sure the sound's working. Oh, okay. We'll be starting in about 45 minutes. Okay, how are you, John? Hey, Said, how are you doing? Fine, and you? Good. Uh, so, yeah, we got it arranged. I think your next webcast, right? Yes, yes. Okay, uh, very good. Very good. Yeah, we have to build up the infrastructure of the French, you know, community. Uh, you know, what do, I think we'll make progress. We just need to make some contacts within the community. Yeah. And hopefully get some kids that are enthusiastic and that can help promote. Um, Uriel from Peru helps with Instagram. He's pretty good at Instagram. Yes, he's, he's very interesting. Uh, Uriel is uh, active. Uh, yeah, he's very active on Instagram. Yeah, he's actually very active, yes. yes. So so we okay, have a chance to, to have it oh. uh, in our webinar. Okay, very good. Okay, I'll be back. Yeah, okay.
Buenos días, Griselda. ¿Cómo está, Griselda? Hola, John. ¿Cómo estás? Bien, gracias. Está en hospital, ¿eh? Sí, ya, ya regresé a trabajar. Ok, em empezamos en 30 minutos, ¿ok? Ok, perfecto. Yo necesito afatar. Necesito afeitar. Oh, ya, yeah, ya, yeah. afeitar, ok. Sí, sí, sí. Yo yeah, yeah, no De acuerdo.
That looks better, huh? Clean shaven. What you talking about? Oh, hey, Vlad, are you there?
Hello, Sam, are you there? Yes, I'm here. The mystery man. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank are you, you ready? To, are you ready to kick ass? <laughs> yes, I am ready. Okay, good. You got your camera, right? Okay. The camera's not on, Sam. Okay. okay. Hello, Sam. Hello. Hi. Hi, Sam. Are you there? Yeah, I yes, am. Hey, Harshad. How are you doing? Welcome. Hi, John. How are you? Good. Uh, welcome, Harshad. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Sam. How are you? I am fine. Thanks. Thanks for arranging this webinar. Yeah, Sam. Sam, Sam got the, got the talent. Hey, Sam. Uh, so I'm just going to introduce you, and you take over, right? You run the show. Yes. Yeah. And you moderate. You know, take questions or do what you need to do. Okay. Okay. Thank you, John. Yeah. As soon as yeah, please, Sam. After they're done the presentation, just jump in and say okay. Any, you know what I mean? Uh, well, you know what to do. You know what to do. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you've done. You've, we've done uh, lots more. Uh, we just got a big Russian one. Now that's. I was really happy because I think Russia would greatly benefit by this technology because the neurosurgery community is so spread out geographically, but by internet, it's like next door. I can see, I can hear the resounding agreement. Great job, Pam, you are doing.
Hey, Noor, how are you doing? Hi, I'm doing great. How are you doing? How you been? You've been quiet doing... lately. You've been quiet lately. Where have you been? Oh, yes, I've been a little uh, more occupied lately. Um, there were, you know, I don't know, but this uh, pandemic has uh, become a little bit more chaotic in terms of uh, the burden of work we do have. Uh, that is more than the clinical work and all these economic educational activities. So I've been really a little bit away. But uh, believe me, I've been just following all those recordings and I've been missing a lot attending all these live sessions. Very good. Welcome. Thank you. John. Yes. Can you make me a co host? Oh, yeah. And upgrade. Right. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Okay. And upgrade both of uh, I made to Benel. Uh, I'm sorry, what did you say, Sam? Okay. Uh, make me a co host. Yeah, yeah, you're co host now. Okay. Thank you. Okay. You know, Sam, you can, whenever someone needs to be let in, sometimes I'm a little slow because I'm doing other things. So keep an eye on the panel, okay? Okay. okay and you might see someone that needs to come in, so admit them, okay? Okay. Yeah, if you see them, like while they're talking, you know, while other people are presenting. Okay. Good day, Ahmad. Good day to you, Dr. Sameh. Nice meeting you in, on a Zoom this time, not on WhatsApp. Hi, John. Hey, hi, Ahmad. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Uh, I'm it's... seeing there are many on the panel that I am not acquainted with, but uh, I know Vladimir is there. Well, Vlad's here. Vlad, are you there yet? I, know I you see his lie. name. And uh, yeah. I see Suresh Naira. Said uh, Taha from Africa is here. Uh, Griselda is here from Mexico. Do, do you know, uh, do you know Ahmad uh, Griselda? No, actually, I know of the name, but not. Yeah, Mexico. she's a big educator in Latin America and in, in pediatric neurosurgery mostly. Uh, Griselda, I'd like you to meet Ahmad Kanan, the big, Hi, educator, nice you, uh, big educator from uh, Saudi. Hi, Miss Griselda. Oh. Nice meeting you. Hello. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Hi. Suresh, he just joined on with the picture. That's Hi, great. Yeah. Nice to see you, Vladimir, Rimad, all of you. Thank you. So, mm -hmm. Professor, Sameh, you, I, uh, Professor Sameh, if you uh, allow me, uh, I have to leave a little bit early. I have a flight to catch up later on. So I will be presenting most of the time, but later uh, you have to excuse me. Okay. Thank you, sir, uh, for uh, accepting our invitation. It's my honor uh, that it's you have my, accepted it. my great pleasure. It's a and, wonderful uh, I will manage. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Professor minutes, Alma, for minutes. accepting our invitation. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Well, Amal, good news. Uh, Albert's going to start televising from Russia. Wow, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hopefully on a regular Great. basis. Hopefully. hopefully. That, that country is made for Zoom. Yeah. It's made for Albert, it. Albert uh, is a very active neurosurgeon, but we'd like to see him more with us on the Zoom as well. Yeah, well, hopefully he's he's going to be on be Saturday, Saturday, Saturday morning early for you. It's 9 o'clock in Russia. It's probably pretty early for you on Saturday. Okay, but no, you'll, but... uh, you'll see the post. You'll, it'll okay, be posted. Wonderful. It'll be posted. Very good.
So, John, do you have an estimate of number of webinars going on every month? A lot, more and more, <laughs> more and more. But it's that's fine. That's fine. Uh, it's nice good? to be able to pick. Uh, which ones you want to go to rather than having to go to one. You can pick your pick. Yeah. Especially this, is the, this is the only things we say. Thank you for Corona introducing Zoom webinars to us and to make us more active. Oh, I tell you, Ahmad, when they had, we used Google Hangouts, which I think you probably knew. Yeah. Uh, that was a hard sell for doctors because That's they didn't true. understand what I was talking about. They would say, what do you mean? You, you, you're going to show me video? <laughs> no, uh, no, it's like television. But we had to convince them what it was. But now I assume we don't. You were the very first avant-garde on that subject. Yeah, well, I, no I, I, thought, I thought I saw a lot of potential in, in the use, educational use of it. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I'm glad to see people are, are seeing the same, same thing. Fine. I'd like to get Saudi on a regular basis too. Whenever you guys are ready, if you have any any ideas uh, in your community, if you're, whenever you're ready. Imad, hello. Hey, Vladimir. I do not have the image. And I do not Why have the possibility you, to switch you, on the camera. Your, your picture is not there. No, no. And the, there is no possibility to, to no icon to find to, to switch it on. Welcome, Matthias. I only shall listen. That's all right by me. Oh, I see. Good well, to well, hear your voice, but we'd like to see you. You're testing out your good morning. Good morning. But I morning, see you, everybody. Everybody. Okay. Thank you. Matthias is with us as well. Nice yes. to see you, Matthias. Did you want to Matthias. check for something, oh, Matthias? Happy, happy to see you, John, Imad, Vladimir. Yeah, thank you oh. for coming, Matthias. Did you want to check something on your uh, presentation? No, it's perfect. Oh, okay, it's on there, so let me just bump it off, okay? Okay. There, there we go. There was on there. What city is that in the background? Matthias, is it, what's it, what, it's a map of a city, obviously. Yes, it's, it's, it's the map of our uh, west coast. Oh, okay. And, you, and you have your background what is about? Yes. <laughs> you do not have any. Sorry? You do not have any West Coast, do you? In Argentina. Yes. But Brazilian coasts are really better. Uh, we we have beautiful coasts, uh, but anyway, I, I at least I prefer the Brazilian coast. Yes. It's like uh, it, the, the photo in the background of, of John, the Brazilian coast. In the Vladimir, of Brazil. this, uh, Vladimir, this is yes. like the extreme lateral approach. It is. <laughs> from lateral. They are the extreme. I understand that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Happy to see you, everyone. Thank you. John, what is the method that I do not have the icon to switch on the camera? I'm sorry, Vlad, we, we uh, asked you a question. On my screen, I only have mute and unmute button, but I do not have the button with the camera. Oh, you don't? With the, no. uh, you have a smartphone or regular? Because you've been no, on no, this No, no, I'm on a uh, notebook. The regular one as usual, as always. Oh yeah, I, I can't really. I do not need but... to be seen, of course. You know, I, I'm not. Yeah, yeah of course. <laughs> yeah, uh, notebook is that a device, uh, Vlad? Notebook is that a device like an iPad? Uh, I should try to leave and join again. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Re maybe just come back in, like reboot your computer. Uh, your computer I may be it. going to another program. All right. See you later. Yeah, just come back right in. Okay, cons here, uh, Sam. 
Okay, I am ready. Yeah, I got the name confused with uh, Dr. Kanan. Uh, <laughs> yes. But, but I straightened it out. Uh, I got confused myself as well. I thought I'm presenting. <laughs> well, when Sam sent it to me, I put your name in. He said, no, no, it's I, not Dr. Hi, Dr. It's Ken. Else. Nice hey, meeting Dr. you. Nice to meet you, Dr. Ken. So we are alike. Hey, Dr. Matthias, how are we doing? I'm fine, you? Thank you. Hey, Sam, hey, hey, hey John. Glad to see you too. We are related from the front to the back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I got you confused and put Dr. Kanan. Uh, and Sam said, no, no, it's not Dr. <laughs> Kanan. It's Khan, another neurosurgeon. Are you in the lab? Khan? Yeah, I'm, I'm in the skull base lab at UVA, at University of Virginia. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. How is the weather down there, Dr. Matthias? Here, here it's uh, uh, fun fantastic. Uh, today is a sunny day with uh, 45 degrees, 70, uh, 70 degrees. Oh, wow. And, and there? And here is uh, here's kind of warm. It's around like 70 degrees. And yes. yeah, the weather is really good here because we have four seasons, which of is uh, the good. Yes, it's, it's, it's great. Here in Argentina, it's exactly the same. We enjoy the very well demarcated four seasons. Yeah. yeah. We had like not snow, but anyway, it's cold on winter. <laughs> yeah. The weather here is like very similar to my back home, Turkey, and the yes. four seasons. It's true. Yes. You feel like in home. In, in yeah, some way. <laughs> so, Dr. Sami, do you have an expectation how many they are uh, registered for this webinar? Because the subject well, is very focused. I can yes, check right yeah. now. And Professor Atul is with us. Yeah, Ima. <laughs> Good to see you. The, the king is here. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Amar, I call him the king. He does so many webinars. <laughs> <laughs> the king is a king, king is a bit down at present. <laughs> oh, really? Slow, slow down. <laughs> no, 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 no way, oh, no so, way. Uh, Sanjiba is with us as well. Sanjiba. Hi, Sanjiba. Hello, nice to see you, Amar. How are you? Hi, hi Sanjiba. Hi. Thank you. Good to see Hello. you. Okay, Sam. Are you one minute? Okay, Sam. Okay. That'd be shot. Yeah, just keep an eye on that panel there. Let people in. How many registrations, John? Oh, okay. Let me check real quick. Okay. Uh, Four hundred, Sam, registered. Great, thank you. Okay, by YouTube. Here, really? here we here we go, Sam. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Good morning. This is Dr. John Bennett, broadcasting from Miami Beach, beautiful Miami Beach. Um, uh, we have we're collaborating with the EWNS of Egypt and uh, the. And with Sam L. Morsi, and Sam is going to run the show today. Welcome, Sam. Thank you, John. Dear friends, thanks a lot for accepting my own invitation to fourth session of EWNC Academy New Surgical Approaches Series, Brain Stem Approaches Series. Welcome all, and thank you all for accepting my own invitation. It's our honor to start our schedule with Professor Ahmed Kanan, and I will make him his turn. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sameh, for the kind invitation and for John running this Zoom webinar. It's my pleasure and distinct honor to join this group. I am not the master in that field on the brainstem, but I like to be part. 
And I can run the moderation uh, on this aspect. Um, I'm seeing expertise in that field and I'm glad to see them all. So without further ado, I think um, I will proceed to introduce the speakers. Uh, first, we have Professor Matthias Baldocini, is known to me and to uh, our committee, the Neuroanatomy Committee. He is an essential faculty on this committee. He is a professor from uh, the University of Buenos Aires in Argentina, and he ran the directorship of a Neuroanatomy Lab with major contribution in skull base and vascular, witnessed by a lot of publication and presentation. He's going to start talking about the neuroanatomy of neurosurgical anatomy of uh, brainstem. Go ahead, Matthias. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ima, for your, your kind presentation. Thanks, Samet and Morsi, for your uh, kind invitation. I'm really happy to be here uh, with so many friends uh, from who I learned during my uh, my residency training and, and nowadays to Professor Atul Goel, Sanjiva, uh, Professor Vladimir, all friends from, from this uh, passion that is the neurosurgery. And uh, happy to see you, Kant, too. Um, I learned so much from your publications about uh, brainstem anatomy, and it's a huge honor to me to be uh, sharing this, uh, this webinar which, with every, everyone. Okay, I will share my presentation. Can you observe properly my slide? Yes, yes perfect. Excellent. Uh, in the next minutes, I will introduce, uh, introduce the, um, the general, general aspect about the brainstem and the neurosurgical anatomy, focused in, in the general um, superficial anatomy of the three components of the brainstem, um, focusing in the neurovascular structures that are related with the midbrain bones and medulla oblongata, and uh, um, trying to describe the systems that are uh, in, in close relation with the surface of the brainstem uh, in order to, to be as an introductory lecture uh, about brainstem neurosurgical anatomy. Okay, this is a midline sagittal section of the, uh, of, of the brainstem. Um, it is important to remember that the brainstem uh, will, uh, the, the brainstem have a, an anterior surface, a posterior surface and lateral uh, surfaces that are related with different uh, structures uh, and the three components of the brainstem, starting from above to the inferior uh, segments. Uh, there are the, the, mid, the midbrain or mesencephalon is the, is the part that is uh, in close uh, relation with the, the encephalon or, or, or the thalamus, the most medial portion of the central uh, brain central core. The pons uh, is the, the, the middle part of the, uh, of the of, of the brainstem and the, the caudal portion of the brainstem is, uh, uh, we, we, can, we will find the medulla oblongata or simply the medulla. In the, in the sagittal section, we will find that the brainstem is located uh, almost entry, um, almost completely in the posterior fossa, but the superior part of the, uh, of the midbrain could be located in the uh, supratentorial uh, space due to its close relation with the free edge of the, um, of the, of the tentorium. Um, this, is, this, is, this section is very important because we will uh, describe the, the close relationship with the different cisternal spaces with these three uh, segments of, of the brainstem. Here we will find the interpeduncular fossa the prepontine system, interpeduncular system, the premedullary system. Here we will find the, um, the, the cisterna magna, and here it's located the uh, quadrigeminal uh, system. This is very important because we can observe this uh, relation with the cerebrospinal uh, space, with the subarachnoid space, sorry, 
in the in the different MRI scans. Here is located the interpeduncular system, the prepontine system, the premedullary system, the cisterna magna, and here we will find the quadrigeminal system in close relation with the surface of the brainstem in the tree portion of this structure. In this beautiful anterior view of the, of the brainstem, <clears throat> we will find that the superior limit of the brainstem, it's well demarcated because we will find here the optic tract, the board, the inferior border of the, of the optic tract is the superior limit of the brainstem. In the caudal portion, there is uh, in, in the midline of the medulla oblongata, we will find some fibers, sometimes it's easy to observe it and in, in some uh, specimens are not so easy. We will find some fiber that cross to the, uh, to the contralateral side towards the midline, that is the, 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 the cortico pyramidal drug decusation, and the inferior border of this decusation will show us the inferior border of the medulla oblongata. Another uh, anatomical structure that we can use for um, uh, demarcate the inferior border of the medulla oblongata is the superior border of the first like um, dentate uh, ligament. Um, there is a superficial demarcation in the anterolateral surface and the, of the brain, brain stem. Here we will find the pontum mesencephalic sulcus that separates the midbrain to the pons. And here we will find, find the um, pontum medullary sulcus. And uh, in this anterolateral view, we will find the, uh, the rootless of the different cranial nerves from the third, the, the third cranial nerve, the, five, the, the fifth cranial nerve, the six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, and the 12th uh, cranial nerve. There is a, a, a cranial nerve that uh, the, um, emerges from the brainstem, the, from the posterior surface, that is the fourth cranial nerve or the trochlear nerve. In this anterior surface, we will find um, interpeduncula, the interpeduncular fossa and uh, in the lateral border of the interpeduncular fossa, we will find the uh, middle mesencephalic, uh, the anterior middle mesencephalic sulcus, that is uh, um, the, the beginning or, or, or the, uh, the, upper, the apparent beginning of the third cranial nerve. And there is a region very important um, that it's uh, fenestrated with a lot of uh, small holes where the thalamoperforated arteries uh, introduced to, the, to this substance to um, uh, irrigate the, especially the, the thalamus and some uh, hypothalamic uh, structures. The midbrain uh, will um, have a, a, an anterior surface. This is the interpeduncular fossa. And there is an important division uh, in the midbrain um, due to the uh, substantia nigra. The substantia nigra divide as the, um, the tegmentum uh, to the, um, to the, uh, the, the, pedu the peduncular, um, the, the, to the peduncular uh, in front of, uh, of this segment. This is very, very important. We will find here in this anterior surface, the, uh, these small arteries um, who start, which start from the basilar artery and from P1 segment, this is the thalamoperforating arteries, in this, and this is the, uh, the, um, the third cranial nerve uh, that uh, are crossing from the midbrain to the um, um, oculomotor triangle in the superior surface of the uh, of the um, uh, cavernous sinus. Here is located the interpeduncular system. Here we will find the crural system, the ambient system, and in this posterior surface related with the quadrigeminal plate in the posterior surface of the midbrain, we will find the quadrigeminal system. Very important uh, because some kind of pathology could be located in this region, especially the tumors uh, which grow from the pineal gland, and it's a complex region to um, achieve microsurgical, microsurgically. And here in this sagittal section of this T1, we, we will uh, observe the interpeduncular system, the crural system, the ambient system, and here uh, the quadrigeminal system. In this beautiful um, uh, 
cadaveric uh, specimen with mulligan uh, technique, we can observe this um, this uh, small hole that is the the the, the, the Sylvian aqueduct, and this is surrounded with some gray nucleus. And this is the uh, substantia nigra that we uh, that for sure can uh, can uh, will talk about the fiber tracks uh, in, in in the next present presentation. But it's very important to keep in mind that the the, the position of the substantia nigra divide us uh, the the um, the, mid, the midbrain or the mesencephalon in two important segments, an anterolateral segment and a posterior lateral segment with several division of these fibers uh, that uh, uh, cross towards um, the, um, the cerebral cortex. Uh, um, and it is very, very important. This is, the, this is a section uh, with Mulligan technique. Um, at the level of uh, the uh, the optic tract, the optic, we can observe here the optic tract surrounding the cere cerebral peduncle in this left section, and this uh, this is a beautiful dissection, uh, sorry, beautiful uh, coloration uh, of mulligan where we can observe the lateral geniculate ganglia uh, and the fibers that uh, arrives to this second neuron from uh, that is located in the in the uh, lateral geniculate ganglion. Here is located, as, uh, as, as I said previously, in the, in the, in the related with the uh, anterior surface of the midbrain, the interpeduncular fossa, and here we will have the quadrigeminal plate. The quadrigeminal plate covers the posterior uh, surface of the, the, the cilian aqueduct uh, or the mesencephalic uh, aqueduct, and uh, in, in, in the posterior, if we um, if, if, if we uh, observe uh, in, in this, uh, this surface from a posterior view, we will find the two, um, the, the two superior uh, colliculi and the two inferior colliculi in the right and in the left. That is, uh, these structures are uh, part of the auditory system and the visual system due its connection with the medial and lateral uh, genicolal body of the, uh, of the, of the thalamus. And um, here we will uh, observe the superior limit again of the of the midbrain, uh, demarcate, well demarcated with the um, optic tract arriving to the lateral genicular body in this section. This is the middle genicular body, and the lateral genicular body is uh, is here. And the the, um, the, the perimesencephalic cisterns. Are, uh, the, the, are composed by the group of the interpeduncular, crural, um, um, and the quadrigeminal uh, ambient and quadrigeminal system in the posterior surface. In this um, view, with uh, with more with more zoom, we can observe again this interpeduncular fossa and the posterior um, perforate, uh, perforated or, or fenestrated uh, substance. Uh, where it's full of uh, small branches from the posterior uh, circulation. This is very, very important. And this, this is the anterior view of the cerebral peduncle that is really, really important because we will find here fibers from the frontal, frontopontine um, circuit that arrive to the pontine nucleus in order to form the um, the, the, the fibers for uh, for the neocerebellum. In the center of this segment, we will find the corticospinal tract and laterally the fibers to the um, neocerebellum again, but from different the different lobes, from the temporal, parietal, and occipital lobe, of course. This is a beautiful dissection from a friend, Richard Parraga, from friend and colleague. Uh, the, uh, uh, this is a beautiful, beautiful dissection from a lateral uh, view of the of the midbrain, where we can observe the substantia nigra here, and here we will find the uh, red nucleus. This red nucleus is really a small nucleus, but it's full of connections that show us uh, the impression of uh, a huge uh, nucleus, but it's a it's an, a small nucleus. And uh, in order to uh, um, access in the uh, to the to the 
posterolateral and lateral surface of the uh, of the brain stem, uh, we can use the superior uh, su the supracerebellar infratentorial corridor in order to access to these surfaces, to the um, um, ambient cistern that is in, it's located in this segment. In this sector, we will find um, um, growing from uh, inferiorly to the um, inferior colliculi, the fourth cranial nerve. The fourth cranial nerve um, turns around the, the midbrain uh, previous to enter to the uh, free border of the dura mater in this, in this point. This is a, a very small nerve and we should uh, take care when we access to this surface. And here in this sector, um, there is an important structure that is the lateral mesencephalic sulcus. Uh, the lateral mesencephalic sulcus is the, uh, the lateral project projection of the substantia nigra. In other words, in front of the lateral mesencephalic sulcus, we will find the, the cerebral peduncle, and posteriorly, we will find the quadrigeminal plate or the tegmentum. This is an important landmark for uh, the safe entry zone to the brainstem, especially to the, to the midbrain. And there is two windows, the, superior, the supratrochlear uh, and infratrochlear window to access to this region. This is a pure posterior view of the midbrain with the quadrigeminal plate with the brachium conjunctivale that connect the superior and inferior uh, colliculi with the lateral and middle genicular body. Talking about the pons, the pons is the middle part of the, of the brain of the, of the brain stem and uh, the unique a cranial nerve that grows, that emerges from a uh, purely from the pons is the fifth cranial nerve, the trigeminal nerve, and grows from the superior third of the of the pons. Here, this is a beautiful view. The pons, it's uh, the posterior surface of the pons. It's a part of the floor of the fourth ventricle, and the anterior surface is related with the prepontine cistern, the prepontine cistern, and the lateral surface is, is form part of the, 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 the form the medial wall of the ponto cerebellar cistern. Very important structure because many, many pathologies should be achieved uh, entering to the uh, cerebellopontine system for operating tumor or neurovascular relation, uh, especially. In this beautiful sagittal um, MRI, we can observe the, the cerebral spinal fluid filling the prepontine system and the uh, ponto cerebellar system. In this anterior view, we can observe that uh, the pons, uh, the name of pon is because we have here like, like small bridging fibers that connect both cerebellar hemispheres. The, if we start to dissect this fiber, we will find like a, like a corpus callosum of the cerebellum forming part of this uh, commissural. Uh, the, the, there is not the, properly to use the name commissural, but it looks like, like this. Fibers that grow from their left and right hemisphere. And um, behind to this fiber, we will find the fibers that uh, form part of the uh, cerebro, cerebral uh, pontine um, fibers and fibers that are part of the uh, cortical spinal tract that uh, once it passes the pons uh, re, uh, are compacted again in this segment that are the, that are the pyramids of the, of the medulla oblongata in order to cross uh, mostly of this fiber to the, to the midline. Um, here, another beautiful dissection from Richard. Um, we can observe these fibers well dissected. Of course, can will explain it perfectly in, in the next presentation. But it is interesting to observe that there is a, this located this crossing fiber. There is three three uh, layers of the main. Uh, uh, fiber that grows from one hemisphere to the other, the superficial, medial, and deep uh, deep fibers that cross, and the name of this uh, deep fiber are trapezoid um, body. 
Here it's located the fifth cranial nerve. Here we can observe the fifth cranial nerve. And the point, the, the entry point of the fifth cranial nerve, it's an anatomical landmark, very, very important because we can divide from this point medially the anatomically, it's located the pons, and laterally the middle cerebellar peduncle. In this beautiful old uh, rotten dissection, um, um, a, a, and this is an, an anterior view of the of the brainstem, and mostly uh, the 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 pond had has been removed in order to observe that in the posterior surface of the pons we will find the fourth ventricle. It's very very important because the posterior surface of the of the pond forms entirely um, part of the anterior wall or the floor or the rhomboid fossa of the fourth ventricle. Here it's uh, the, the, the region where the fifth cranial nerve um, entry to, uh, to the pons, to the brainstem. And in this point, it's very, very important to separate the, the middle cerebellar peduncle that are fibers that um, comes from the dentate nucleus. It is one of the, the main uh, um, fibers of exit of uh, the dental rubral or dental thalamic uh, uh, pathway. In this beautiful cross section with Mulligan technique, again, we can observe uh, this uh, with this blue, with the, this blue coloration, uh, the, the pontine nucleus. This pontine nucleus receives the fiber from the frontal lobe, temporal, uh, parietal and occipital lobe from different kind of information in order to give this information to the contralateral cerebellar hemisphere uh, in order to start the neocerebellum function um, that it's uh, um, uh, the, one of the, the, the main function is to coordinate the, the fine movements and delicate uh, movements that we do daily as for example neurosurgery. And uh, here it's located the, um, the middle cerebellar peduncle. Another beautiful section here, we can observe the fifth cranial nerve, the floor of the four ventricle that it's uh, here the, the, the represented by the posterior surface of, of the pons, of course. And here we will we'll observe the superficial fibers, the medial fibers and the posterior fibers. And of course, on the floor of the four ventricle, we will find it in the blue color because it's mainly represented by um, by nucleus that form uh, part of the floor uh, of the fourth ventricle. About the medulla, the medulla is the lower part of the MRI brain stem. Then, uh, diffusion restriction, uh, diffusion restriction, right ACM territories. Sorry, uh, uh, the, the, the medulla oblongata, uh, or, the, or simply the medulla, is the lower part of, of, of the brain of the brain stem. Uh, in front of the medulla, we will find the premedullary sister. The cerebellum medullary system laterally, the cerebellum medullary system where it could be crossing the, the, the pica artery. And in the posterior surface of, 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 the, of the medulla, the, the, the superior part will be part of the uh, rhomboid fossa or, or, the, or, the posterior, or the floor of the fourth ventricle. And we, in this portion, we will find the cisterna magna, this is the, the the biggest cisterna of our of our brain, and of course, anterior to the medulla, uh, it's crossing the vertebral arteries and the um, the, the spinal uh, the anterior spinal arteries that uh, um, are crossing uh, in close contact with the anterior surface of the uh, medulla oblongata. Of course, uh, if we uh, observe this. Uh, this anatomical detail is easy to recognize in the in, in MRI, the premedullary system and the cerebellomedullary system posteriorly. Here we are inside of the four ventricle, but if we use an inferior uh, section of this MRI, we will find the cisterna magna. Very interesting. And in this point, we will find the obex. Yes, the obex is the lower. Uh, the lower part of the of the four ventricle, and in this place will be located the um, the, the the foramen of Magendi, that is an exit point uh, of the cerebral spinal fluid from the four ventricle to the cisterna magna. In this anterior view, we will find an um, 
sorry, an, um, an anterior medial sulcus, the pyramids that is represented by the fibers that form the cortical spinal tract in the medulla oblongata. And laterally, we will find these um, structures that are the olives. The olives is a, are a random structures um, and they are longest in the cephalocaudal direction. And there are important sulcus related with the olives, the pre Pre, pre olivaris sulcus and retro olivaris sulcus, where the fibers of the um, hypoglossal nerve, uh, um, the rootless, uh, uh, are located in the pre, in the pre olivaris sulcus. In the, in the retro olivaris sulcus, especially in the superior, uh, in, the, in the fossa, in su, uh, super olivaris fossa, we will find the nine cranial nerve, the, the, ten, the, the 10 cranial nerve, and the 11 cranial nerve in this place uh, located. It's very important to re remember that we will find in the medial segment, the anterior median fissure. Um, I don't know why, yeah. Okay. Sorry. It's important to remember that we have here the anterior median fissure, the pre olivaris sulcus, and retro olivaris sulcus. And here we will find the ponto medullaris sulcus. The point um, uh, laterally to the inferior uh, foramen caecum, we will find the, the fibers of the sixth cranial nerve, and more laterally, uh, superiorly to the supra olivaris fossa, we will find the seven and eight cranial nerve glowing in this, in, in this sector. Laterally to the su superior olivari uh, fossa, we could uh, observe uh, some uh, this different structure. This is uh, plexus choroideus that is uh, going out of the uh, fourth ventricle, ventricle through the uh, foramen of Lushka that is located from the right and the left uh, side. Uh, this is very important. If we introduce a dissector through the foramen of Flushka, we will uh, be inside of the lateral recess of the four uh, of the four ventricle. Here we can observe the fibers in a compact way, uh, shape uh, here in the, in the, in the, in the midbrain. At, at the level of the bones, the fibers are not so compact because the fibers uh, uh, find the crossing fibers of the uh, of the bones, and here we will find we can dissect again the fibers in a compact shape uh, uh, um, before to cross in the midline in order to the uh, cerebral spinal cord uh, the accusation in the inferior border of the medulla oblongata. Another beautiful dissection. Here we can observe the cortical spinal tract uh, crossing the different segment of the of the brainstem. Of course, can can uh, Yagmuro will speak in in close detail about uh, this uh, beautiful fiber. Remember that the olives are um, uh, the, the the dimension then of the olives are the, uh, thirteen millimeters uh, in the anterior posterior cephalocaudal uh, direction and lateral uh, direction seven eight millimeters and no more. In this uh, Mulligan uh, dissection, we will find in the deepest portion of the olive, we will find this nucleus that is similar to the dented nucleus of the cerebellum. That the name is olivary inferior, sorry, a superior olivary nucleus that is here located and we can observe it perfectly. And here the surface that is related with the inferior portion of the four ventricle. This is the, <clears throat> the rhomboid fossa that is not um, a topic for today, but remember that the posterior surface of the pons and the, mid, uh, the, the superior portion of the, of the medulla oblongata are part of the floor of the four ventricle or the rhomboid fossa in this uh, in this segment with several important structures that different nucleus that are located in this sector um, and are really really important but it's an, another topic that uh, this is um, the four ventricle and um, 
the last uh, that I want to uh, observe here is that here the the the, the rule of the, the of the three uh, are really important in posterior uh, cranial fossa because the brainstem have three segments: the midbrain, the pons, and medulla oblongata. Um, the cerebellum have three surfaces: superior and petrosal uh, and uh, suboccipital. Um, uh, surface and there is three kind of fiber connection between these those uh, these two structures that are uh, through the superior cerebellar peduncle that is located here the middle cerebellar peduncle is the the biggest one and the inferior cerebellar peduncle or a restiform body uh, that connect the uh, medulla oblongata with the cerebellum and this is all, sorry for the delay. And again, thank you very much. It's a huge pleasure to be here with so many friends from around the world. Thank you, Matthias, for this wonderful overview of the mainly the anatomical structure and the surface landmarks that are very essential for uh, potential clinical application and surgical intervention. Uh, we are privileged to take one or two comments on that subject. If somebody wants to add something or have questions, then feel free. Otherwise we will move to the next speaker, but I give the option. It seems all well digested and very nicely covered, uh, Matthias. So thank you very much. I'm going to move to uh, Professor Jawal Sahdif. I hope I pronounce your name correctly. He is a very active neurosurgeon, and I know uh, he has some association with Atul as well. They have published together. Atul has been the, the godfather of uh, many of the people in that aspect. And um, also Sandeep is, uh, I think he is working in Apollo or he moved uh, from the Apollo, he's still. And he is a full professor and at Kim Hospital and Chid and GS Medical College in uh, Mumbai. Mumbai is a production of neurosurgeons. Dr. Suresh, don't get disappointed, Kerala too. So, Professor uh, Sahdeep, please go ahead. To, he will talk about the fiber anatomy of the brainstem, which is an important part as well. You need an entry zone, you need the door to open, but you need to meet the anatomical structure inside uh, to not to touch them and injure them. So, go ahead, please, Professor Sahdeep. Are you with us? Unmute yourself, Professor Sakti. We are not hearing you. Uh, uh, good, uh, good evening, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Yes. I am trying to share my screen. Uh, so uh, it's an honor to be here with the, all the such great personalities and all the seniors and the colleagues. First, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Sam for giving me this opportunity and uh, uh, and, and, and it's an honor to be here with all the professors and especially uh, Ken is here. So he's been an inspiration for this work. And most of this dissection was done by me and my fellow colleague, uh, Max Milano Nunez, he, who's also from Argentina. So he's made a significant contribution also here. So coming to the dissection and uh, intrinsic brainstem anatomy. So most of this excuse dissection- me, Excuse me, excuse me, your screen share is stuck. Can you re oh. reboot it, recharge it? Uh, yeah, it's stuck. We're not moving at all. Okay, yeah, try it again. Just, just go over it again. Okay. Oh, this is actually a new lap laptop. Okay. I'm using it You're for the off. first time. Okay. Uh, so can can everybody see it? Yes. So most of the section was done in the UPMC Pittsburgh and some was in the KEM hospital in Mumbai. So brainstem coming to the topic. So I will be talking about the intrinsic anatomy as a professor Mathias is beautifully shown on the landmark and external anatomy. 
so he's told us about the boundaries of the brain stem how brain stem is connecting the cerebrum to the spinal cord so it's just not a connection it is just not a conduit it is basically there is lot of reorganization of the fibers if you see fibers they start to have the decussation there is motor decussation there is sensory decussation and there are a lot of gray matters uh, which are involved who give rise to all almost all the cranial nerves from the brain stem except optic and the olfactory if you see from 3rd to 12th all the cranial nerves they come out through, uh, from the brain stem and they have their nucleus in the brain stem and only the fourth cranial nerve which is arising uh, posteriorly most of them are arising from the ventral surface of the brain stem so brain stem is a very compact neural structure with lot of uh, neural uh, this uh, anatomy so you have to understand how these fibers are related to uh, each other and to various surface landmarks so when you are operating and uh, dealing with lesions in this areas of course uh, many time people say that in the pathology you see the all these anatomy is distorted so there is no point but if you see clearly there is always a pattern which these pathologies follows they they have a way of growing so they will displace the fibers and these fibers will of course guide you to the uh, uh, lesion to the safest possible lesion the most uh, this is the vision which we mostly use from uh, posterior uh, when we go from red suboccipital sites so what i did was i tried to have this landmark from three uh, aspects of the brain stem so one is the ventral which is the most prominent part of the brain stem then we have a uh, dorsal aspect which is the floor of the fourth ventricle and of course then there is a lateral aspect which is the uh, our C cp angle and all other approaches so if you see from this classical picture of the ventral brain stem ventrally brain stem is very uh, pons is the most prominent region if as shown by uh, as we already know so pons has a lot of transverse running fiber and in between there is a uh, this uh, longitudinal running our efferent pathway or the motor pathway which is very critical pathway and we have to understand how it is related to other structure so we can enter the uh, 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 through some safe pathway to deal with the uh, pathologies which are intrinsic to the brain stem so you can see cerebral peduncle some pyramidal tract then there is decussation and then it goes to the lateral uh, part of the spinal cord so on deep dissection if you see once you take out this uh, motor part then there is a medial lemniscus which is a very prominent uh, intrinsic path uh, again it's a sensory uh, system which is after decussation it's uh, it's as a ribbon kind of it divides the brain stem into dorsal and ventral parts so this uh, is also a critical part of the uh, brain stem then you have in the midbrain you have red nucleus then we have in the uh, medulla we have olives here so coming to the dissection parts, as uh, told by Professor Alria, there is a lot of crisscrossing of the fiber. There is superficial uh, running transverse fiber. So these are basically transverse running fibers from one cerebellum to the other. And, uh, and they can be divided into superficial transverse and deep transverse by the corticospinal tracts. So if you see the corticospinal tracts here, we have the medial uh, part of the corticospinal, which is front. Uh, this is basically in the medial Three fifth, uh, we have corticospinal, and medial to it is the frontopontine fiber, and lateral is uh, temporopontine. So this is how these uh, peduncular fibers are arranged. So we can say this medial one fifth or maybe one fourth. You can say it is a little safer to uh, uh, have this access. So once you follow these fiber, they go into the pons, then into the medulla. So this is the deep, deep transverse running fiber here. You can see these are deep fibers, then there are superficial fibers. So if you are dissecting, you can dissect only in the one plane. You cannot dissect uh, both planes here. So this is again, if you go more deeper, you will start seeing more of the gray matter and the long tracks of uh, sensory lemniscus. This is the, again another specimen showing all the uh, dissection from frontal view. So this is the deep view. You know, you can see some part of the fourth ventricle is open. Then you have medial longitudinal fasciculus. Then we have a, a central tegmental tract, and then we have our uh, trigeminal, uh, 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 this long trigeminal nucleus with its tract. 
So there in the deep, you can see trigeminal tract going little, uh, it's little lateral here. Then we have medial longitudinal fasciculus, central tegmental tract. And if you see the, uh, this is all the, uh, uh, here we have opened all of the uh, midbrain and some part of the pons and the medulla to show the roof of the fourth ventricle. You can see coral plexus also. This is roof formed by the uh, uh, superior, cerebral, uh, superior cerebral peduncle with the dented nucleus here. So of course, this is not the practical view, but for the understanding, it is very helpful once you uh, know the, how these three dimensionally, these structures are related to each other. Again, showing the uh, same view with the, uh, here you can see the optic tract here and the middle three fifth of the corticospinal area with the corticobulbar fibers also included. And this is again, the surface landmark. And this is how this now, uh, now we are uh, tracing the transverse fiber. So if you trace the transverse fiber, you can see this is corticospinal is medially located. So uh, if you see the trigeminal, it is quite lateral here and the facial nerve is here. So we have a, a almost three fifth of the peduncle, which is occupied by corticospinal tracts here. So dorsal brainstem, which is the floor of the fourth ventricle, so floor, again, very uh, uh, anatomically important area because most of these uh, nucleus, which are gray matters, they are pushed to the back because of the large efferent and efferent pathways which are running in the, uh, in the dorsal part of the brainstem. So many times we have to approach, uh, which if the lesion is giving, this is the shortest possible way to reach here. So we, should, uh, we have to know some safe zones which are classically described in the literature and how they are related to various landmarks. We have a very prominent uh, median fissure here, then we have superior colliculus, and then we have the hypoglossal triangle here and the stria medullaris. So we'll try to see them in, the, in a specimen also. So on deep dissection, you can see the, how these nucleus are related to the, uh, uh, your uh, floor of the fourth ventricle. Of course, these are superior colliculus, inferior colliculus, then this is the trigeminal here. So this is the lateral view. These are all classical picture we all uh, understand, but just for a perspective, I have put it here. So this is the view of the same view with the dissection. If you see, this is the superior colliculus, uh, inferior colliculus. This is the superior. This is the pulvinar here. We have here the uh, pineal gland. And if you see this, the uh, frenulum villi, which is the longitudinal extension of the cruciate sulcus between all the quadrigeminal bodies and you have just below it uh, the arising of the uh, uh, trochlear nerve and this is of course the uh, here we have the lateral lemniscus and the superior cerebellar peduncle so once you remove the part of the cerebellum now you can see how these things are related we have here is the inferior colliculus trochlear nerve these are superior cerebellar peduncles and then we have the dented nucleus here and the other cerebellar nucleus which are related to this thing so this is again now if i remove one side of the uh, this thing of the uh, superior cerebellar peduncle you can say more of the dissection of the floor of fourth ventricle facial colliculus which is actually the nucleus of the abducens nucleus and around which our facial nerve is going around this ascending part of the facial nerve so it is technically a six nerve nucleus which forms the facial colliculus so if you see on the one side here is the facial colliculus then you have sulcus limitans and we have uh, this uh, locus ceruleus which is a pigmented part of the uh, trigeminal uh, this uh, pigmented cells which form the uh, dark area on the floor these all landmarks are very helpful but of course with the diff uh, with all the pathologies sometimes it is difficult to uh, have them uh, so clearly but if you know this anatomy you can have a better idea. So this is the uh, stria medullaris here. Then we have the uh, hypoglossal triangle. Later is the vagal triangle here. And we have our vestibular and cochlear areas, facial uh, colliculus, suprafacial and infrafacial uh, approaches. Of course, Khan will describe in his talk. So coming to the dissection again, this is again the if you see it is narrowed down, if you go up and these tracks can be very close to each other and not very safe area here. And similarly uh, in the below a captus circuptorius, like a very uh, apex of this lower triangle, of course, all the uh, 
critical uh, nucleuses are there. So again, uh, if you see from the side view, this is the middle peduncle boundary is of course fifth nerve. This is the pons and after the fifth nerve, we have the middle cerebral peduncle, which are again transfer stunning fibers. On top of that, you, you have a, this lateral limniscus, which is again a very important landmark with the lateral sulcus here of the midbrain, which can give uh, you a entry point into the brain stem. So this is a deep dissection. As you know, these uh, transverse fiber, they just separate these uh, corticospinal uh, uh, tracts into fasciculus. So the, these are small fasciculus. And the, we have lateral lemniscus, which is arising from trapezoid in the medulla and going to the uh, geniculate bodies, uh, medial geniculate body, and which is part of the auditory pathways. And then we have the our sensory pathways, which is just uh, medial to this. It's the deep dissection. So this is the lateral view. Here we have uh, technically, uh, practically, if you see this fifth nerve, it is quite lateral. It and it is on the upper surface of the pons. But of course, if it is in the middle of the from the center, but if you see it is in the uh, very much on the upper surface of the pons. So this is the view. This is the trigeminal here, and we have the uh, seventh, uh, eighth nerve here, and the abducens nerve is more medial, which is in line with the hypoglossal nerve. So peritrigeminal areas are considered to be the safe entry zone to the pons here. Of course, this is the view from a cut section, substantia nigra again, giving, going to the lateral sulcus here. And if you see the faint impression here, you can see the red nucleus. And in between the red nucleus and uh, your substantia nigra, this area, we have the medial, uh, middle lim limniscus here, which is then shifted upwards. So of course, the external arcuate fibers over, over the olives. Medulla, again, is a very narrow structure. There is practically, you see, there is no safe area here. It's all, all these structures, with they are very much close to each other. But this is the view of the cut section from the uh, showing the roof here. And we have the six nerve nucleus here and the uh, facial nerve here. So this is again showing the track of six nerve going into the uh, ponto medullary sulcus here. So this is again a cut section with the cerebellum, roof of fourth ventricle, floor of uh, fourth ventricle. And of course, this is again how this uh, fifth nerve is related to rest of the pons and deep dissection. So technically we have uh, very prominent corticospinal tracts running in the front and we have a lot of nucleus in the back. So if you know how they are related, then of course these are this is a helpful for approaching and for approaching also you need access. There are all the nerves and arteries, small perforators around the brain stem. So this is again endoscopic view. You can see how this basilar artery is magnificently covering the uh, pons here. Then it is uh, vertebral arteries here. Then we have all the cranial nerve. We have the 12th nerve here. Then we have uh, 9th, 10th, 11th, this is the 7th nerve. This is again a, a loop of Ica going here. And we have 6th nerve very obliquely going. 5th nerve quite behind. This is a frontal view. So from, but just to show how this all cranial nerves and all the vessels are related. So just to approach that area, you also have to deal with all these nerves here. You can see basilar artery and vertebral artery cut section here. And this is the jugular foramen. This is from the behind, you have loops of pica here, which will come in your way. You should know how to handle them, how to make a telovular tonsillar approach, up, open the floor of the fourth ventricle. Then once you reach there, then you can, of course, uh, know how, where are safe zones, how to enter and all. First, you have to reach there also. So this is again, CP angle view from the posterior side. Again, this will give access to some part of the medulla here, some part of the pons once the cerebellum is relaxed and the, you get this beautiful access and a lot of uh, you can say lateral part and the posterior part of the brain stem can be accessed through the these approaches so uh, with this i conclude thank you thanks for the
Thank you very much, uh, Sam. Sukdeep, Sam yes. Sukdeep. Yeah, Sukdeep. I have difficulty with the pronunciation, yes. but I'm coming uh, used on your um, name as well. Yes, uh, thank wonderful you. presentation, very nice sampling of this uh, blueprint for the surgeon to if they decided to go into the brainstem. Yeah. It used to be a place where we called in French, Natushpa, don't touch me. Mm -hmm. And um, now uh, many, they try to touch this area when it has pathology. And we have some good results in uh, the microsurgical technique. So open for comment or uh, suggestion, uh, questions. You did not cover uh, something about the reticular formation and the anatomy. Uh, did you leave it to your colleague who's talking about more on fibers or intentionally because this is an area yes. all the young trainees have to be careful with it as well, especially if they are going into pedunculae and they're going backwards or from the back to the front, the aqueductal mm -hmm. gray and all these structures, they are very essential sensitive structure that can affect not only cranial nerve deficit, but avoidance of the patient. Yes, yes, of course, the reticular system is very important. I, I didn't cover it and it's not possible, I think, to make it uh, dissection wise. So, yeah, but so maybe uh, hint others it, can think. help me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, so the things not... you show cadaver. Cadaver, yeah. you can show where the periaqueductal is, but <laughs> okay. you cannot dissect it on a, on a live dissection. Yeah, yes. It won't be beneficial for us. Yes. yes. Any comment or questions? Uh, about reticular formation, uh, Dr. Karen has a great point, but I also agree with this, Sohti, because it's, the, it's separated out in the brain stem. So just next to the midline, the both side, median sulcus, is difficult to show in cadaver. Uh, actually, but it's mm -hmm. that's really important point because some of authors uh, don't recommend, you know, the enter to the brainstem through the median median sulcus of the floor of the fourth ventricle because when you enter that point, both sides reticular formation are you put to both you know reticular formation bilaterally at risk. So some you know the the surgeons don't recommend, but also you know the some surgeon still using the median sulcus as a, as a safe anti-zone about the facial colliculus. Yes. What, ab what about the lamniscus? There uh, are some uh, transverse fibers in the uh, midbrain that uh, they are not frequent, they are aberrant. Are uh, there any values of talking about lamniscus? And there was uh, as well in the brainstem and the pons, the the triangle, the lamniscus triangle. Is this within the area of uh, easy access or difficult access, or we don't talk about this much? Yeah, it's, uh, it's speaking of the medial lamniscus. Yes. Uh, the medial lamniscus is considered as the most tolerant fiber track for surgical manipulation in the brain stem. So they already, you know, the Satib and the Matios, Dr. Matios are the show beautiful dissection. I'm going to show some medial lemniscus dissections too. But in the practical, you know, we usually target to enter the medial lemniscus in the brainstem. It's, it's relatively easier to find from the surface and also most tolerant fiber tract for surgical manipulations, I would say. I think I'm sure the, the, the surgeon, they are invited to this as well. They are going to take about it later, about the approach itself to reach this anatomy. And I'm Absolutely. sure Dr. Marcus and Dr. Lauten will be part of this discussion. Yes. So hey, I must uh, ask yeah, one question. Yeah. I'd say, I just want to know the relationship of dendrite nucleus to superior cerebellar pedangle. It's important because we operate on posterior fossa tumors. Patients develop cerebellar mutism. If they can show the anatomy, a uh, better relationship of uh, dendrite nucleus to uh, superior cerebellar pedangle. If anybody so can I, highlight. I agree with this point very much because we confronted with this clinically. Mm -hmm. So it's it, it, uh, that was not covered the cerebellar part. Maybe uh, Kanan will have those pictures. So of course, cerebral, cerebral peduncle that arises from dendrite uh, from the medial dorsomedial side, then it goes 
uh, below these uh, inferior colliculus and then, the, then there is decussation of these fibers going to the red nucleus. So maybe that was not covered here. Okay, we have another talk, I think. Yes, uh, yes. So we, we can have we cover three, four lectures from the anatomy, so maybe, All right. yeah. I think without further ado, Dr. Sami, I will give you over the moderation and I thank all the speakers. At the end of these talks, there will be a panel meetings and discussion. I hope it will be an interesting discussion. Professor Sami. Thank you, thank you, Professor. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Professor Matthias uh, and uh, Professor Lieb for this uh, e excellent uh, presentation. Thanks to dear Professor Ahmed Kanan for uh, uh, excellent uh, moderation. And now I'd like uh, to uh, introduce my uh, best friend, mm -hmm. Professor uh, Adiba Abida Shah. Professor Abida Shah is uh, Associate Professor in uh, this uh, hospital and one of my uh, best colleagues and uh, helped me a lot to gather all these conferences. Uh, now uh, we will we will hear uh, it about it, uh, this nice uh, excellent presentation. We are waiting for you, Abida. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Thank you for this invitation, and it is a great honor to be among this group of stalwarts. <clears throat> so today I'm going to discuss a novel way of looking at the fiber anatomy of the brainstem. As you know, I've been working closely with Professor Goyal, who is my mentor. And for this, most of the anatomical work I have done with Subdeep and for the brainstem, even Dr. Nunes. So he has presented the study of the fiber dissection by, by the anatomical work. Now, what we have known is the brainstem is made up of both gray matter and white matter. So the gray matter composition is the cranial nerve nuclei and the native brainstem nuclei. Now, the white matters, we have always seen them in a cross-sectional way. For all brainstem, we've always studied brainstem with cross-sections. If we look at them longitudinally, you will realize that there is a very unique arrangement of these fibers. Just like we have uh, association, commissural, and projection fibers in the cerebrum, the fibers of the brainstem, we have, we have divided it into these four groups. So you have the short and long projection fibers traversing fibers, association fibers, and the middle commissural fibers or the decussations. The short and long projection fibers go through the brainstem and connect the brainstem to different parts of the brain. The traversing fibers actually just pass through the brainstem without having a relay in the brainstem. Association fibers connect mainly the brainstem and the spinal cord. And the decussations, which are there at various levels, are similar to the commissural fibers. So the midbrain has three decussations, the pons has two decussations, and the medulla has another two decussations. So if you look at the brainstem, the brainstem can be compared to this Greek god Atlas, who is holding the Celestian heavens in his both arms. So when you look from ventrally, the cerebral peduncles form the arms which hold up the cerebrum. And when you look from dorsally, it is the superior and inferior brachium combined together which hold the thalami on their arms. So the whole brainstem is held together by the strong arms. So now we are going to look at the fiber anatomy of the brainstem, which Subdeep has so beautifully demonstrated. And this is the tractography image depicting the various fibers of the brainstem. So how do we classify these brainstem fibers? So I've done them into three zones. Zone one is the short projection fibers. These run a small length. They basically connect the brainstem to adjacent areas, as I will show you. Zone two consists of traversing fibers and long association fibers. These are basically fibers that run across the brainstem from the cerebrum, and they consist of the long ascending and descending tracks. And the zone three is the association fibers and the decussations. As Professor Kanan mentioned, the zone three also has all the nuclei of the reticular formation, all the gray matter of the reticular formation in its, in its uh, area. And as we will see later, this is a no entry for the brainstem. So let's see how these zones are divided. You imagine three cylinders. So the first cylinder is zone one. 
So this consists of these fibers, the fibers that connect the brainstem to adjacent geniculate bodies and cerebellum. So basically it is the superior, middle and inferior cerebellar peduncle, the superior and inferior brachium and the lateral lemniscus. So if you see from the ventral aspect, you just see the middle cerebellar peduncle. Now these are cross-sectional images. And if you see the circles here, the blue circles are all zone one, the yellow circles are all zone two, and the green circle right in between are zone three. I'm going to run you through these zones as we go further, but this is just to get a general overview. So they are like three cylinders into each other. The first cylinder is not complete because the anterior part of the brainstem does not have any fibers of zone one. So this is just a dorsal and uh, ventral view of the brainstem where you can see this blue cylinder is zone one, this yellow re region is zone two, and this grain area is zone three. Why, am, why are we dividing this? Because we, it, this has surgical relevance, as I will show you later. So as we saw, zone one is the short projecting fibers. These run a short length, and they're connecting the brainstem to the adjacent thalamus and to the cerebellum. So if you see this, this is the dorsal view of the brainstem. Here you can see beautifully the floor of the third ventricle, which marks the superior limit of the uh, dorsal view of the midbrain. Here you can actually see the massa intermedia connecting the two thalami. This is, of course, the pineal body, the superior and inferior colliculus. The anatomy has been covered beautifully and the superior and inferior brachium. So if you see zone one, where are the areas that are safe to enter? enter? And of course, Dr. Khan will discuss the safe entry zones in his lecture, but I will just show you with respect to the fibers. So the superior brachium here is zone one. Inferior brachium is zone one. Superior cerebellar peduncle is zone one. The middle cerebellar peduncle going up and the lateral lemniscus is zone one. Here again, you see some fibers of the superior cerebellar peduncle and lateral lemniscus. And in this region, the inferior cerebellar peduncle. And when you see from ventrally, the middle cerebellar peduncle. So as you see, this is a three-fourth of a cylinder. And the relevance of this is it provides a safe entry zone to enter the brainstem. Zone two are the traversing and the long projection fibers. The traversing fibers are these fibers, which do not relay in the brainstem. So anteriorly, this is the corticospinal tract. And in the lateral aspect, just medial to the cerebellar peduncles, this is the spinal lemniscus and dorsal and ventral spinal cerebral tracts. And the long projection fibers are those which have a relay nuclei in the brainstem. So this is the medial and trigeminal lemnisci, the corticobulbar and corticopontine tracts, the corticobulbar as they end in the various cranial nerve nuclei, and the corticopontine as they run to the pontine nuclei, the reticulospinal, rubrospinal, and vestibulospinal tracts. So this is a mid sagittal cut of the brainstem. If you see this yellow circle here, this is zone one. This is the superior cerebellar peduncle. And if you see this blue circles here, this is zone two, which consists of the corticospinal tract. And as you go inferiorly at, from the pons to the medulla, the medial lemniscus. And this purple area here, which is right in the middle of the brainstem, is the zone three, which consists of the central tegmental tract, the MLF, and the tectospinal and tectobulbar tracts. So again, from the ventral aspect, this is the region of the corticospinal tracts, which comes in zone two. So when you look from the floor of the fourth ventricle, as Khan just mentioned, that this is the area where it is safe to enter. This is the area of zone two, which has the medial lemniscus and the trigeminal lemniscus in this area. And inferiorly here, you have the dorsal spinal cerebellar tracts, which are just medial to the inferior cerebellar peduncle. Lastly, the zone three, which is brainstem association fibers. And these are most important. You cannot damage these fibers, otherwise there'll be huge deficits. So the MLF, the tectobulbar tract, and the tectospinal tract, and the central tegmental tract. This is the area where all these tracts run. And that's why you do not enter the floor of the fourth ventricle in the midline. So basically the relevance of this classification is, if you want to enter the brainstem from zone one, it is relatively safe. Zone two, there are mixed areas and you should enter through the designated safe zones. And zone three is basically a no entry. So let's see this with a few examples. So on the ventral aspect of the brainstem, in this area are the frontopontine fibers. And this area is relatively safe to enter. We generally don't use this approach because of the long trajectory that comes from the orbitozygomatic approach. But of course, this is, presents a safe entry area to enter. And in the depth, it is limited by the substantia nigra and the red nucleus. 
if you have a lesion like this in the lateral part of the midbrain, most the most common entry that has been described for this is through the lemniscal triangle that is bordered by the lateral lemniscus, the inferior brachium, and inferiorly the superior cerebellar peduncle. But what happens if you have a lesion that is more in the part of the cerebral peduncle, displacing the corticospinal tracts? So we recently described a new entry point to enter, for ventrally placed intraaxial midbrain mid tumors. And this entry point is through the temporopontine fibers, as I will show you now. So if you see, this is a cut section of the midbrain. So this medial part, medial to the oculomotor nerve, presents a safe entry zone. This is the other one through the lateral lemniscus, lemniscal triangle, just after the lemnis, uh, lateral lemniscal, lateral mesencephalic sulcus. If you see here, these are the boundaries. This is the red nucleus, the medial lemniscus, and the substantia nigra. So if you see, the cerebral peduncle has three, can be divided into three parts. The medial one-fifths has the frontopontine fibers. The yellow part here, the middle three-fifths, has the corticospinal, corticobulbar, and corticopontine fibers. And this blue area here, the lateral one-fifths, has temporopontine fibers. So this area presents a safe area to enter for lesions that are placed in the cerebral peduncle, displacing the corticospinal tracts ventrally. So again, this is another cut section of the midbrain where you can see the substantia nigra with its beautiful pigmented color. This is the region of the red nucleus. This is the region of the medial lemniscus, and of course, this is the cerebral peduncle. So this is the entry that we described. So this you see is the lateral mesencephalic sulcus here. So this is the zone that you can enter to approach lesions that are ventrally placed. The approach that can be used is either a supracerebellar infratentorial approach after cutting the tent, or maybe you don't need to cut the tent. So once you dis uh, displace the cerebellum downstairs, uh, downwards, you see the entry point above the trochlear nerve and the trajectory to enter the ventral midbrain. So if you see this tumor, the solid portion of this tumor is exactly in the ventral aspect of the midbrain or in the interpeduncular fossa. And you see in the DTI images, the tracks are displaced ventrally. We approach this tumor through, a, through the temporopontine fibers, through the lateral one-fifths of the cerebral peduncle. And this turned out to be an oculomotor schwannoma. And this is the patient post-operatively. And these are the images. And this is a short video showing the approach. The surgery has been performed by Professor Goel, as you can see now. This is the supracerebellar infratentorial approach. The cerebellum is being depressed. And you see the brain stem and the trochlear nerve here. So this is the region of the midbrain. Now you can see the whole ventral aspect of the midbrain has also been exposed. And if you see, if you notice here, you see that there is no portion of the tumor that has projected in this region. It is completely interaxial. So to get a better angle, we plan to cut the tent. So once the whole tentorium was cut, we've actually cut the whole tent after safeguarding the trochlear nerve. You see this ventral aspect of the midbrain, you can see the basilar artery here, and you see that there is no tumor in this region. The third nerve is displaced here superiorly, you can see it. So now you can see on this, the fourth nerve, and this is the region of the lateral one-fifths of the cerebral peduncle. And here you can see a small incision is being made in the supratrochlear region. And the cyst will be encountered first and it is drained. And then the solid component of the tumor, as you can see here, this turned out to be a pleasant surprise. It was an oculomotor schwannoma 
probably from the oculomotor nucleus and the interim or the intramesencephalic part of the third nerve. And a good plane was developed by Professor Goel and the whole tumor could be actually removed in one piece, as you can see here. So basically the trajectory is between the temp, uh, corticospinal tracts ventrally and the substantia nigra posteriorly. And it is a straight trajectory that goes to the interpeduncular fossa. And it is very ideal for these kind of lesions. As you can see that we have used this approach. And after doing the surgery, we've also actually reposited the tent in its anatomical position. And then, yeah, you can see here. So it's a very good approach to for tumors in this location. So we've used this approach for another tumor because the solid component of the tumor was present quite anteriorly. Again, we use the lateral uh, cerebral peduncle approach. Also, this same approach can be used by a subtemporal route, as you can see by this dissection. And this is the view that you will get when you're using the subtemporal approach. And this is the tumor that we have operated using the subtemporal approach. And using again, you can see the trajectory here in the lateral one fifth of the cerebral peduncle. And this was a cavernoma, which was excised by using this trajectory. So this was for the lateral part of the midbrain. In the dorsal part of the midbrain for mainly tectal lesions, they are difficult to approach, but of course there are safe entry zones to zone one where you can enter. And the approach again is a midline supracerebellar approach to use this to approach these lesions after displacing the cerebellum inferiorly. And again, the safe entry points are through the superior brachium or through the inferior brachium. If you combine them with the safe entry zones, you have the supra uh, supracollicular and the infracollicular approaches that can be used to approach the tectal lesions. Coming to the pons, as you've seen this beautiful dissections that the pons is made up of superficial middle and deep transfer spontine fibers and the longitudinal corticospinal tracts that are interspersed between these fibers. This is the cross-sectional view of the pons showing the pontine nuclei and the transverse running pontine fibers. This is a lesion in the cerebellopontine angle, of course, an exophytic lesion coming from the lateral aspect of the pons. And you can see the displacement of the tracts. And of course, the best trajectory to approach this lesion is a retrosigmoid approach. And you approach the lesion from the middle cerebellar peduncle. As has been described, there are many entry zones that have been described, the epitrigeminal, the peritrigeminal to approach these tumors. And we prefer this uh, entry to enter into the lateral aspect of the middle cerebellar peduncle. And of course, using a retrosigmoid approach in the sitting position, here you can see the bulk of the tumor, which can easily be entered through, through this trajectory. So this is another tumor that is present in the pons. Here, you may have a dilemma of from where to approach. But if you see from the floor of the fourth ventricle, there is a thin layer of gray matter. And again, the preferred approach would be a retrosigmoid approach through the middle cerebellar peduncle, which is zone one and which is safe, which is relevant, relatively tolerant to, the, uh, to enter the brainstem. The fibers are tolerant. Now in the floor of the fourth ventricle, as I showed you earlier, you, enter, you can enter through zone two, which is through the fibers of the medial and the spinal and the trigeminal lemon sky, which are relatively tolerant, as mentioned by Kant, to dissection. What happens when you go on the floor of the fourth ventricle is because of the lesion, the anatomy is so distorted that it is sometimes difficult to identify the anatomical landmarks and just the understanding of where the fibers will be. By having that imagery on your mind, you can make the entry point. It is always better to remain more lateral rather than medial and, of course, above or below the facial colliculus. So there are exophytic brainstem lesions. Of course, these have to be entered through the floor of the fourth ventricle. And the easiest way is to enter making a small, where the most projecting part of the tumor is, you enter the tumor from that area. And here you can see the post-op images of the tumor resection. These are two interesting cases that we had of brainstem intraaxial endodermal cyst. This was the lesion that presented an exophytic mass coming in the floor of the fourth ventricle. We went through the fourth ventricle by a midline suboccipital approach and to our surprise, it turned out to be an endodermal cyst. If you see retrospectively, you can see this connection to the region of the clivus in this patient. This was another patient that had a, this was an endodermal cyst, again, operated by the midline suboccipital approach. 
and we recently published this in the Journal of Neurosurgery. And lastly, coming to the medulla. So the medulla is a very complex structure with a lot of critical cranial nerve nuclei, which if damaged, especially the lower cranials, which if damaged can cause a huge problem. So this is a cut section of the medulla, which you can see the pyramids here, the inferior cerebellar peduncle here, the vestibular area. This is the area of the reticular formation. This is the medial lamniscus. For a tumor which is present in this region at the junction of the inferior cerebellar peduncle, it is best to enter from the lateral aspect as this is zone one and it is safe to enter from this region. And we use a midline suboccipital approach. The anatomy of this can be seen beautifully here. And you lift up the cerebellum and the tonsils and you can enter into the brainstem and enter where the uh, tumor is projecting the most. For a lateral tumor, you can go from the lateral perspective or from a midline suboccipital perspective and approach the tumor. On the ventral aspect of the medulla, there are there, there is there are not many safe entry points, but basically you can enter from the pre or the post olivary sulci, as will be discussed by Khan in his presentation. So this is the organization of fiber structures that makes it easy to understand. If you just you have to combine both the cross-sectional anatomy and the longitudinal anatomy. And then you are able to form the mental imagery in your mind to understand this beautiful, intricate anatomy of the brainstem. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Avida, for uh, your excellent presentation. Uh, there's here uh, one more question. Do you have uh, any nerve stimulator during the surgery? Do you have? Nerve stimulation. Um, we don't use too much nerve stimulation, but we can use, of course, you can use for auditory, for brainstem evoked potentials, but we are not in the habit of using. Okay, uh, any panelists have any comment or uh, question? Okay, okay, can I just ask a comment, Abida? It was an excellent lecture. You showed one third now. Now my inside the uh, midbrain. I say uh, the fascicles of the uh, third nerve are they covered by Schwann cells? And I, to my understanding, Schwann cells are outside. No, uh, outside once they come out of the intraperitoneal portion, they start getting uh, Schwann cells. So I, I have not very really sure. You told inside the midbrain fascicles are there. Uh, so are they by Schwann cells to? I have a third nerve schwannoma inside the midbrain. I'm not very sure. Eh? There are something called non-myelinating swan cells. Uh, they are for the peripheral nervous system. I'm not very sure, Abhida. Even I'm not sure, but maybe at the junction of the entry and the exit of the intramesencephalic part of the oculomotor nerve, because we didn't see anything ventrally in the interpeduncular fossa. It was completely inside the brainstem. So maybe sure. where the junction is, like you have the junctional zone for a uh, vestibular schwannoma. Maybe they have a junctional zone in the ocular motor now, but even I don't. Okay, okay. Hello? Yes? Uh, this is Professor Fahmy from Alexandra, Egypt. Uh, actually, I would uh, like to congratulate you about uh, this uh, piece of work. Actually, you have a very good work uh, and an excellent presentation. Uh, I guess you are working with Professor Otto Joule. That's right? Yes, that's uh, right. Okay. Uh, just uh, notice about uh, you did all this uh, job without a navigation, without intraoperative navigation, I mean? Yes, yes. We are operating without intraoperative navigation. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Abida, for uh, Matt, I, I would like to ask uh, okay. one short question. Okay, yeah. okay. Abida, that was excellent. But uh, if you have the anatomy distorted by the tumor, how do you get the orientation? So if the anatomy is destroyed, you, you remember the zones. So the more lateral you are, the safer you are. Just if you go, even if you're going from the midline, the more lateral you are, the safer you are. If you're coming retrosigmoid, of course you are safe because all the fibers that are lateral are well tolerant to it. So if you cannot get your landmarks, stay lateral. Okay. 
Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, again, uh, if I need to add a little bit about the distorted anatomy uh, during intraoperative, that is why I am asking about the use of navigation. Uh, actually, we are not working on the normal anatomy. We have a lesion, and the anatomy is highly distorted. Uh, so how you can identify your landmark in this regard? So if you're coming from a lateral perspective, if you're going either to the midbrain or to the pons, which you're mainly operating from a retrosigmoid approach or retrosigmoid supracerebellar approach, you see a bulge of the tumor. If the, if the tumor is not that big, the anatomy will not be distorted. You will be able to identify. But if the tumor is big, there will be a bulge of the tumor. The safest place is where it is projecting, where the bulge of the tumor projects on the surface of the brainstem. That will be your easiest and best landmark to enter. I have to add one comment on that aspect. Most probably, that's what I feel. Uh, I'm sure Professor Atul and uh, Professor Avahida, they, they, their starting point was using navigation, but they got frustrated with the shift. Once you open the cistern, there's shift and everything does not count, only spending more time on finding some uh, primary landmark to enter where you see the pathology much better if you just go with the anatomical landmark. I think this is the reason perhaps the shift get them distended. Yes. Yeah, the and the uh, uh, disturbed anatomy, I mean. Yes. Okay, the disturbed anatomy. Yes. Oh, okay. Thank you, Abida. And now I will uh, introduce my uh, new friend, Professor uh, Sanjeeva. Professor Sanjeeva is a full professor of uh, neurosurgery, Oxford University and who will moderate the next lecture. Thank you all. Thank you very much. I think we've got uh, Dr. Khan here with us. Uh, I'm sure you've all read his excellent papers uh, on the brain stem anatomies at the University of Virginia. Uh, we're really looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much for joining us today. I'm sure it'll be excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for introdu introduction, introducing me. And I would like to thank uh, Dr. Lee and Sam for having me here. It's a big honor for me to be a, be a part of this uh, the great team. Can you see the full screen? You, can you see yes. the full screen? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. All right. Okay. Thank you yes, so much. Okay. okay. So um, I would like to talk about actually previous, uh, previous speakers like Dr. Matthias Suhdip and Abida uh, gave spectacular talks that makes my talks easier, my job easier here to talk. So I would like to talk about uh, the different perspective entry zones and also um, like surgical approach briefly in 25 minutes. So the, we already uploaded my slides to the Rotten Collection. You can create a free account to get the slides and the, you can download them and also you know the study for your uh, in other um, the, the presentations. The sum of the slide also can be found in this book, The Color Atlas of Brainstem Surgery. So uh, the previous speakers already covered everything. So I'm just gonna briefly talk about it. Now we are looking at the skull from above. So, and as we know, of, This is front and this is the back. This is the skull base. And as we know, there's a three fossa, anterior and middle fossa. And the, the border between the middle and the posterior fossa is the petros bone, petros ridge here. And we see the clivus in the midline. Here's a petroclival junction. The brainstem and cerebellum sit in the posterior fossa. So ventral located lesions, brainstem lesions, we can come from anterior, through the anterior fossa, even through the nose, like here. Either, or we can come from lateral through the middle fossa, or we can come from posterior fossa to reach the ventral located lesions in the brainstem. For dorsal located lesions, we can we use the posterior trajectories to reach the tumor and the lesions, malformation, et cetera. 
So uh, I want to talk about here again. So this is the petrose ridge and the sinus superior to the petrose ridge is a superior petrosal sinus. Runs superior to the petrose ridge. And the sinus inferior to the petrose bone, inferior petrosal sinus, runs the petrochlival junction here. So those are important, the structures that we will see. Here we see the cranial nerves, you know, one, two, three, four. This is the four, which is a thinnest cranial nerve. And the only nerve arises from the dorsal part surface of the brain stem. The five is thickest nerve. And all the way down, we see the seven and eight and the lower cranial nerves, nine, only one rootlet, 10, multiple rootlets, and we see the 11. And a little bit lower place, we, we, we could see hypoglossal in the 12th cranial nerve. So the brain stem has a three parts already mentioned, midbrain, pons, and medulla, and the cerebellum covers the brain stem dorsally here. The posterior circulation uh, supplies the brain stem and cerebellum. Here we see both vertebral arteries come together to form the basilar artery, most commonly at the level of the pontomedullary sulcus here. The vertebral artery gives off the posterior inferior cerebellar artery, pica, anterior spinal artery. The basilar artery gives off the anterior inferior cerebellar artery, ica, and the superior cerebellar artery is going to be here. Let's go. The rule of three from Dr. Rotan. So we have three parent vessels, arteries. We have three parts of the brain stem and we have three surfaces of the cerebellum. The cerebellum has tentorial surface, which faces the tentorium and suboccipital surface, which faces the occipital bone and the petrosal surface, which faces the petros bone. Brainstem, midbrain, pons, medulla. The pica, the posterior inferior cerebellar artery, supplies the medulla and suboccipital surface of the cerebellum. And ica supplies the pons and petrosal surface of the cerebellum. While the superior cerebellar artery supplies the midbrain and the tentorial surface of the cerebellum. When we look at internal structures of the brain stem. Here we see the medial lemniscus as we talk about it. This is the most tolerant fiber tract for surgical uh, manipulations. And the medial lemniscus uh, runs all the way down the brain stem and split it, divide it, divide the brain stem into ventral and the dorsal parts. Of course, there are different kinds of classifications too, but you know, this is, can be used at this, I'm using this. So, in other words, the ventral to the mid medial lemniscus in the midbrain, it's called the ventral midbrain. Dorsal to the medial lemniscus in the midbrain is the dorsal midbrain. The same thing, ventral to the medial lemniscus in the pons, the ventral pons, dorsal is a dorsal pons. Middle way is the same. So the neurocritical structure in the ventral brain stem is the corticospinal tract. And the dorsal brain stem, we see the medial longitudinal fasciculus, MLF. And other uh, important structures, MLF, medial longitudinal fasciculus, and the central tegmental tract, trigeminal, mesencephalic, and the spinal tracts are neurocritical structures in the dorsal brain stem. So now we are looking at the floor of the fourth ventricle. The one side still intact, and this side just removed the ependema. Here we see the trigeminal nerve, gives off the trigeminal spinal tract, which descends to the spine. And this is a trigeminal mesencephalic tract, ascends up to the uh, midbrain. We see the MLF, medial longitudinal fasciculus, just next to the midline. And the last, the fiber tract is a central tegmental tract, is a part of extrapyramidal system and also interconnect the olive and the red nucleus here. So here's a facial colliculus, abducens nucleus, and the facial fibers. So let's uh, move on to the midbrain. Midbrain is the top of the brain stem, and the key structures for the midbrain is the oculomotor nerve and aqueduct. So ventral midbrain, here we see oculomotor nerve, mammary body, 
the entry zones, we have we can enter lateral to the ocular motor nerve or medial to the ocular motor nerve. Those are uh, cerebral peduncles, and here is the interpeduncular fossa. The both cerebral peduncles here, and this is interpeduncular fossa. The lateral to the ocular motor nerve can be used as an entry zone, or we can use uh, we can enter to the brainstem through the interpeduncular fossa, which is called interpeduncular fossa approach. Now we are looking from looking at uh, from front and front. Here we see the ocular motor nerve. Ocular motor nerve runs most likely between the superior cerebellar artery and the posterior cerebral artery. Sometimes, very rare, like three to five percent, the SCA superior cerebellar artery can arise from the posterior cerebral artery. So then we see the ocular motor nerve underneath is underneath to both arteries. But usually, most likely and uh, most commonly, we see the ocular motor nerve running between these two uh, arteries. So anti zone is the periocular motor zone, lateral to the ocular motor nerve, and the medially, medial to the ocular motor nerve is the interpenicular fossa anti zone. So here we see again that the ocular motor nerve is the key. When we follow the ocular motor nerve all the way back, we can reach the midbrain. The, depending on the location of the lesion, we can either open lateral to the ocular motor nerve, or we can open the medial to the ocular motor nerve. Here's the interpenicular fossa. And especially, you know, like lateral located lesions, let's say in the left side, this is the specialist technique. And when, when you come from the contralateral side, that provides straightforward and the direct shot for the lesions following the ocular motor nerve medially. If you want to open the period ocular motor anti zone or lateral to the ocular motor nerve, we can follow the ocular motor nerve laterally to reach the midbrain. Here is the, we are on the left side, and this is ipsilateral ocular motor nerve, and here's the contralateral ocular motor nerve. When we follow the ocular motor nerve, here's the interpenicular fossa. Of course, there are some perforators here that we want to preserve. And we can just, you know, the, make an incision. The, the remove the lesions in this part. This is a target area. We are still talking about the ventral surface of the midbrain. So what kind of surgical approach we can use? We can come through the anterior fossa. We can use the terrional approach, orbitozygomatic approach, modified orbitozygomatic approach. And also we can use the uh, supraorbital eyebrow approach. Here is the, an example of the modified OZ approach. The removal of the orbital roof provides the greater exposure to the ventral midbrain. Here we see, and this is the ICA optic nerve. We see the ocular motor nerve, and we follow the ocular motor nerve all the way down. We can reach the midbrain. This is the periocular motor entry zone, which is lateral to the ocular motor nerve. Uh, if you want to open the interpenicular fossa, usually the road between the optical cord, uh, uh, the, the triangle can be used. Also, we see the SCA, superior cerebellar artery, and the posterior cerebral artery here. The ocular motor nerve runs between these arteries. Another option, using the mini-modified OZ, which is actually the same craniotomy with the supraorbital eyebrow, in, uh, eyebrow approach, only incision is a different. We just do the incision like similar to the terrional approach and removal of the orbital roof here. And this is the frontal dura and proceeding under the frontal lobe. And the similar, this is a supraorbital eyebrow incision. The medial border is going to be supraorbital nerve here. After craniotomy, we just you know, proceed uh, this space between the frontal, uh, the lobe and the orbital roof. This is an endoscopic view. We see the ipsilateral optic nerve, contralateral optic nerve, ipsilateral ICA, intercarotid artery, anterior cerebral artery, Hoechner's artery. Now I'm looking for ocular motor nerve to get to midbrain. Here's the ocular motor nerve here. And following all the way down, I can reach the midbrain and the ventral surface of the midbrain. For lateral midbrain, as already mentioned, this is the lateral mesencephalic sulcus that can be used as an entry zone. 
The lateral mesencephalic sulcus corresponds to most lateral edge of the medial lemniscus. If you remember, ventral or anterior to the medial lemniscus is the ventral midbrain, and dorsal or posterior to the medial lemniscus is going to be dorsal midbrain. So in the ventral midbrain, the most uh, critical structure is the corticospinal tract. In the dorsal midbrain, we see the red nucleus, oculomotor, and trochlear nuclei, the, uh, um, the which sits in, just in front of the aqueduct here. So oculomotor and trochlear nuclei are located just in front of the aqueduct, which is another uh, the, the landmark and important structures for the midbrain. Also, as we said, this is the dorsal midbrain, just behind the medial lemniscus. The dorsal midbrain is subdivided into tegmentum and tectum. From the medial lemniscus to the aqueduct, here's a tegmentum. Behind the aqueduct, here we see the tectum part of the midbrain. Let's see, this is, the, this is an axial section. We see the both oculomotor nerves, and here's the interpendicular fossa. This is the medial lemniscus or substantia nigra here. The substantia nigra is located just ventral surface of the medial lemniscus. Can be considered also as you know the, the border for the ventral and the dorsal midbrain. In front of the medial lemniscus or substantia nigra is the ventral midbrain, cruz cerebri, and the behind of the medial lemniscus is the dorsal midbrain. Dorsal midbrain is subdivided into tegmentum from the medial lemniscus to the aqueduct at the level of the aqueduct. And behind the aqueduct is going to be tectum. Tectum is important. It is important because uh, the, if the lesion is located tegmentum, we are using a different surgical approach. If, you know, for the lesions located in the tectum, we use a different surgical approaches. The neurocritical structures in the tegmental area is a red nucleus, and this is the oculomotor fibers and oculomotor nuclei, which is uh, located just in front of the aqueduct. Here is the R entry zone, which is lateral mesencephalic sulcus. We can access to the ventral and the dorsal, most, most commonly for the tegmental area. And this is the target area, lateral surface of the midbrain. We can come either supratentorially, this is a zygoma, and this is subtemporal anatomy. We are above the tentorium, but this is surgical view, and this is a, a tentorium again. This is a temporal lobe. What we see here is the lateral mesencephalic sulcus, lateral mesencephalic vein, runs just around to the lateral mesencephalic sulcus, and here we see the trochlear nerve. So another option, we can come infratentorially uh, trajectory. So this is Lateral supracerebral or infratentorial, as we saw of, uh, Dr. Guelli's surgery and Abida mentioned about it. Here's a transverse sinus, the sigmoid sinus here. So here's a tentorium again. We are infratentorial area. Here we see the pineal gland posteriorly, and this is lateral mesencephalic vein, and here is the lateral mesencephalic sulcus. For dorsal midbrain, we see the colliculi. The eye is superior to the ear. So superior colliculi is related with the vision and inferior colliculi are related with the auditory, the sound. So we see the supra and inferior colliculi and the antizone is the antizone. We make, can make an incision superior to the superior colliculi between the pineal gland and the superior colliculi. Another antizone can be used between the frenulum valley and the trochlear nerve and the inferior colliculi here. Or another option is using the intercollicular area. The important part again, so we don't wanna, we don't wanna uh, the pass beyond to the aqueduct in the midline because the oculomotor and trochlear nuclei are located just sits just in front of the aqueduct in the midline. Here we see aqueduct again, trochlear, oculomotor uh, nuclei, this is the oculomotor nerve, and this is the, uh, the fiber tracks uh, of the oculomotor nerve. Red nucleus, another important, the neurocritical structures. Uh, injury of the red nucleus uh, can cause intention tremor or the nystagmus, which is a part of extrapyramidal system. So when we come from uh, posterior, we see the pineal gland is here, vein of gallon. Here's a superior colliculus, 
colliculi and inferior colliculi. Here's the trochlear nerve again. This is a target area. We can come either from supratentorial or infratentorial uh, space. Here we see the transverse sinuses and here's a tentorium. This is occipital uh, interhemisphere, interhemisphere approach. Here we see the, the vein of gallon. This is the splenium. When we retract the uh, four occipital interhemisphere carports, sometimes the massive bleeding can start. So it's, you know, we usually want to check the internal occipital vein because when we retract the occipital lobe, that vein can, you know, the uh, stop uh, can just start the bleeding. So we want to always, you know, the, be sure the internal occipital vein is intact when we uh, get some mass, ma massive bleeding. Also, we can cut the tentorium just next to the midline, the straight sinus for greater exposure. We see the pineal gland is here, and this is superior colliculi. Another option, we can come uh, supracerebral or infratentorial or transtentorial. There's a three option, there are three options, which is median, uh, supracerebral or infratentorial, paramedian supracerebral and infratentorial, or lateral uh, supracerebral and infratentorial approach. I'm going to show the paramedium. The incision is made the midpoint of the distance from the inion to the asterion. Superior temporal line we saw, and this is the vein of gallon. And here is kind of uh, after exposure, we see the superior inferior colliculi. For the pons, here again, this is the medial lemniscus. In front of the medial lemniscus is going to be ventral pons. Behind is the dorsal pons. Now, if we are looking from front. This is the ventral surface of the medial lemniscus here. So we are in the ventral pons right now, and we see the corticospinal tract. Key structures for the pons, the trigeminal nerve and the facial colliculus. For the ventral pons, here we see the transverse pontine fibers. They come together to form the middle cerebellar pedicle, the same fiber tracks at the level of the trigeminal nerve. Lateral to the level of the trigeminal nerve, these transverse pontine fibers are called as the middle cerebellar pedicle. Uh, the trigeminal nerve is the key for the entry zones for ventral located lesions, pontine lesions. We can open, we can uh, use, and we can entry to the pons above the trigeminal nerve, super trigeminal entry zone, or we can make an incision here between the five and seven cranial nerves, which is called peritrigeminal. Or another option, we can make an incision uh, through the middle cerebral pedicle behind the trigeminal nerve. Of course, the workhorse is a retrosigmoid approach to reach the ventral surface of the pons. Here is the uh, transverse and the sigmoid sinuses. Here we see the seven and eight, the trigeminal nerve. We can even expose the lower cranial nerves. The one root that is the nine, multiple root that are the 10. Also the petrosal surface of the cerebellum can be open. It's kind of like a cilium fissure in the cerebellum that uh, the decrease the need of cerebellar retraction and also gives more exposure. Here we see the five nerve, seven and eight complex, and this is the medial, middle cerebellar pedicle here. This is peritrigeminal between the five and seven, and here's a supratrigeminal anti zones. So here we see this. This is green. Uh, the the arrow is after opening the petrosal fissure, which is uh, required the less cerebellar retraction. Then we can reach the middle cerebellar pedicle also. And also, me, uh, central located lesions in the pons with less cerebellar retraction. So, how can we get this area? Another option, first option was retrosigmoid approach. We can also come subtemporal, transtentorial. The tentorium is cut behind the level where the trochlear nerve enters to the tentorium. Here, what we see here, that this is a trigeminal nerve. Again, supra trigeminal period trigeminal or middle cerebellar pinnacle can be exposed with subtemporal transtentorial uh, transtentorial approach. Another option is the Kavase approach, anterior petrosectomy. 
Dr. Liz will probably mention about it. This is the greater petrosal nerve. Here we see the arcuate eminence. This is the petrous apex. After drilling to petrous apex, here we see the trigeminal nerve again. This is the facial nerve. And we, you know, uh, all this, uh, the safe antisons is under our, our uh, exposure. For dorsal pons, already the surface anatomy is mentioned beautifully. And this is the median sulcus. And here's the medullary part again. This is the hypoglossal vagal trigons, and this is the aria That is, looks like the pen rib shape in the medullary part of the floor of the fourth ventricle. So another sulcus is a sulcus limitans, sulcus limitans, uh, lateral sulcus, and deepens two point, which is lateral to the facial colliculus. And the another one, which is called superior fovea, superior fovea. And another point, it deepens to just next to the hypoglossal triangle, which is inferior fovea. Superior fovea also can be used for removal of the lesions at the level of the facial colliculus. Here we see the facial uh, colliculus, closer look. The facial colliculus is formed by the abducens nucleus and the facial fibers. And this is the abducens, uh, the fibers arise from the abducens nucleus. This is the lateral wheel. Again, abducens uh, nucleus. This is the facial fibers in the pons. And here is the facial nucleus. The fibers turns around the abducens nucleus and then exit the brainstem here. So the question is, uh, the abducens nucleus, the fibers runs at the level of the uh, ponte medullary sulcus, as already uh, the mention, it was mentioned about it. So here is the abducens nucleus again. This is here, and this is the abducens nucleus outside of the brainstem. This is important, and the ponte medullary sulcus also another entry zone uh, described by Dr. Lawton. So, but we want to be aware of the abducens nucleus, and also there is a two different illustrations in the literature about the position of the abducens fibers to the corticospinal tract. The first one is abducens fibers passes lateral to the corticospinal tract. The another one indicates the abducens fibers passes medial to the corticospinal tract. So which one is correct? This one is correct. Uh, the corticospinal, the, the fibers just, you know, the passes lateral to the corticospinal tract. And here's the staining. Uh, Dr. Matthias also shows the beautiful stain, uh, the dissection pictures. This is the abducens nucleus, lateral to the corticospinal tract. The same is here. For the dorsal pons, here is the facial colliculus, and this is a superficial uh, triangle. It's bordered by the frenulum valley or trochlear nerve above inferiorly uh, facial colliculus, medially MLF, and laterally sulcus limitans. Because we want to preserve the STT2, there are some case reports uh, after, you know, of the, uh, after opening the superficial uh, entry, there are some the case reports about the intention tremor and also nystagmus that probably uh, the caused by the injury of the central tegmental tract. And here's corresponds to sulcus limitans here. So anatomically, we want to open between the MLF sulcus limitans. There's a prominence here you can see in the cadavers or you know the, the patient. Superiorly, frenulum valley, which is containing the trochlear nerve, inferior facial colliculus. For infrafacial, this is the facial colliculus again, infrafacial approach. The height is superior and inferior border of this triangle is the upper attachment, upper edge and the lower edge of the telechoroidea, which is roughly corresponds. And inferiorly, the hypoglossal triangle, but if you keep above to the lower edge of the telechoroidea, you're gonna preserve the hypoglossal triangle. And if you keep below to the upper edge of the telechoroidea, this is the lateral recess, you can also just uh, uh, avoid to facial colliculus too. Medially, of course, MLF, 
And laterally also, here is the most medial edge of the attachment of the telechoroidea here. So the telechoroidea and the lateral recess is very important landmark for the infrafacial approach. Here we see attachment of the telechoroidea, upper edge of, the, here's a lateral recess, by the way. And here is roughly corresponds to the borders, superior and inferior border of the infrafacial. The target area is here. So we can use the, tele, the televolar approach to reach the floor of the fourth ventricle. That prominence is the facial colliculus. And the last the, and the middle I wanna talk about. So we use, uh, it's already mentioned. So, and this is the olive and here's the anterior lateral sulcus in front of the olive or pure olivary sulcus. The, the anterior point between the hypoglossal at uh, the nerve and the C1 root beds. We can also use the postalivary sulcus just behind the olive, between the olive and the hypoglossal root beds. Or for the dorsal located lesions, we can use the dorsal middle of Of course, the key structure is olive. This is a target area. We use a far lateral approach. The vertebral artery is here. C1 posterior arc can be also removed. Here's the after craniotomy, and this is post olivary sulcus as an entry zone. Here's the pillar, pure olivary sulcus. The finally, we see the dorsal medulla. Here's the posterior median sulcus, posterior intermediate sulcus, and also posterior lateral sulcus can be used uh, as an entry zones. And also the last one is the inferior cerebral, cerebral pedicle can be used to remove the tumor. So the briefly recap is the midbrain for the midbrain, the nerve critical structures is the oculomotor nerve and aqueduct cerebri for the pons, trigeminal nerve and the facial colliculus for the medulla is the olive are the key structures. And thank you so much. Thank you very much. That was an absolutely excellent talk. I'll just ask my, I can't see any questions here, but I'll ask the other panelists if they have any questions. Otherwise, I'll ask a question. Any comments from any of our panelists? While we're waiting, I'll just ask a question. So we were just discussing image guidance after Abida's talk, uh, but what are you, and you, both you and Abida, I think, showed uh, at least you're planning and fiber track mapping on image guidance, I think. Uh, what are your thoughts? And certainly I use it for planning. What are your thoughts on, on fiber track mapping and on image guidance for planning surgery and how useful is it to first have a really good understanding in the lab and fiber dissection before you move on to then what are the pitfalls or mistakes you can make without a good anatomical understanding? So there are some brain lab, you know, the brain lab uh, uh, DTI studies for the brain stem still is not so quite enough, but you know, even the 1%, if it helped 1%, that's something for the brain stem surgery. So, and maybe we can also ask this question for like surgical strategy for master neurosurgeons here. So, but for anatomical uh, point of view, I would say um, it is important but usually, I'm also, you know, uh, recently we are working with the DTI, the radiologist here, and making the DTI. It's kind of like uh, we are describing, and they try to find the, you know, the fiber tracks in the DTI. I think the collaboration is very important with, you know, the anat anatomical knowledge and also, you know, the DTI part. So... Uh, yeah, but, you know, the general, I would say, still not quite enough, you know, for the surgical strategy, but even the 1%, you know, the, makes a big uh, difference. Thank you. Are there any comments from anyone else? Okay. Well, thank you again for an excellent talk. Uh, and I'd just like to thank all the speakers uh, for you, Mateus. Sukhdeep Abida, uh, before we move on, they're all excellent anatomy lectures, really setting the stage very nicely for us uh, as we move on to more clinical uh, talks and also to Sam for assembling a fantastic lineup. So a lot of hard work there. Well done, uh, Sam. Uh, we've got Professor 
And Zeno next, uh, I think following the theme, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is the University of Virginia alumni, uh, now at the Mayo Clinic, uh, huge experience in vascular uh, neurosurgery. And I think it's gonna give a really important talk, maybe one of the most important talks uh, on sort of tailoring your approach uh, uh, and individualizing your decision. So thank you very much for joining us uh, and welcome. Thank you for uh, the kind invitation. Can you hear me? Everything is fine? Good. Yes, we can. Yeah, I'd uh, like uh, to thank you for uh, the kind introduction and uh, the invitation. i also like to thank my fellow Eduardo Agosti for uh, helping me putting together this presentation. So we have uh, listened to uh, and seen a wonderful uh, work um, you know, based on uh, anatomy. And there is no question that that forms the basis uh, of our uh, understanding when we decide um, uh, to do surgery, when to do surgery, how to do the surgery. But uh, as it was um, alluded in one of the comments before, when we deal with pathology, we are dealing with uh, distorted um, anatomy. And uh, I will uh, um, make uh, focus on uh, some uh, specific considerations and also use a few clinical examples to see how we can uh, put together our um, anatomical knowledge, imaging, uh, modern technology, and uh, patient uh, clinical presentation and clinical status to try to make uh, the best possible decisions. Now, when uh, we deal, uh, my experience, of course, is uh, uh, biased toward vascular lesions, uh, even though I've operated a few tumors and uh, particularly cavernous malformations. But I think cavernous malformations uh, specifically are uh, very good lesions uh, to discuss some of the practical issues that we face because the decision is often uh, very nuanced. There are different components. When it comes to tumors, of course, the location of the tumor, but particularly the type of tumor tends to be the most uh, important factors. Here is a, a slide that I borrow from uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Kelly Fleming, uh, who has maintained a prospective registry of more than 400 patients uh, with the cavernous malformations, mainly in the brainstem. And uh, what we see here in blue is uh, uh, brainstem cavernous malformations in red is non-brainstem. And uh, what uh, the prospective registry has confirmed that the risk of bleeding after a first hemorrhage in a patient with the brainstem cavernous malformation is higher than uh, other locations. And after a first bleed, that risk, as you can see over the years, uh, is actually substantial. That, of course, does not mean that we need to operate on every patient with the, who presents with the symptomatic bleed. But again, just a reminder that the natural history of these lesions is probably not quite as benign as we had uh, originally thought. When uh, we think about the brainstem surgery, rightly so, uh, we tend to focus uh, on uh, the area of the lesion that comes closest to the uh, surface. But uh, I uh, suggest that uh, equally, if not even more important, is to devise an ideal trajectory that uh, improve uh, visualization and that allows us to facilitate resection, particularly of that area of a specific lesion that we think uh, it's much more difficult. And I will show you some examples to illustrate what uh, I mean by this. Now, many brainstem lesions, and in particular cavernous malformations, uh, they span different uh, compartments. We like schematics, but uh, the truth is that uh, many brainstem caven mal malformations, uh, cavernous malformations of the midbrain, for example, they are really not uh, located in the midbrain alone, but they tend to extend either in fear in the pons or superiorly toward the thalamus. And uh, we focus so much on the technical aspects. We love anatomy, but uh, it's also important to remember that uh, we can gain a lot of information 
just uh, by listening uh, to the history, the progression of symptoms, to understand where the lesion started, where is really the epicenter, and uh, how the pattern of growth of that lesion. And you will see that in my presentation, I will not show uh, DTI, not because I don't think it's useful, but because what I've learned after using DTI and the MRI, that really, if you look at the location of the lesion and you listen to the history, you are able to predict uh, how the tracks are uh, displaced. Now, in this uh, uh, drawing, uh, you will see just a few of uh, many of the approaches that we can use for brainstem cavernous malformations. Over the years, uh, I've learned that uh, we, we tend to, of course, uh, favor certain approaches because they, we are more facile with that anatomy. We have done it many times. But uh, I learned that by not having the full armamentarium and not considering some approaches that are uh, um, seldom used, uh, we might uh, preclude the specific patients from the best possible uh, uh, exposure of uh, a specific lesion. So again, it's important to have all different uh, approaches in our armamentarium. And for some of the more complex skull-based approaches, I'm fortunate here, I have a great team with my colleague, uh, Dr. Link, uh, and uh, we do some of these surgeries uh, together when uh, more complicated uh, skull-based approaches are uh, required for uh, ideal exposure of the lesion. This is a patient with the postmesencephalic cavernous malformations, which I think helps illustrating some of the um, uh, factors that uh, I mentioned. So as I said, uh, the, these uh, cavernous malformations and in general brainstem lesions, often they span uh, several compartments. So this is a, a young uh, lady who presented with the uh, isolated but progressive uh, sensory symptoms and some gait imbalance. So when I look at this lesion, of course, uh, I'm looking at the clinical presentation, and then uh, I'm looking at the lesion, and uh, there are a couple of components. Uh, what I would call the most established cavernous malformations that is actually inferior, and it's uh, mostly in the pons, and you can see that there is a fairly thick uh, emosiderin rank. And I know that that's really probably the most difficult portion of this cavernous malformation. Then there is uh, another uh, portion that is mostly hemorrhagic, but uh, you can see that uh, medially this portion has, uh, again, a more established cavernous malformation with uh, some uh, um, emosiderin. So when I look at this lesion, uh, I think uh, that uh, ideally, I would like to have uh, a trajectory that uh, gives me good access to the most inferior portion that is again, the more difficult because I know that there where the cavernous malformation is gonna be really adherent to the surrounding uh, brainstem. And then also a trajectory that allows me a decent view of the most medial portion. As far as the large uh, hemorrhagic component, uh, I know that once I can get, it provides me with an access to the brainstem, but I know that once I get into the hemorrhagic component to remove this part is relatively easy. So ideally what we would like to do here, if I can get a trajectory that gives me a biased view from uh, above, from top down, and also allows me to look at the medial portion of the cavernous malformation. I think that's a, a more uh, ideal approach for this specific lesion. And uh, this lesion you can see was uh, treated uh, through a uh, posterior interparietal uh, transtentorial interhemispheric approach. You can see here approaching uh, the interhemispheric fissure at first uh, looks very tight. Once we know uh, we get access to cerebrospinal fluid, drain cerebrospinal fluid, the view opens. Here is identifying the straight sinus, cutting the tentorium, it always bleeds because of the veins that run in between the dura leaflets. But you see, then you have a preferential 
view from above of the dorsal portion of the brain stem, you enter uh, the uh, hemorrhagic uh, component, uh, you remove the, um, the, uh, the liquid blood, uh, and then uh, you start uh, working, uh, identify the top of the lesion that has uh, hemocidin stem parenchyma, but then you see, now you have a beautiful view from above uh, of the most inferior and medial portion that is the most difficult part to remove because as you can see, it's more established. And uh, you can see in this particular case, I was able despite the very small uh, and deep exposure to use uh, scissors really to gently tease the most uh, inferior uh, and uh, medial portion where the more established uh, cavernous uh, malformation was uh, located and uh, here you can see the uh, pre and the post-op uh, in this lady and she was uh, she regained uh, um, uh, recovered from her imbalance issues but uh, she still has uh, some uh, mild uh, uh, sensory hemisensory um, dysfunction now this is uh, a different case this is a thalamomesencephalic cavernous malformation patient uh, that presents uh, with the right third nerve palsy and uh, hemiparesis as well as uh, a Holmes tremor. There is a beautiful um, uh, article recently in journal neurosurgery that deals with this particular problem that is really uh, difficult to treat and is unfortunately one of a possible sequelae of uh, hemorrhage or even surgery in the midbrain, it's the Holmes tremor. But you can see in this situation, it would be really nice, I think, uh, to have a trajectory that uh, provides me with the bias and the preferential view from uh, below up. And uh, this as has been uh, showed in uh, many presentations before, it's beautifully provided by the lateral paramedian supracerebellar um, approach with the transtentorial modification. Here again, I'm going to use the hemorrhagic part to provide me with the, an uh, entry, but the part that I'm more worried is the most medial part, and then again, the part that uh, goes up toward the thalamus. Now, here is uh, with the patient in the sitting position, uh, you see the exposure of the dorsal posterolateral uh, uh, midbrain, you see the fourth nerve, you see the pontomesencephalic vein, and um, you see some degree of discoloration, but as we said before, it's uh, you know, great to talk about the pontomesencephalic sulcus as a landmark, but the truth is that once you go there, there is no sulcus because the entire midbrain is uh, a plump because of the bleed. So if available, I personally find it very useful in a situation like this before making an incision in the brainstem, despite I know by anatomical landmark, despite I see some degree of, you can see the color changes a little bit. I like to have uh, that uh, immediate confirmation with the uh, neuronavigation, if available, that indeed I'm looking at that portion of the posterolateral midbrain where the lesion is closest uh, to the surface. And uh, this is a brief uh, video of the case in question. And uh, um, this is uh, like, you know, the approach and you can see now what we often uh, we forget to mention is that when we do these approaches it's very important as much as possible to open really the cisterns, both to allow the cerebellum to drop and open your view. And here you can see here the tentorial cut in this situation extends uh, the surgical view from below up and uh, allows a better, uh, better manipulation of the portion that goes uh, uh, toward the thalamus, small incision following parallel to the direction of the tracks, and then uh, the technique when it, this, uh, which I call hemorrhagic cavernous malformation, you debulk the cavernous malformation, you develop gently a plane, and then uh, with the graded uh, suction, explore the cavity, and uh, I rely, we rely on the 
elasticity of the brainstem to really push the cavernous malformation toward our small opening. And as we all know, at the end, you're often left with um, uh, a cavity that is uh, smaller than uh, the original cavernous malformation. You see here at the post-op, you can see the small uh, entry. And um, particularly on the coronal, you see the beautiful uh, ideal, I would say in this situation, trajectory provided by the approach uh, to this um, cavernous malformation. Another concept that we, it's very important and we always discuss is that um, the timing of surgery after a hemorrhage, how soon after a hemorrhage it's better to do surgery. Well, the problem is that in the acute phase, there is uh, oh, after a hemorrhage, there is often edema and that edema softens the surrounding the brainstem. And therefore, even though it's easier to remove the acute portion of blood, then you are left with the very soft parenchyma that is very easy to damage as you're trying to remove the more established portion of the cavernous uh, malformation. Now, if you allow for a little bit of time after a hemorrhage, then uh, there is some uh, degree of reactive gliosis of the surrounding parenchyma that increases the resistance to mechanical damage and manipulation. And I would say that there is agreement among most surgeons that ideally a two to three weeks after a bleed is probably the best time also to allow for some degree of liquefaction of the acute blood. Now, we also have to be cognizant that waiting too long then favors formation of adherences to surrounding brain and hardening of the cavernous malformations. That's again, this again, not to suggest we should jump and operate on every single patient after a first bleed. But these are, uh, again, uh, all those considerations that uh, go through our mind and that allow us as much as possible to individualize treatment uh, in uh, a single individual patient. Now, as I said, ideally we should wait two or three weeks. Here I show a case where uh, I actually decide to intervene early. This is an 18 year old who presented uh, with these symptomatic uh, cavernous malformations involving the lower medulla. This is a case that I thought about a lot. Um, so he presented with nausea and vomiting. Again, here it's very important to me that tells me the cavernous malformations was originating at the level of the area postrema. And uh, as often happens in this um, acute subacute phase, then patients progress. At first, I thought it was probably related to uh, early rebleeds. Now I think more and more could be related to the fact that probably some of these patients ever after they start bleeding, they have a very slow but uh, continuous uh, hooves. And then eventually start developing a progressive arm and uh, hand paresthesia. And again, again, here, the, the symptoms and the imaging tell us that uh, cavernous malformations is in the inside, the lower medulla, and uh, the preferential involvement uh, of uh, motor tracts going to the upper extremities. So this is a clinical presentation, but um, I, this is a young, is uh, 18, and um, I was uh, tempted to intervene despite this was his first bleed, and uh, it was by now stable because of his young age and because of the fact that uh, the cavernous malformation was, was getting very close to the ependymal surface. And, um, I was afraid that if I was gonna wait too long, then the cavernous malformation, the, the, the blood gets partially reabsorbed, the cavernous malformation relatively retracts toward the, the inner portion of the medulla. So what I did, I repeated an early MRI. And on the early MRI, when you compare with the original one, after only six days, you can see on T2 that somehow there is some improvement of the edema. So I thought maybe I had uh, a window of opportunity right there to intervene. Now for uh, this case, uh, to illustrate uh, some of the 
nuances of the case, I'm using the T2. But uh, of course, when we decide uh, whether or not the lesion comes close to the surface, it's much better to use the T1 because on the T2, you get some booming artifacts that uh, fools you. And what I've learned over the years is that no matter what the MRI, no matter what sequence show, the cavernous malformations, it's always uh, deeper than the MRI leads you to uh, believe. And uh, here is a brief uh, video, midline uh, uh, craniotomy, patient in the prone position, opening the obex, you can see the discoloration primarily on one side of the inferior portion of the medulla. Here is a small uh, DVA on the surface. Here in mapping uh, the floor of the fourth ventricle. And in this case, I was specifically looking for the uh, 12 uh, uh, nucleus. So I knew I was below small incision along the direction of the fibers. And again, find uh, the liquefied uh, portion of the hemorrhage and uh, with graded uh, suction, uh, um, remove, uh, empty the cavernous malformations internally, then uh, start uh, developing uh, a plane. And then uh, here you can see using a sharp dissection to separate the cavernous malformation from the surrounding uh, parenchyma. And then once you develop that handle, you, in these hemorrhagic cavernous malformations, you, you apply some gentle traction and contraction. And uh, in uh, many cases, uh, the bulk of the cavernous malformations, what's in, once is the bulk internally comes out. And then you can see with graded suction, carefully inspecting the cavity and uh, looking for potential small areas of uh, residual cavernous malformation. And uh, here is the post-operative. Post so his deficit improved. And I will make a point about these patients with what I call the hemorrhagic types. But uh, he has had the persistent uh, nausea for several weeks uh, after the surgery. Again, because the epicenter was right around uh, the area post -trauma. Now, just before I conclude a couple of uh, um, concepts, now, as I said, the MRI always leads to believe that the cavernous malformation is much closer to the surface than actually is. And it's important to remind ourselves that the cavernous malformation, when they bleed, they displace rather than destroying the surrounding brain. And the corollary of that is that, look, in this case, you think there is no floor of the fourth ventricle, but uh, indeed, uh, there is uh, quite a bit of uh, fourth ventricle floor uh, uh, there. So I've learned this and uh, as much as possible, um, I try to stay away from the floor of the fourth ventricle, primarily because of the risk of uh, um, in extraocular motility issues related to the mechanical manipulation of the middle longitudinal uh, fasciculus. Now, this distinction, of course, we follow um, uh, scholastically the Zabramski classifications of cavernous malformations, but I found this uh, simple uh, separation that uh, first there the Konovalo, Professor Konovalo, uh, talking about between hemorrhagic and non hemorrhagic ones. So the hemorrhagic are the ones with the cavernous malformations with this large acute subacute hemorrhagic component. In the acute phase, they can be associated with the edema, but because they exert some degree of mass effect related to the hemorrhagic component, these are patients that often can improve immediately after the surgery. Sometimes since uh, the hemorrhagic component is so predominant, the pathologist actually might not even found a clear cut uh, cavernous malformation in the specimen. And uh, this is again, it's an example. Then uh, contrast these hemorrhagic ones to the so-called non-hemorrhagic ones, like these ones. This is a much more established cavernous malformation. There is a hemosiderin ring that we know it's hard and it's adherent to the surrounding parenchyma. 
these cavernous malformations often uh, they grow not through large hemorrhages but through proliferation of micro caverns so it's not uncommon a slow but progressive uh, uh, growth and uh, clinical worsening over time these patients are at high risk when in the brainstem of postoperative worsening and of course these are very difficult if, to remove safely through some of the narrow corridors that uh, we have seen uh, before. Um, so except you know, when you are like in this case, uh, the one I showed, and then you have uh, access uh, to the bulk of the posterior part of the cavernous malformation uh, through the fourth ventricle, through a simple midline, uh, uh, midline craniotomy. And then um, in cases like this, of course, it's uh, you can carefully go circumferentially around the lesion, but this is, I would say, that at least in the brainstem is the exception rather the, the rule because often you have to operate through very small and uh, narrow corridors. So in this case, it was removed, but not without uh, um, a risk. And this patient did have uh, a transient postoperative uh, worsening that required an inpatient rehab stay due to the manipulation of the surrounding uh, structures. Again, I'd like to thank you for uh, the uh, kind invitation. It's a great pleasure, but an honor for me also to be part of this esteemed faculty and uh, be part of this wonderful symposium. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for, for a really excellent talk. So we've got one question here. Um, Can I ask it directly? Or... Oh yes, please do. Thank you. Uh, good evening, sir, Dr. Lanzino. I read your article in GNS of the retractalist surgery how do you modify your approaches to achieve this retractalis approach? And have you modified your instruments also like using single shaft instruments? Yeah, I, I think that, uh, it, you know, that's part of um, um, the way we uh, think and we devise some of these approaches. And uh, so from the examples that we have seen during this symposium, we try as much as possible to uh, take advantage of uh, natu natural uh, spaces, um, you know, in the um, interhemispheric approach or some of the supracerebellar infra or transtentorial approaches, you know, working uh, in uh, uh, between in the in the and utilize as much as possible the systems. And as I said, the trick is that often gets lost in these presentations is that in order to maximize your exposure. It's really important uh, at the beginning of the surgery to spend time to meticulously and systematically open the systems as much as possible, uh, release uh, as much as possible of the uh, arachnoidal additions in order to uh, create uh, adequate space. And then uh, again, uh, once you separate, once you open the arachnoid, it's like splitting the sylvian fissure. Once you open the arachnoid and uh, you release the arachnoid bands, then uh, you can, uh, if you need, you can use retractors. Of course, in this, some of this approach, you don't even have uh, room for the retractors. Now, uh, the other part of your question in terms of uh, devising instruments, I think that uh, we have, uh, specific instruments and difficult, different types of uh, uh, curved and uh, modified uh, round curettes that are available. I have a custom made uh, forcep with the round teeth and the diameter is about one millimeter and the teeth are uh, in the, in the, in the, 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 the forceps allows me to grasp. You have seen in some of the videos. I found that uh, the illuminated bipolar, it's uh, a very useful tool because it allows you to um, increase the, the illumination in a, very, uh, in a very deep field. So I think uh, uh, that you know, it's part of that individualized approach to maximize as much as possible um, all the technology and the tools and the knowledge that we have uh, in order to um, be able to do it with the minimal manipulation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And I think, uh, Dr. Lanzino, you had some very, very useful tips, I think, for whatever level 
and planning these operations. You talked about working to the hardest, planning to reach the hardest bit of the operation, having a good corridor onto that, uh, really going through the symptoms, uh, and then that helps you with the planning, the anatomy and evolution of these cavernomas. So thank you very much, a really excellent talk. I'll uh, hand back to Sam then to continue with the uh, with the next set of speakers. And I just want to send you a mail. Of course, Atul, of comment. course. So, so another very experienced brain stem surgeon, Atul, please. That was a very useful and very informative lecture by Giuseppe. And uh, as Sanjeeva mentioned, there are some very small, little, and very important points that he mentioned. One was about differences in strategy of approaching a cavernoma in a hemorrhagic and a non-hemorrhagic situation. So how you modify your approach, where is the lesion in relationship to the clot and how you remove the more difficult portion of the tumor. So as uh, this, this is a really important piece of information and how you use parietal interhemispheric approach, that is a quite a novel approach for a brainstem cavernoma, Giuseppe. Have you heard this kind of approach ever before, Giuseppe? I have never... Yeah, I mean, the, the, that it's a modification of the, you know, more classic uh, posterior uh, interhemispheric approach. I think that there have been uh, some, uh, uh, you know, cases reported, but again, it's uh, to stress uh, that it might be an, 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 a type of approach that we use often, but uh, it really provides a beautiful view to the dorsal midbrain when uh, you need uh, uh, to look down uh, in a lesion that extends toward the, um, toward the pons. And uh, I found that it's, uh, it really gives you an unparalleled view of that uh, uh, cerebellar um, uh, mesencephalic fissure that sometimes it's, you know, diff where you have difficulty to fully uh, visualize from uh, a more posterior, uh, like a, a supracerebellar uh, infratentorial approach. So uh, there is no question that it has a very, uh, very limited, but I think a, an important role. And too often it's uh, not considered just because it's not one of the approaches that uh, we do on a routine basis. Another point which you mentioned and which has been mentioned, and I wish to know your opinion, you were saying about your reluctance from going to the, from the floor of the fourth ventricle. This uh, you mentioned and many people mention about, you know, how the extraocular movements get disturbed and things like that. But majority, most of the cavernomas in the, particularly in the pons, posterior part of the pons are pointing towards the fourth ventricle. So I want to know once and for all, what is your indication for directing the approach through the floor of fourth ventricle and when you want to avoid it and why you want to avoid it. Can you just clarify this issue, Giuseppe? Yeah, I think again, it's a lot of us to do with personal preferences and personal experiences. I think that Dr. Spetzler in particular has shown us beautifully that you can avoid, sometimes it's even when the lesion is very close or even comes to the floor of the fourth ventricle, you can avoid manipulation of the floor of the fourth ventricle. And sometimes the safer and more effective uh, uh, view is to go through the millocerebellar peduncle. I mean, there is no question that uh, incisions through the millocerebellar peduncles are uh, fairly well tolerated. Um, to get to some of those lesions, they, it's a little bit difficult to get the most medial part. But uh, again, uh, I, I, I have done uh, quite a few cavernous malformations, especially early on, uh, uh, going uh, through the, uh, not, not through the floor of the fourth ventricle. I had chosen that route when I could see that the lesion was clear at the floor of the fourth ventricle. But my, I must say that uh, the post, uh, um, the, the, um, the post-surgical outcomes are, okay, but not great. And many of these patients, uh, they tend to develop some strange uh, visual spatial uh, 
um, you know, symptoms, uh, they just don't feel well. And I come to realize that is probably from the manipulation of the, all the interconnection with the extraocular motility centers. Okay, Sanjeeva. Thank you very much. Thank you both for that interesting discussion. So Sam, I think I'll hand back uh, to you. Thank you very much again. Thank you, Professor Lanzino, for this excellent presentation. Thank you, Sanjeeva, for uh, this uh, excellent moderation. And now uh, we will shift to the next speaker, Professor uh, Roberto Rivera, will uh, start this session. Thank you. Professor Roberto, it's an honor to join us today. Hello, hello, Professor. Uh, excuse me, because I'm just uh, introducing the, in the meeting. Uh, very nice presentation, very nice. Um, I think when, when uh, would you like, I, I, I give some words about this, or we are uh, with the next presentation, Professor Morgos. Can you hear me? Yes, 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 very well. Sam, are you there? Yes, Sam, are you there? yes, yes. yes. I, I, I Professor have a Marcus delay. will start now. Uh, repeat, Professor please. Marcus, please. I'm Professor Marcus, Professor Marcus conference, okay. Yes, it is an honor for me to participate in this meeting. Uh, of course, uh, Professor Marcos, um, it's my pleasure to greet you and, and, and the other speakers. Very, very nice meet, uh, meeting. Um, I believe that Professor Morcos does not need a presentation because he's a well-known neurosurgeon of prestige and world-class neurosurgeon, and does not need my presentation. Um, therefore, and in honor of the time, we are really ready, Professor, to listen with great attention uh, uh, to his um, uh, presentation, surgical presentation about approach to brain stem cavernomas. Uh, Professor Morcos, thank you, Roberto. All, it is all yours, Professor. Thank you, thank you, Sameh. Thank you, everybody. Wonderful to meet you. I assume you're seeing my slide and hearing me well. Um, so this has been a fantastic day focused on the brainstem and I'm delighted and I, I am sure you will hear me probably repeat some things other speakers have said, uh, which is good. It means we agree on certain things. So I'm going to jump straight into it. Disclosures are irrelevant. I will try to cover. You've had some beautiful anatomical uh, presentations earlier, so I will skip through some of my anatomical things, surgical principles and case examples. Anatomy, you know what it is. Uh, you've already seen those things earlier. I like to think also in cross-sectional anatomy between the medulla, the pons and the midbrain, rostral, caudal, uh, and, and so forth. And very quickly, I know you've heard it all before, but uh, I mean, look how dense the brain stem is with important structures. This is the rostral midbrain. Look at the, all the important things that in normal anatomical specimens you cannot touch because uh, in a patient you, you cannot touch, you will injure many things. Look at the caudal midbrain. The pons is more forgiving. It has more so-called non-eloquent zones. It's a larger volume. So it's, you get, that's why you get away so easily by going through the middle cerebellar peduncle. Uh, and the medulla is very dense again. And as you can see from Giuseppe's last case, he had to give it a lot of thought to decide how to get in through the floor of the fourth ventricle and so forth. And that's a caudal medulla. That was pure anatomy. How about surgical anatomy? Uh, again, we have to go back to Albino Bricolo, who, of course, the younger generation probably doesn't know. Uh, of course, he passed away several years ago now. But Albino was the first one to start introducing the concept of safe entry zones and no-fly zones and 
these diagrams are really based on uh, his original work. Uh, the risky areas on the left, the relatively safe entry zones on the right. Uh, this is from uh, Spetzler's papers. I've put for you the green incisions in green, which are understood by most of us to be safe entry zones. You can see them interiorly or posteriorly or laterally. However, the, these ones I put in yellow that I think are terrible approaches, even though some people may consider them acceptable. For example, I would never go through the middle of the ponds anteriorly uh, unless, the cover again, we're talking pure anatomy. We're not, I don't want you to factor in a cavernoma there. I'm talking pure anatomy. Uh, look at the middle picture that's between the medial longitudinal fasciculi and the two green dots. One is suprafacial, one is infrafacial. And the, my favorite ones are the bottom right picture, the supratrigeminal zone, the peritrigeminal zone, and the lower pontine zones. They're all around the trigeminal nerve. Another area which, of course, is not nice at all would be to go between the medullary pyramids. That's why it's in yellow. But going through the olive or a periolivary, that is good. Going through a dorsal mylotomy, as you can see in the bottom right picture, that is also often necessary. So when you summarize all the most common approaches with these green arrows, you, this slide summarizes kind of most of the incisions that you can think of to enter the brain stem, midbrain, pons, and medulla. Of course, as you've already seen, numerous surgical approaches. I am not going to list them for you, but you can see them and, uh, here. So what are the first lessons I learned from just the anatomy of the brain stem? To avoid complications, you've got to understand that anatomical structures get displaced by the lesion. And Giuseppe Lenzino made this point in his talk. Very important. The mostly displaced rather than destroyed. And obviously, that's what you have to keep preserving in your surgery. So what are the surgical principles? The, the coming few slides, I think, uh, I believe are the most important part of my talk, probably more important than the case examples I'm going to show you. So, <clears throat> so uh, hang, hang on with me here to go through them. You have to have goals, you have to have strategies, and you have to have tactics. The goals is the concept of conceptual reasoning. The strategy is the analytical planning of the surgery. And the tactics is what are the tricks that you use to, uh, to go through these strategies to achieve the goals. So now I want to put these goals, strategies, and tactics in one big slide. Excuse me, Dr. Morcos, you fell off your screen share. You fell off your presentation. I did? Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. All right, excuse me. Okay. Let's try again. Okay. The mysteries of the computer, huh? I have no idea yes. why that happens. Yeah. Do you see it, John? Yes, I do. Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> there are four steps to each one of these. The goals, how to get there, how do you find it? You remove it without leaving any trace and you resect it completely. For each one of those goals, you have strategies. Surface geometry to know how to get there. Depth geometry to find it. Optimal intraaxial neural pathway so you, you leave no trace. And very important, uh, some of the audience was asking the question earlier, the microsurgical ergonomics. Uh, that's key in resecting the lesion completely. In the last column, I'm not going to read it all, but there are tactics that subserve each one of those strategies. <clears throat> and uh, I'll get back to those maybe as I'm showing you examples. But that's, that's how I, every time I have a brainstem cavernoma to operate on, 
I think of this slide in my, in my mind and I go through these steps in my mind. So what, uh, what mistakes have I made or have I seen others make and what are the most common mistakes and how, what do we learn from them? So I'm, there are many mistakes I could list, but I chose, I think, the most important ones. Number one, not knowing when not to operate, meaning when you are inappropriately aggressive. Number two, when you are inappropriately conservative. Um, I am glad, for example, Dr. Lenzino chose to operate on this medullary case because the patient was getting worse. So that's good. Number three, very important, anatomy does not equal pathology. The safe entry zones, what you heard me just give you, what previous speakers have talked about, are almost meaningless, almost meaningless, when there is a lesion, a cavernoma that distorts the anatomy. Then, of course, you have to think differently. Favorable geometry does not mean favorable physiology. For example, this old paper of Adam Brown and Bob Spetzler, the two-point method. Of course, it's, com it's incomplete. That's not the only way you choose an approach. Many times, you should not use the two-point method. What I mean is the so-called obvious entry point is not always the safest entry point. And this is very true with the entry into the fourth ventricle. Uh, and I'm going to come back to that again through the example. I, I too, to answer Atul Goel question to Giuseppe, I, whenever I can, I avoid entry through the floor of the fourth ventricle unless the lesion is exophytic not just on the surface, but exophytic in the fourth ventricle. Now, if you remember my slide, if you do poorly with step number one or step number two, you will do poorly in step number three and number four. If step number two gives you a certain approach and step number three gives you another approach, always favor step number three because it's more important. Next. If you think of cavernomas as round mulberry, like everybody describes them, you're gonna, you're gonna have mistakes. You have to think of it as a red cauliflower. Why? Because you can see the picture of a cauliflower. It has protruding irregular parts. And if you cut through one of these parts, you will have a residual lesion and will have a problem and, and, and it could recur. I always sacrifice the small vein, not the main DVA, but the small vein that drains the cavernoma into a main DVA. I have left, I was too conservative early on in my career and I would save every piece of vein and I've had some recurrences in two or three cases and I gone back. So small i believe the small veins need to be removed not the big dva but small veins draining those small the, the cavernomas radio surgery has zero role no role in brain stem cavernoma surgical approaches you know you can think of this problem in two different ways either you think of all the targets you can reach and the approaches that you can get to or the other way around. You can think of all the surgical approaches you're familiar with and each one of them, what target can it get you to? So Spetzler, I believe, still has the largest series in the literature and in his series, still look at the numbers in the hands of a master, new deficits in 53% of the cases, resolution of pre-op symptoms only in one half of the patients and new permanent post-op deficits in 35% of the patients. So this is, you know, there is definitely room for doing better. Kalani did a meta-analysis of the literature, pretty much same results. So Roten, I'm going to use some of his diagrams to show you the various approaches, terrinal, COZ, uh, it's by the way, it's best for the interior midbrain, 
the transylvian pretemporal plus or minus transtentorial is best for the lateral aspect of the cerebral peduncle. The Kawase approach is best for this uh, ponto mesencephalic lateral surface, midbrain and upper pons, not lower than seventh and eighth nerve. I love this approach, supracerebellar infratentorial paramedian is uh, my, usually my favorite verse, as opposed to the midline. That's best for the dorsal midbrain, as you can see. Posterior interhemispheric, uh, uh, transtentorial. Uh, I don't like to use self-retaining retractors, so I, I don't, uh, I put the patient in the lateral position for the head and I don't use a retractor, I just use lumbar drain and let the cerebell, uh, the parietal occipital lobe fall away from the falls. I may put a retractor on the falls, but not on the uh, dependent brain. And that is a very useful approach. Midline suboccipital, of course, for the floor of the fourth ventricle. Retrosigmoid is a very powerful, versatile approach for the entire side of the pons and upper medulla. Rarely used is the pre-sigmoid subtemporal posterior petrosal approach. Uh, if you have a really particularly difficult angle, the far lateral is extremely useful for the upper medulla and lower pons. So what lessons have I learned from these various surgical approaches? Well, planning a surgical approach to an anatomical structure is not the same as planning it to approach a pathologic process. Always choose the simplest approach that provides surface access to the tumor and the correct access of resection. So let's, I think I have about 10 more minutes. Uh, so I'm gonna zip through a few case examples uh, from the top down to the medulla. I'll, I'll skip through several because of time. Let's start, start with the midbrain, where I used a posterior interhemispheric supracollicular transpineal gland approach to get to this thalamo mesencephalic cavernoma. Uh, I'm going to skip the history. A patient had failed cyber knife, and you can see in this video where the lesion is. Somebody else had given cyber knife radio surgery. So here is the lesion. You can see it. It's almost pan midbrain. It erupts into the third ventricle. You can see it here again. And here again on sagittal, you certainly don't want to go through the collicular plate because you will create eye movement problems. So I thought the best entry is where the red dot is where the pineal gland is. So post posterior interhemispheric approach. Uh, you can see I took one bridging vein, no retraction. We are going to cut the tentorium. Uh, we have a lumbar drain. Uh, always beware where uh, the straight sinus is. So here is a straight sinus. I just marked it. I like to open the tentorium not from its edge, but from the middle towards the edge. We are going to cut all that. And of course, you will have an excellent view of vein of Galen. Here is vein of Galen and Rosenthal and the precentral cerebellar vein. And this is a quadrigeminal cistern. And we're going to cut the arachnoid extensively. And by using navigation, I can immediately see where I need to go. I am going to go, you will see it in a second. This is a pineal gland. Uh, all good? All good? Yeah, I mean, thank you. Uh, this is a pineal gland uh, and uh, I'm going through it behind, above the collicular plate. In an adult, we don't really need our pineal gland and you will see Look at the view. I'm in the hemorrhagic cavity above the superior colliculi and uh, the cavernomer section is very easy. Once you're inside, you develop a, a gliotic plane. You stay within the gliotic plane and uh, coagulate whatever is necessary. 
and try to remove it in one piece when possible. That is always my strategy with cavernomas. So I think this angle of approach was perfect. You can see the brain is very nicely preserved. Look at the room I have from lumbar drainage. And here is a post-op MRI. So the lessons from this case is choosing the angle, um, uh, visualizing the vein of Rosenthal and the pineal gland entry. I, uh, those use gravity rather than static retraction. Straight sinus is not always easy to identify. And another example how radio surgery has failed in, in a case of brainstem cavernoma. Let's go to this one. This one I used a supracerebellar, infratentorial, extreme lateral. I don't like the sitting position. I do all my cases in the concord position. For a midbrain superior cerebellar peduncle cavernoma, another surgeon six months before had done a failed telovelar approach. I'll show you the case. She's 28 year old, presented with hemorrhage, a fourth nerve palsy. This is her original presentation to the other surgeon. You can see the hemorrhage. Now you can see he looked at, I guess, at the sagittal and thought, well, maybe the best way is through a telovelar from below up, but that's a long way. And of course, not only that, but there was a large DVA, developmental venous anomaly, covering the posterior surface of the cavernoma. And here it is beautifully seen on an angiogram. Uh, so he got, he got in, only removed a small piece and backed out. That's a post-op scan from that surgery six months before she was referred to me. She recovered actually quite well. The fourth nerve palsy disappeared. But now she comes to me, of course, with her cavernoma still there. Now, what is the best approach here? Well, to me, it's very obvious and very clear that the best approach is supracerebellar infratentorial. That's where the lesion reaches the surface. Why would you go to the fourth ventricle to get to this? You, you shouldn't. So again, to show you briefly what the view looks like, uh, here is the MRI. I just, oh, by the way, look at the hematocrit level in the hemorrhage in the lesion, these hemorrhagic ones, and concord position. and. Within a few minutes, I am looking at the cavernoma. It's presenting itself on the surface. Sharp dissection, identify, this is concord position. I'm using dynamic retraction with my sucker. I will not uh, use, I did not need to use a self-retaining retractor. Look at the beautiful view, the multiple colors. Look at the fourth nerve, I will be working mostly below the fourth nerve. You can see the fourth nerve here. And here is a, one of the branches of the superior cerebellar artery. I am mobilizing it, getting it out of the way. But uh, if necessary, you can work below and above uh, the SCA. That's what I will be doing. Coagulating, shrinking the lesion. Uh, the rest is, you know, same for everything. I like to use these non-stick disposable irrigating bipolars and i'm not going to show you the complete resection and here is the lesion and look how nice and clean the wall of the cavity is but it's never enough you really have to inspect every corner it's very easy as i said earlier to miss residual cavernoma so when you're not sure cut into it coagulate it uh, keep uh, uh, challenging the piece of the wall you're suspicious of till you're absolutely certain nothing is left. And you can see the superior cerebellar artery hanging in midair. And again, at the end, that cerebellum is, is not bruised. It looks good. Again, using good CSF egress and a concord position, not purely prone, but concord. And here is the post-op, uh, uh, no residual. Patient did have a fourth nerve palsy after my surgery, but it recovered completely. Um, 
uh, that's a post op. Uh, lessons you heard me say. Uh, I'm going to go quickly on a couple more cases. This woman was 36 year old and she was 23 week pregnant. She actually lived, she's in Panama, a Panama City. She bled three times. I'm skipping some of the history. They gave her steroids. She became wheelchair bound, not only because of the cavernoma, but because of the steroid myopathy. And look at the acne on her face and her lung, uh, on her chest because of weeks and weeks of decadron. And uh, because they felt that this lesion cannot be op is inoperable. Well, what, of course it is operable, but how? What, the, one, one way you could choose would be telovelar through the floor of the fourth ventricle. But my, my lesson or my warning to you is don't do that, even though it looks like it would be easy because the facial nucleus will be there and the patient had no facial nerve palsy. What is the more, the easier, the safer approach? Of course, simple subtemporal. That's what I did. Keep it simple. And that's, that's what I did. I'm not going to show you the video. Here we are monitoring the fetus. Uh, when, we, when I operated on her, the, fetus, the baby did very well. And I removed it. Simple subtemporal approach. No skull base modification. No nothing. And uh, she did so well. Her hemiparesis was already improving post-op day one. Her third nerve palsy did not change, uh, at least immediately post-op. And I saw, I don't have a picture of her. I saw her, of course, after the baby, uh, she delivered the baby and two years later, a completely recovered, remarkable recovery in this, where she looked so bad. I think I have uh, uh, time maybe for one more case quickly. I, uh, I, I'm going to show you this one. I want you to think of the horizontal fissure of the cerebellum as the equivalent of the sylvian fissure of the supratentorial compartment. Uh, here is what I mean. Um, this I'm is presenting a, the case of. This is a 26 year old woman who hemorrhaged. Here is her cavernoma. Cavernoma with the hematoma in it's the right side. Spanning the, the pons. entire pons. Here I'll show you on a rostrocodal. So it's an entire pons. So you could think of many approaches, including simple retrosigmoid. Uh, you could you I didn't want to use the Kawazi approach. It was too low. I wouldn't be able to reach the lower part. The far lateral approach wouldn't easily reach the upper part. So I said, well, I'm going to do retrosigmoid, but I need to look more medially. So how do you do that? Let me take you straight to the video. Retrosigmoid here. So here you're doing a simple retrosigmoid. So I'm going to let the narration say it. The left side and the supramiatal bone in between the two. Right here. To expand. So I'm going to freeze it a second. Do you, this fissure is so-called petrosal fissure or the horizontal fissure. It separates superior luminu, uh, su superior semilunar lobule from the inferior semilunar lobule. Split it, and that's what I'm going to do. Remember the view you have right now of the brainstem, and compare it to the view the I'm going to get to after splitting the, the fissure. So I'm going to speed through it. It's like it's very sharp. Here are the superior and inferior semilunar lobule. I'm reminding you from Roten's anatomy where we are. This is also called the petrosal fissure. And you're separating the petrosal surface superiorly from the petrosal surface inferiorly. Look now at the view. You see, after I finish splitting, I am going to enter after. through so the middle cerebellar peduncle. Here, right here, the peritrigeminal zone. And then it's a perfect approach, and, and the lesion is uh, out almost, By almost in one piece. Traction, and and at the end, uh, the look at the view. Really, again, no retraction. Dura is closed completely. Uh, here, compare and contrast a view on the left 
which is expanded retrosigmoid versus a normal view, let's say, of an acoustic neuroma without splitting the cerebellar fissure on your right side. Big difference. So please remember this little trick when you're doing a retrosigmoid and you need to go more medially. I'm sorry, I have many, many more cases with, uh, oh, by the way, there is a track. You can see the track that I used on the post-op MRI to avoid the, pont the corticospinal tract to enter through the middle cerebellar peduncle. And here she is, again, doing excellent, recovered absolutely completely. So I think What's I'm going to stop here um, and, and uh, answer any questions. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank Jack, thank and you. Before, before others ask, I will like to compliment you on your wonderful presentation. And without any doubt, you are showing what you have experienced and what is the good point, what is the bad points you have narrated in a fantastic, fantastic man. Only thank one you, my point, uh, you know, I want to discuss with you a little bit, which I didn't like, Jack. You showed a fantastic approach, transpineal gland approach. That, that was a very intriguing approach. But you made one sentence that pineal gland has no function. So that sentence, the Jack, I didn't like. You, know, you may be right. Maybe no, no function that I can measure, but you're going to teach me. Teach me how useful it is in adults and melatonin production. No, no. You may say, you know, there is no terror of error in nature. You know, God does not put something without any meaning. It may be just that we don't know. But you, I think you should refrain from saying it has no function. Because, you know, nothing in the brain has no function. I but agree. The, I retract my statement. <laughs> but the approach that you did, transpineal gland approach, I think that was quite an intriguing and wonderful approach and very, you know, it looked very logical and very relevant. And you did what you did. And you showed what you showed. And I compliment you on that, Jack. Professor Morcos, I have a question for you. Excellent presentation. Um, amazing. Uh, in which cases do you refuse to operate on a patient? A young patient, uh, with a um, small, small size cavernoma without neurological symptoms, in, in which cases do you? For sure. To... A very important question. Uh, asymptomatic patients, I would absol absolutely not operate on an asymptomatic brainstem cavernoma. I would not operate on a cavernoma that is minimally symptomatic or has some symptoms or even a small hemorrhage if I cannot devise an approach that can that I feel is safe. So, you know, middle of the ponds, small cavernoma with a small hemorrhage, I would not operate. I would wait. These are the cases. By the way, usually I'm quite aggressive. I don't necessarily wait as some people talk about waiting for a second and a third hemorrhage. I usually don't. Because the natural history of a first-time brainstem hemorrhage, I take you back to 1998, very good paper by Doug Gonziolka, 5% rebleed per year. Uh, so that's a significant number. So I don't wait. If I can think of a surgical approach that can get me there, following my table with the four steps and the strategies and goals and tactics, I will do it. If I cannot think of an approach because the, it's completely surrounded by eloquent brainstem tissue, I wait. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, does anyone have any question for Professor Morcos? Hassan, no more question. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. We go with the presentation of Dr. Lotton. 
Hello. Hello, Dr. Michael Lotton. It is my honor. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Nice to see you, Roberto. Uh, bueno, um, we are ready to listen to your conference, Professor. Uh, okay. It is all yours, please. Okay, uh, can you see my uh, title slide? Yes, we can. Okay, good. Um, all right, so well, thank you for the uh, inclusion in this nice event, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak with you all. Um, <clears throat> I think um, having listened to Jacques' talk, um, I will try and uh, minimize overlap and um, maybe show you uh, some cases and give you some other additional concepts as I, uh, as I can find them. Um, so um, this is uh, some numbers, a snapshot of uh, what my practice uh, looks like at the moment. Um, uh, over a thousand cerebral cavernous malformations, over 300 brainstem cab mals, and you can see uh, also uh, quite a few in the spinal cord. Um, I uh, have been working for the last two years now on um, my uh, next book, Seven Cavernomas. Um, we're releasing this in the Journal of Neurosurgery as a collection of articles. Um, the first uh, two are out, um, but uh, it's going to be about uh, 18 articles. Um, um, ultimately, they will come out as a book that Tima will publish, but um, we're going to release them uh, essentially chapter by chapter uh, in this format. Um, you know, uh, I've always felt like, um, as we've talked in these um, lectures, it's very difficult to um, know the right surgical approach. Um, the decisions that we make are so critical on outcome and there really aren't good concepts. This two point rule that um, Dr. Spetzler introduced is um, incredibly simplistic and um, really inadequate and there really aren't a lot of other things that we can use. So uh, we have a, an entire system uh, that we've developed um, using uh, a taxonomy that helps you guide your way through these surgical decisions. And um, I'll share with you a little bit of what that looks like. Um, I think cavernomas are exciting because it really, um, they're the prototype for these tissue sparing approaches that capitalize on the subarachnoid space uh, rather than trans uh, parenchymal uh, roots. And so it's a great uh, use of that. Um, and then, um, you know, it's also a, a great way to use uh, deep learning and AI for decision making, and we're, we're developing some really exciting tools that uh, aren't quite ready for me to show you today, but um, uh, will be soon. Uh, this is what I mean by the taxonomy, uh, and this is um, the next article to come out in the Severn Cavernomas collection. Um, when we think about the midbrain anatomy, Jacques uh, showed you um, some of these tracts and nuclei. Um, Rather than a two-point rule or a two-point method, um, my, my thinking is that it's better to think about the, uh, the parcels of the midbrain, uh, really the entire brainstem, and, um, and think about uh, them as discrete lesions. So here you have in this slice um, examples of our taxonomy with the interpeduncular and peduncular midbrain cavernous malformations. This is the tegmental cavernous malformation here in orange. The, uh, collect, uh, the quadrigeminal midbrain lesions are here in blue and the periaqueductal ones in green. And once you've identified the particular uh, uh, type and subtype, in this case, midbrain and, and the different subtypes here, one of the five, then it leads you to the selection of the approach. It, it really um, correlates beautifully uh, with the um, experience of both myself and Dr. Spetzler, which we've used as our, our uh, database for uh, validating a lot of these um, concepts. Um, so here, um, just as an example, you know, here's um, uh, some cases. Well, I'll, I'll show a lot of cases because I think um, that's what people want to see and they're instructive. This is a uh, lesion in the ponds and we're going to go transylvian um, uh, down to the anterior surface of the ponds for a uh, what I would call a, um, a uh, peritrigeminal 
um, pontine lesion. So here uh, you can see uh, the lesion here, it's in the um, left pons and um, the um, approach here, th this would be the basilar territory of the pons, the peritrigeminal territory of the pons is here. So the taxonomy leads you to this transylvian approach and, um, oops. Now, um, uh, you know, the uh, anatomy here is that this thing will be sitting just underneath the superior cerebellar artery and a transylvian uh, root is gonna get us to there. Um, this is um, the brainstem cavernous malformation grading, which we'll talk about later, but we'll do a um, orbitozygomatic approach. And uh, this is what it uh, gets us interoperatively. So here now is a, um, Sylvian Fisher dissection, the frontal lobe is to your right, the temporal lobe is to your left. And um, as with all of these approaches, um, we wanna be as low impact as possible, meaning capitalizing on all of the, um, the natural corridors. Here, we're getting right to the carotid terminus, the M1A1 junction here. And this now is the uh, view around the optic apparatus. So we still have a very long way to go here, but as we work through our triangles, this is the third nerve. This is the edge of the tentorium. And we're really gonna use this ocular motor tentorial triangle to get us down into the space. I'm following here the uh, third nerve and the PCOM back. And um, as I mobilize the temporal lobe, <clears throat> the um, triangles open up to me. I do have a little fixed retraction here, which I don't normally use, but because of the presence of this vein here, which I wanted to preserve, I've um, uh, applied a little, uh, traction on the frontal lobe. And now we can drop into these triangles. This is the third nerve. This is the PCA. This is the SCA. Our triangular space is now in that ocular motor tentorial triangle, lateral to the third nerve. And now we get to the upper belly of the pons. So as we get into that upper belly of the pons, we go through a small little incision in our um, <clears throat> entry zone here. And uh, this is now uh, the lesion coming into view. This was very calcified. You can see um, this large chunk of calcium here on the top side of the lesion. Um, but just underneath it is the, um, the uh, cavernous malformation. And you can see um, portions of this coming out. And you, we're reaching all the way down through this very limited ocular motor tentorial space, this triangular space, into the uh, substance of the pond to, uh, to get this out uh, piecemeal here. So a beautiful view of um, a nice clean gliotic cavity at the end, working lateral to the um, internal carotid artery here. There's our ocular motor uh, tentorial triangle, the third nerve. It's actually um, now here in view. Uh, it was pushed to the side there. This is a nice view um, looking at some of the other anatomy in the region. There's choroidal, PCOM, and uh, a, nice, um, a nice outcome for this patient. Um, so uh, there's um, an example of um, uh, an approach from above of, uh, to the anterior pons. Here now is one um, from the back. Jacques uh, showed you an example. I'll show you another for this pontomesencephalic cav mal. Here it is. Uh, again, um, you can see the contour here of the tentorium, the lesion located right here. And um, uh, this is tailor-made for... Um, a, a lateral supracerebellar infratentorial approach. I like to do this in the sitting position. Uh, here's our grading. It's a, it's a low grade lesion, so good outcome expected. I do these in the sitting. Um, I don't uh, like the Concord as much as I like the sitting. I think it's a very um, nice way to get gravity to retract for you and um, really um, does a nice job of opening up the space. So here now, um, is the view, cerebellum drops nicely with gravity retraction. This is the cranial and caudal branches of the SCA. There's the bifurcation right there. And you can see that I'm just kind of working my way over the cerebellum in between these branches of the SCA. And here is that nice hemocytorin stain on the um, lateral aspect of the midbrain, right at the pontomesencephalic junction. And so I'm going into that uh, lateral mesencephalic sulcus here. And our lesion is just below that surface right here. Nice little expression of um, old blood, liquefied blood. 
And you see that I um, have no trouble visualizing things. I've got good gravity retraction on the cerebellum, no fixed retraction. I can get right into this hematoma cavity. There's the little venous malformation inside the gliotic capsule. And here the um, uh, capsule of the malformation comes into view. Working my way around the capsule, you can see um, um, I've got uh, the ability to mobilize this, work on that dissection plane. And uh, here, um, using uh, my instruments, uh, these delicate uh, miniaturized round knives, you can really work that plane between the outer surface of the capsule and the gliotic margin of the brainstem. And these little um, adhesions get broken up um, one by one. And ultimately, um, this thing frees itself and comes out as a piece. And I think um, it's important to take this out as a single piece. It prevents any little um, portions that, let, that might remain. So if you can preserve the capsule and keep the uh, pathology together, uh, it will uh, improve your complete resection rate. So just going through, um, here we see at the end, nice clean gliotic margins, that's what you want. Um, and a nice um, overview there of the kind of view that you get in that sitting position. Here's the fourth nerve, SCA is here. Our working window is just in the infratrochlear triangle there. And uh, you can see nicely the, um, the arteries wrapping around. This is a view of the third nerve in front of the midbrain going to the ocular motor canal there. This is the fifth nerve, just giving you that sense. Here's Dandy's vein. So in the sitting position, all of this is in your working uh, environment. And so, um, uh, just to show you the end here, this is the uh, resection cavity, nice clean resection, young kid, got right back to work and uh, a normal life. Um, so for um, upper midbrain uh, and thalamic lesions, um, the uh, ventricular root is a nice one. The transcolosal transcoroidal fissure is a wonderful way to go for a lesion like this. You can see it's on the lower aspect of the thalamus, upper aspect of the midbrain. And um, <clears throat> we're gonna go through the uh, corpus callosum, through the ventricle, we have to open the choroidal fissure. And then uh, once we're in there, we've got to work this out from the thalamus. And so that's why a contralateral approach is so nice. Uh, we wanna use the trajectory or the angles to, uh, to maximize our reach laterally. And so um, this is the uh, patient position, the craniotomy, the skin incision. Uh, the angulation of the neck, that brings gravity into play. Uh, the Falx holds the other hemisphere up for us. Uh, we get that contralateral trajectory across and it really um, helps us get uh, what we need. So here is the view down the interhemispheric fissure. Um, you can see uh, the um, dissection down here onto the corpus callosum. The um, transcolossal root gets us into the, it's, well, it's actually the contralateral ventricle with the side opposite the cavernous malformation. Here now is that tuft of choroid. This is the fornix, this is the choroidal fissure, uh, and this is the tinea fornicea. So by following this thin arachnoid layer, we can um, separate the fornix from the um, choroid plexus that opens our foramen magnum here. This is the foramen magnum right there. And um, here you'll see I'm putting a little fibrillar up against the fornix to protect it. Then in comes the um, cottonoid so that any uh, manual traction on the fornix is padded. And now we get into the um, third ventricle. This is um, the massa intermedia, which I'm dividing here. And just on the other side of massa intermedia, we get to the medial wall of the thalamus, a little bit of stain there on the wall. And with a little incision with my angled 30 degree round knife, I'm in and on top of the lesion right there. So it's just a thin layer over the top. I'm right on the malformation at this point. And the challenge of course now is to make sure that upper outer corner, that lateral upper corner is pulled into our working channel. So that's where these um, angles and uh, instruments are so very vital. Um, we can work that plane again, staying inside the capsule for the debulking, but then working the plane between the capsule and the thalamus uh, to pull it downward. 
And again, gravity helps us pull the lesion into our field of view. And here um, you can see the lesion dropping into our working channel. And bring that down. And uh, here now towards the end, um, we're getting to that nice clean gliotic margin, no evidence of any residual mulberries here and uh, a nice overview of the, uh, the spaces that we've opened. And uh, here is the, uh, the uh, post-operative uh, scan. Um, <clears throat> this is an ABM, um, uh, but shows you uh, the same approach. Um, I use a uh, sitting supracerebellar infantentorial um, midline or paramedian. And um, for this one, the initial bleed was suggestive of cavernous malformation. The angiogram was negative, um, but um, we waited um, on this. Um, we repeated the angiogram and this actually turned into an ABM. So you can see here an early draining vein, a little uh, tuft of the, um, of the nidus here and um, uh, a blow up, blown up view here, you can see uh, this arterial venous uh, nidus here draining into the precentral cerebellar vein. So um, in this case, an AVM, but uh, same concepts here. This is gonna be a sitting supracerebellar infratentorial approach. And uh, here's that beautiful view that you get. Um, we go uh, into the attic of the uh, space here. We get right down to this thickened arachnoid around the galenic complex take down all of that arachnoidal adhesion. And what we're looking for is that arterialized vein. You can see here, uh, this is that arterialized precentral cerebellar vein. You can actually see the um, shunted arterialized blood flowing into it. This is a little medial edge of the occipital lobe herniating over the um, incisural space. And as we work that plane, we can release the occipital lobe from it. It drops the cerebellum further and it takes us right down to our AVM. So here um, we can just start to uh, confirm our AVM here with the draining vein over there. We can start to uh, go at our feeding arteries circumferentially. This nidus was actually uh, was right in the substance of the collicular plate, which we're seeing here. And just by um, dissecting around the nidus, you can see um, the AVM is here based on its venous stock here. This is a beautiful view, the last little feeder here uh, from up above, but um, we're looking up into the aqueduct of Silvius here. One of the last feeders, the ABM comes out. There is our um, clean um, uh, resection uh, area. The draining vein, the precentral cerebellar vein that was shunting before is now quiet. So we can coagulate that. There's the nidus there. And it comes out as a little piece there, very small nidus, but obviously hemorrhagic and dangerous. And here's that beautiful view looking into the aqueduct of Silvius and into the um, third ventricle from below. There's that glistening ependymal surface. And again, um, very comfortable working in this position. I'm seated. The um, um, uh, chair that I sit in has nice armrests that elevate. You can see the venous complex of the uh, vein of Galen and its tributaries. And uh, once again, just a beautiful view um, into that deep region. So uh, there you have it. Um, and uh, she um, uh, did very well there. She post up with Angie Graham. Uh, one other case uh, is this um, transpontal medullary sulcus approach. Um, I like the far lateral for this, gets you into the vago accessory triangle. And um, through the triangle, it takes you right to the uh, ponto mesencephalic, sorry, ponto medullary sulcus right here. And you can get up into the, uh, what I call the super olivary portion of the pons. So this is a super olivary pontine cavernous malformation and um, uh, this is what uh, these look like. Here's our far lateral exposure. We can elevate the tonsil just a little bit to expose our uh, vagal accessory triangle. Looking up here, this is 9 and 10. 11 is coming up in this direction. 
We're working between the rootlets of 11 and the inferior aspect of 10. And you can see the malformation here coming to the surface on that panto or panto medullary sulcus. So we get right into the uh, malformation from below, working in that nice triangular space. And we work our way around this thing. We can mobilize the malformation into our view. Here it's, um, you can see the classic mulberry appearance, a nice gliotic plane working very sharply, the perforators away from the um, malformation on the anterior aspect, mobilizing the malformation one to one side and then the next, and just working our way around and ultimately getting, um, getting around that. So um, I wanna um, finish my remarks um, Sorry, I want to finish my remarks by uh, talking about patient selection. And uh, let me just go to uh, this. You know, I think um, we've uh, spent a lot of time talking about surgical approaches and not so much about um, the uh, patient selection, but I, I want to remind people of this um, grading scale that we introduced um, uh, now some time ago. Um, the uh, um, points on the scale are very much like the points on the supplementary system where you have a, a size, um, a venous component and an eloquence component. When you talk about the brainstem, everything's eloquent, obviously. So really what matters is does it cross the axial midpoint? That's sort of the analogous variable for what I would call eloquence in the brainstem. And so we um, assign our points, and these are um, uh, very much like uh, AVM grading, uh, zero, one on down. Um, and then for the supplementary part of the grading um, for AVMs, we have an analogous thing here where we have an age variable and a hemorrhage variable. Uh, in this system, the age is either zero or two points, depending on whether they're under or over 40 years of age. Uh, and then for hemorrhage, we have a, um, a zero, one, and a two for acute, subacute, and chronic. And the idea here is that <clears throat> if you can capture an AVM that's um, freshly bled, <clears throat> then that blood liquefies. You've got uh, liquid uh, in the surrounding spaces that help um, free the malformation from its uh, adhesions to the brainstem, and that's very advantageous. You start to lose that in the subacute window when um, the liquef liquefied blood starts to get reabsorbed and you start to get scar tissue forming. And here, um, after eight weeks, um, all of the fluid is gone and uh, you get this gliosis and scarring, which can, um, I think, make it very challenging to, um, to get these free. So um, you can see how these variables come together. Uh, there's your age, uh, zero or two points, depending on the 40 uh, year cut point. Here's the axial midpoint, whether it's crossing the midpoint or not. The size component, a zero or a one, and hemorrhage here. So these um, elements of the brainstem grading system are nice because what it does is it separates these into uh, categories. Um, you'll see from this table that the, the number of grades range from zero to seven. So you can have essentially eight different grades, and um, that's a lot. Um, but it does a nice job of separating into what I call low grade, which is zero, one, or two, intermediate grade, three, four, or five, and then high grade, six or seven. This was data from um, our original paper, and you can see there just weren't enough uh, patients in the high grade for us to, to know what the cut point was, but we subsequently looked at um, my experience combined with Dr. Spetzler's experience, <clears throat> and you can see um, the distribution of grades, uh, but more importantly, if you look at outcomes here, we've got um, good and poor outcomes on the left. We have worsen or same slash improved on the right. And um, the grading system does a nice job of dividing the uh, cavernous malformations into the ones um, that are at risk for, um, for worsened outcome or poor outcome. Here's the poor outcome. You can see the high grade lesions, the sixes and the sevens have a much higher risk of um, um, 
of uh, a, a poor outcome than the low or the intermediate grade uh, malformations. And over here, you can see the low grade um, cavernous malformations um, are likely to stay uh, the same or improve. The intermediate grade ones are also likely to stay um, the same or improved, and you get a higher risk of worsening here in the higher grade lesions. These are some of the statistical numbers. The AROC, uh, the 0 0.73, uh, is shown here. So um, <clears throat> with that, um, let me go to my uh, concluding slides here. Um, I could keep showing cases, but I just wanted to summarize. Here, um, so looking at the midbrain, um, this is our menu of uh, craniotomies and approaches. You can see the workhorse approaches are the ones with the check marks, uh, the transylvian, transcolossal, transcoroidal fissure, lateral supracerebellar infotentorial, and the midline skit. Those are the key ones for the midbrain. The, um, the pons, um, also many approaches, primarily uh, retrosigmoid, and one can go either trans CP angle or trans MCP. Uh, you can also um, reach these transventricularly through the, uh, the midline, or you can reach these through the pontomedullary sulcus and a far lateral exposure. These are the workhorse approaches for the pons. And then for medulla, um, once again, uh, you can see the menu, uh, the various craniotomies, the different approaches, and, um, and, and how, we, uh, how we select. So um, patient selection, I think, is the, is the key. Um, you want patients to have a uh, history of hemorrhage and deficits, and this uh, grading system, I think, is a real nice tool to help make those decisions wisely. Um, you want the lesions to be on the surface, um, um, either on the pia or the appendima, but when not, um, uh, the safe entry zones will get you there. Um, read your films carefully because the, uh, the MRI definitely overestimates the surface uh, proximity of the malformation. And um, uh, more often than not, um, these are hiding deeper than you expect. Uh, approach and enter safely. Uh, do an intercapsular dissection and an on-block resection whenever possible. This ensures that all the different components of the lesion come out as a complete uh, specimen. And lastly, there's a very fine line between complete resection and surgical morbidity, meaning you don't want to push things too far in your quest for a complete resection and hurt the patient. But on the other hand, you don't want to shy away from being meticulous and thorough and, uh, and leave them. Um, lesion behind. So with that, um, I think I'll stop. Um, you know, as I said at the beginning, um, um, a lot of this, um, these concepts and data will be coming out as part of our seven cavernomas uh, collection in JNS, and uh, I hope you enjoy that. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Loton. Amazing experience. Very, very nice presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, and does anyone have any question for Professor <coughs> Michael Lotton, please? Any question? Okay, Professor, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I have a quick question for Michael. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask you on the indications, like you mentioned um, hemorrhage and deficit. What about one where you're, you're watching a brainstem cavernoma and it's growing, but there's no deficit? What do you generally do with those? But it hasn't hemorrhage. It's kind of just enlarging, but no, no clinical events. Yeah, uh, I think those are challenging, James, because, you know, um, the patient, if they've got no symptoms or deficits, they're perfect, and um, you can't make them any better than that. So um, um, I uh, tend to um, be conservative on that because, um, you know, it depends on what you're dealing with, of course, but um, by operating, you run the risk of giving them a deficit. And um, um, if the bleeding activity is entirely intracapsular and, and uh, asymptomatic, then um, you know, maybe the capsule is doing its job, and you should just let it to, let it continue. Um, if it's um, 
profound growth and um, um, uh, it, it's a very dramatic change, then in all likelihood, they have some symptoms or will shortly get symptoms. And I think that's really when to strike. Thank you. Another question. <phone rings> Professor, um, what do you think in cases of uh, refractory epilepsy in deep located uh, cavernomas? Do you think that in even in a small cavernoma, uh, do you indicate uh, surgery? Uh, what do you think about it? So, sorry, your question is um, whether I think surgery in, for in the small brainstem lesion is indicated? Yes, yes, it is indicated in with the symptomatology of the patient is refractory epilepsy. No, in yeah, brain um, sense, in deep yeah, for sure. cavernoma. If, um, if the patient's having uh, seizures, then it's probably not from a brainstem cavernous malformation. But you know, if we're talking about a cerebral cavernous malformation and that's the cause of the seizure, then I will go for it for sure. Because um, you know, um, an active cerebral lesion that's hemorrhagic and uh, localizes to the side of the seizure, I think it's worth doing. You know, those are very safe procedures to perform um, and patients can uh, do very well. We've published extensively on our seizure control rates uh, after cerebral cavernous malformation removal and um, they're uh, above 80%. And so I think it's valuable to do so. Thank you. Any question more? <coughs> okay, Sam. Okay, Sam. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Marcus and Professor Lawton for this uh, outstanding lectures. Thank you, Professor Roberto, for uh, outstanding uh, and excellent moderation. And now uh, we will shift to next speaker. Professor uh, Alma, please uh, introduce our uh, next lecture. Professor Alma is the president uh, at Chapter of Pediatric Neurosurgery, Mexican Society of Neurological Surgery. Thank you. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Professor Martin Schumann. Uh, he is a pediatric neurosurgeon neurosurgeon at the University of Tübingen in Germany. And he will talk about the brainstem tumors in children. Hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak this evening on uh, concluding a fascinating program. Um, so we are switching gears after that uh, terrific talk on uh, cavernomas to brainstem tumors or tumors around the brainstem. I will uh, share my screen with you and um, hope that this works. Can you see my, my slides? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, so welcome from Tübingen in Southern Germany. I'm working here with Marcos Tatajiba as uh, head of section of pediatric neurosurgery. And I was invited to talk on the brainstem tumors in children. Um, some general considerations. Posterior fossa tumors in children are the most common brain tumors in children, compromising about 50% of all pediatric brain tumors. And the majority of them are medulloblastomas or ATRT or fourth ventricular pilocytic astrocytoma, so classic fourth ventricular tumors plus minus infiltration of the brainstem that can happen. The next most common location is then the hemispheric cerebellar tumors, mostly pilocytic astrocytomas or almost exclusively. Um, rarely a higher grade or diffuse grade, about 15%. Then we have in the forced ventricle, the, and the CPA plus minus brainstem invasion, nasty tumors, the ependymomas, however, only compromising 4%. 
they are specific because we will talk about that they have a very bad prognosis if they are not um, completely removed. And brainstem tumors per se coming from the brainstem in children are only about 6% um, of all tumors in children. The most problematic is the DIPG, the diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma, which is always assigned a, VHO, a WHO grade four. Uh, they are often K27M mutated and have a, have a bad prognosis. And so far we cannot offer any cure to these tumors. And the, uh, the other brainstem tumors, and that's where we are concentrating today, are the circumscribed, more diffuse, often lateralized, uh, lateralized uh, low-grade gliomas. Most of them pilocytic astrocytomas, and the next most common entity are ganglioglioglomas. Pure CPA tumors in the pediatric population, uh, like vestibular schwannomas, meningiomas, and so on, are, are even more rare. What are the indications and the goal of surgery in, in, post, in brainstem or in these posterior fossa tumors? Um, for medulloblastomas, ATRT and PCA in the fourth ventricle, we require cross-total resection without the infiltration zone. Especially in medulloblastoma, we have learned that we must not cause harm um, because they are pretty chemosensitive and radiation sensitive, and it's not justified to really uh, do a big damage. And you always leave the infiltration zone to the brain stem. In ependymoma, the story is extremely different. I already um, pointed to that. You require cross total resection with the infiltration zone <clears throat> because these tumors are not chemosensitive and poorly sensitive to radiation therapy. So gross total or R0 resection is what we really need to achieve if these children, especially the molecular subtype of PFA um, in the small children, this is necessary if you want to cure these children. In brainstem tumors in the DIPG, there is the option of biopsy, but currently, the consensus is that you only do this if you enroll these children in an in a ongoing study where you investigate for molecular genetically defined targeted therapy according to the mutation profile. Uh, only then a biopsy actually is, is justified unless the tumor is not a classical DIPG and might be one of these more lateralized possibly low-grade um, tumors like PCA or ganglioglioma. In these cases, um, so a atypical DIPG should always be biopsied. But if all the classical criteria are fulfilled, only when you do this in a study. These type of tumors we are concentrating today actually require a subtotal resection. That means at least 90%. A gross total resection is a nice goal, is a nice thing to do, but only if you do not harm the patient because this is a benign disease and the overall survival after 10 years is somewhere at 90%. So there's no reason to harm the patient just for the heck of having done a gross total resection. Often this is still possible, but it should never be the intention to treat because after subtotal resection, these tumors in children actually can undergo a process which is called oncogen-induced senescence. That means these tumors stop growing after a subtotal resection or even regress. If a residual tumor continues to grow, you still have the option of chemotherapy, which is quite good in halting any progress until, for example, a child is old enough and that it can tolerate radiotherapy if you still have progressing tumor. Or you come back after five years, do another surgery. And finally, if the tumor still grows, you can give him radiotherapy if the child is 15 years or above. So the strategies are different than uh, in adult neurosurgery, especially in these low-grade gliomas. You already heard in the excellence talks before that the approaches is always depending on location, location, and location. 
And I, I do not have to add much uh, to that what you just heard. Um, in the upper brainstem, if it is a midline tumor, which is coming out from that area, we use a telovela approach, TVA. Everything lateral, you use the upper retrosigmoid combined with a lateral suprasarabellar approach. And there you can access the posterior lateral surfaces. If the very rare, I'm not having an example of an anterior tumor surfacing here uh, in the interpeduncular fossa, of course, you have to use uh, an anterior approach. In the middle brainstem, um, in the midline, again, telovela approach, lateral retrosigmoid, and if it goes anterior, and there's always a nice option to use the endoscope and uh, to see around the corner and work around the corner. And of course, the tumor needs to, to make uh, the way and create the space for you to work. In the lower brainstem, um, medulla and obex and craniocervical junction, we use the TVA for midline. We have the subtonsillar midline approach for everything lateral here. And for the anterior part, again, you lose subtonsillar plus end, uh, endoscope to, to get around the corner. What can be reached by a TVA? Um, Telovelo approach is our standard approach because you actually get from everywhere from the aqueduct down to the to C1 or C2. You can reach everything in the midline with, um, with a Telovelo approach. There's no reason to go transvermian. If you want to get up here, of course, if you need to the pineal region, um, you have to go supracerebellar. Additional use of endoscope is very much recommended to look into the, into the corners where you have a very particular uh, view. This is the most often site for recurrences. If you combine this with a super subtonsillar approach, you basically get to the lower CPA, everything below seven, eight, you can and very nicely accessed with the subtonsillar approach. So that is our standard approach for the lateral lower brainstem. And you have already seen it in the last uh, Cavernoma presentation. Um, you can work around the cranial, caudal cranial nerves from uh, nine to 12 vertebral artery and anterolateral lower brainstem. By the retrosigmoid approach, um, if you use the upper retrosigmoid uh, approach and combine it with a supracerebellar approach, you get to everything above seven and eight, up to the third nerve, the fourth nerve, the fifth nerve, you can see using the upper retrosigmoid approach and using the scopes, you can get uh, to anterolateral portions of, of a tumor. The lateral brainstem on the level of the pons, um, of course, this is the standard retrosigmoid approach where you see everything from the fifth to the ninth and caudal cranial nerves, but not below. Uh, for this, you're better off with the subtonsillar approach. And again, if you want to work more anterior, we encourage to use endoscopes as an adjunct. How do you open the dura? Classically, people open the dura in a Y shape, which we actually have totally abandoned. Um, because if you do a Y shape incision, there's a high rate of duraplasty or meningocele's or uh, dura fistula. And you always have to retract the dura to see lateral. Using the U shape um, approach, you do not have to do any retraction. That means you are not bringing the dura in the air, it's not drying out. You have a very nice um, opportunity to always close the dura um, without duraplasty. So we published a series of 50 consecutive cases where we had no duraplasty, no meningocele, no CSF fistula. So normally you can always close and you always have a very nice exposure to the lateral parts of the lower brainstem and for the subtonsillar approach. This is totally sufficient. So I can recommend that as a standard opening technique for the midline approach to the fourth ventricle and the brainstem. Intraoperative electrophysiological monitoring has been already mentioned uh, before is key to all those procedures. And even in the smallest kits, you can do everything you can do in adults. 
this always takes you an extra hour to, to actually get them ready for complete monitoring all, of all caudal cranial, of all cranial nerves, SCP, MEP, AEP, and then we have the direct stimulation in addition, a worthwhile uh, effort because this makes surgery safe, as you know. But machines alone, we know is not enough. You need to have five of or seven days qualified technicians and the interpretation and the communication between the technician or the electrophysiologist and the surgeon is, is instrumental to really know when to stop or give some time or continue. I'll show you some examples um, for um, the different areas I have been uh, mentioning so far and the different approaches. So here's an example of a pilocytic um, astrocytoma in a 17-year-old girl who just had some headaches and uh, has this exophytic tumor coming from the upper brainstem blocking the aqueduct, uh, coming here a little bit lateralized uh, to the left side. Um, clearly, you don't need a biopsy. This is the typical picture of a pilocytic astrocytoma. You can bet a lot of money on that. And with this inhomogeneous um, contrast uptake, a clear delineation, somewhere is an infiltration zone. So this is an ideal case for a velotelar approach where you do not have to touch anything of the, of the cerebellum. Um, and you can nicely get to the area, remove uh, the tumor, get clear margins without any harm to any structure. And this is the three months post-operative scan in, in this girl and she was fine. She had a little bit irritation here of her tectum. So for about five, six days, she had some double vision and uh, that was it. So a good approach for upper midline dorsal um, tumors coming from the brainstem. Now we have an example of a combined upper retrosigmoid supra uh, cerebellar approach. Uh, this is a seven-year-old boy, which was treated since uh, 2015. We've had chemotherapy and a biopsy in a different institution. And then this was um, observed and he had progression after finishing the chemotherapy. They tried a different chemotherapy and he was still progressing. And now you have to define what you want to operate in this child. So we have a a lower part down here, which is not progressing that much. It looks pretty similar than before. And we have the progression in the upper part and that is giving the trouble. So I have delineated what I want to resect in this case, because remember, we must not harm and we don't want to cause caudal cranial nerve problems down here or seven, eight problems uh, hearing, not caudal cranial nerve, seven, eight problems uh, up here. So. This is the definition what we want to resect. And of course you have to define what you want to leave behind. So you're not going in these zones, transition zones or subtotal resection is the goal of surgery. And this is the post-operative result. We used a lateral retrosigmoid anterior uh, upper approach so we could get everything out from below. We could visualize seven, eight stop early enough uh, not to get into the entry zone, removed the active part of the tumor. This is the post-operative scan in 2019 with still some residual parts. And if necessary, we can come from below at a later time point if these tumor parts progress. So far, 2021, two year follow up, everything is stable. We have a nice situation, no progressing tumor, the child is fine and we will observe. And um, she's now nine years old and we hope we don't have to intervene anymore. Now um, we can move a little bit further down in the middle of the brain stem, example of an ependymoma of the forced ventricle lateral recess treated by telovela approach. You see the huge tumor in the fourth ventricle, um, partly contrast uptaking in the cerebellum, but as you will see a typical ependymoma going around the brainstem on both sides. 
and uh, the brain stem in here um, encased by tumor. This is the exit and entry zone of the caudal cranial nerves. And you have the task of completing uh, the resection, if possible, R0 means no tumor left, because that's the only chance for this child to survive. It is an 18 month old boy. This is a PFA. This is the nas most nasty and worst uh, case scenario for these children. Uh, they have no chance to survive by chemotherapy and radiation if you leave too much tumor behind. This is two and a half years after surgery and graduation. This is a day's work. You're sitting a day on that. And this is um, now so far, we are at three and a half years and he is without recurrence. And um, you can clean all that by a standard telovela approach where you can easily get through the foramen lushke to the lower and subtonsillar approach and also clean around the corners here. Um, we come to an example of um, mid-lateral brainstem so uh, pilocytic astrocytoma treated by a retrosigmoid approach. This is a seven-year-old boy who had problems for some time already with vomiting and gait disturbance, which was not cleared until he got a facial paresis. And at the time he presents, he has a grade three, House and Bragman facial paresis and a loss of hearing in the meantime, and this huge pilocytic astrocytoma, which you often actually can see much better on T2 weighted images than on the T1 weighted, because you see, this is the tumor. This is the edema around. This is not tumor, this is just edema. And we have here um, the, the, the solid tumor portion and the associated typical cysts around, typical for pilocytic astrocytoma. So this was treated by a retrosigmoid approach. And we see we had to leave tumor alongside the facial nerve at the entry zone of the facial nerve. And he um, was unchanged after surgery. Facial paresis has uh, recovered. And this was in 2015. And now um, we are in 2021, six years later. The residuals had been growing a little bit in the initially, and now they are stable since three years. And we observe this residual tumor. The boy is fine. He's living a normal life. Um, facial nerve has recovered so far um, that he does not need any um, plastic surgery. And we wait and see what happens. And maybe he's old enough to do radiation or whatsoever in case he gets another regress uh, progression. I'm showing you a similar case as a short video uh, where we can go through. Don't worry, we are not going to be here for seven minutes. This was also a girl, um, Professor Tadajiva and myself operated together a few years ago with this large tumor, pilocytic astrocytoma from the brainstem lateralized into the CPA. We use a retrosigmoid approach in lying position and you see the caudal cranial nerves in the capsula of the cyst, which you have to uh, carefully dissect. And then you enter in between the caudal cranial nerve fibers um, inside the cyst. I'm scrolling a little bit. So, and then you come to the tumor. We have seven and eight in the upper left corner. This is the ICA, which is running over the tumor, which needs to be uh, spared. And then you work with the CUSA inside the tumor. The caudal cranial nerves have now collapsed and you push them here on the right, you push them downwards, and then you can enter the solid parts of the tumor you work them away from seven and eight. And, and then it's the very similar dissection as you would do in a <clears throat> other CPA tumor, you enucleate inside and then you can with a bimanual technique uh, work uh, around. We have seven and eight, we have the ICA and the branch of the ICA coming from here running over the tumor, through the tumor, and 
here is the labyrinthine artery going into the internal auditory canal. So this is what you actually have to dissect sharply out of the tumor to preserve brainstem function, hearing, and cerebellar function. So, and then in the end, you work your way alongside um, the vertebral artery downwards, the caudal cranial nerves. And uh, I don't know why the video went away. Okay. In the last case I'm presenting you is now a combination of all the approaches I have shown to you. This is a, a child we operated about six weeks ago, um, increasing ataxia, morning vomiting, and he actually, the girl comes to the clinic when she has a right facial paresis for three days, significant hearing loss, and we see this huge ependymoma, which is in the forced ventricle, in the CPA, up to the tentorium, and down uh, to the caudal cranial nerves. And this is nothing you can do by one approach. So you either do a midline approach and a second surgery, another approach, or you combine both approaches in, in one. That's the so-called uh, combined approach for these type of tumors in the fourth ventricle and in the CPA. And then you combine subtonsillar retrosigmoid and uh, telovilla approach, um, quite vascularized this tumor. And this is the approach. Here is the normal craniotomy you would do for a midline approach. This is the normal craniotomy you would do for a retrosigmoid approach. And you combine that into one big craniotomy. And then we did two separate dural openings, the U-shaped dural opening here for the midline and the retrosigmoid opening uh, behind the sin uh, sigmoid sinus as we would do for a standard um, approach to the CPA. And in the midline, you see then the, the uh, ependymoma protruding. This is the pica inside. Uh, the ependymoma has to be dissected out of the tumor. And then you can go subtonsillar and see the caudal cranial nerves, the vertebral artery. And after enucleation of the tumor, you can work the tumor off the caudal cranial nerves uh, until you actually, it gets out of sight. Uh, you kind of get an idea where the jugular foramen is and then you switch to the lateral retrosigmoid approach after you have cleaned in the middle everything. And here we have the caudal cranial nerves um, entering the jugular foramen and in the uh, upper area, there is no facial nerve, there is no cochlear nerve, there's just tumor. And inside then you have to be very carefully because seven and eight are inside uh, the ependymoma and surrounded by tumor and, you, and we worked it out. And um, we, in the end, the patient um, had a total facial paresis which had increased, but the nerve can recover because we could stimulate it until the very end. And this is the cochlear nerve in the patient. Uh, this is the cochlear nerve. The patient even retained some, some hearing and that is the facial nerve here in front. Some residual hearing. Here's the abducent nerve. And uh, this is the end of the resection in the CPA with still some infiltration. This is the ICA, which was inside the tumor, still some infiltration of the ependymoma, but this is as good as you can do. And you would not cut all those fashion, uh, all those nerves in the first attempt. This is the post-operative result. And um, she's now waiting and undergoing radiotherapy. Finally, um, the subtonsillar approach and left rotated head. So in a tumor like this, you use a normal midline approach, but you rotate the head of the patient. So the left side uh, comes upwards and then we could by a standard midline approach enter the brainstem at the area where this pilocytic astrocytoma actually surfaced. And this is the post-operative result. We left some infiltrated parts because of electrophysiology told us better leave that because this is the pyramidal tract here. We left some infiltrated areas here, the boy 
uh, came out without any additional deficits. And here I'm demonstrating you this phenomenon of oncogen-induced senescence. So this is um, six years later, and um, we are not seeing any residual tumor, although we had some contrast uptake postoperatively. And he's a normal boy without any problems. And now six years later, even without any visible uh, residual tumor. So in summary, um, the games or the, the, the situation in children is quite different due to age, due to pathologies. And it's a different story than standard um, brainstem tumor surgery in adults. The main indications for surgical resection is in non or little infiltrating low-grade gliomas and ependymomas. And of course, medulloblastoma and so on, but that is more forced matricular surgery. The location determines the approach as usual. And we, with these three approaches, we basically can, in these children, address most problems. You don't need very far lateral, extreme lateral, or translateral bone approaches to get to the pathology. In rare exceptions, of course, but not for the main cases. In low grade, we aim at a 90% plus subtotal resection as a minimum goal and only gross total if we are not uh, getting new deficits which have to be avoided. I'm seeing quite often children which really were damaged for life in, um, in low grade glioma surgery in that area and I think that really should be avoided. And ependymoma is a different story here. We have to be mean, we have to lose also residual facial nerve function because that is um, the only chance for cure. So really you have to try hard, try hard for our, at least our one resection. That means no residual scenes in MRI. So we can leave infiltration on cranial nerves. Intraoperative monitoring is a condition without, uh, we would not operate without that. Um, but we are in the lucky situation that we have it available, of course, and you can use the endoscope to look around corners. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor. It's a very nice presentation. Please. Hang in there, the bandwidth is low. Just wait. So I'm I'm having maybe some problems with my internet. So I'm, I'm yeah, not... no no, it's not you. Uh, it's Griselda. Uh, that's okay, Sam. Can you take <laughs> over, please? Oh, okay. Anyone have any question uh, for Dr. Schumann? Okay, thank you, Sil, for uh, your excellent presentation. We have honored today to have you as the excellent speaker in this uh, symposium. Thank you, Sil. Thank you. And now we will, and now we will shift to uh, our uh, last speaker, uh, both to uh, James Liu, uh, my dear uh, friend, who have uh, made a great effort and this symposium to put all these uh, panelists uh, together. Professor uh, Liu is a professor of neurological surgery, director of uh, cerebrovascular skull based pituitary surgery, water girls, what girls neurological institute of neurosurgery. Thank you, sir, for accepting my invitation and thank you for your efforts. We are with for you. Great. Thank you, Same. Uh, congratulations on another excellent symposium. Um, honored to be here again today. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay. Yes, that's okay. 
Okay, well, I'm going to focus on uh, the anterior transpetrosal approach and, and variations thereof in getting to areas of the brainstem and how can we maximize this corridor. And I think it's important that we understand this corridor and uh, understand where it gets us and what are the technical nuances that make this corridor work uh, for, for your uh, repertoire of surgical approaches. So I think when we talk about CP angle and brainstem, you know, this is the, the general workhorse, which is the retrosigmoid approach. And you can see it can get you to portions of the brainstem through this uh, angle, and, and you can get to the middle cerebellar peduncle for a number of pontine lesions. But your, your view is limited in this trajectory along the parallel along the surface of the petrous bone. But let's say you want to look directly on the lateral brainstem. Your view is, uh, is a little bit skewed. So um, here's a number of variety of different um, uh, CP angle lesions that often will distort the brainstem. And, um, and you can use a number of approaches. And I, and I think having a, a repertoire of additional approaches to these areas is very important, whether it's coming through the petrous bone or even anteriorly through the clivus. So I, I think when we think about petrous bone, we have to think about, uh, um, you know, being a, an artist like Michelangelo, a sculptor, if you will, uh, or even uh, an archaeologist, uh, being able to excavate important neuroodologic structures in the temporal bone. When we think about the Kawasi's approach, it's really through this red uh, corridor, through the anterior petrous apex, which is a corridor that's naturally between the fifth and the seventh nerves. And we can divide the clivus into fourths, and um, the OZ, or subtemporal, can get you to the upper fourth, and the Kawasi really gets you to this second fourth between the fifth and the seventh nerves. And then if you combine that with a posterior patrosal, which is retrolabyrinthine temporal bone removal, this can get you down even lower on the clivus. And the lower one-fourth is generally the far lateral transcondylar approach to get to the cervical medullary junction. And we shouldn't forget the workhorse, which is the retrosigmoid that gives you wide exposure. And even anteriorly through an endonasal transclival approach will give you this midline anterior approach. So I think even though the retrosigmoid approach is the workhorse, I think these transpetrosal type approaches remain important in our armamentarium for both vascular and skull-based lesions. When we, when we think about the petrosal approaches, we can break it down into, into anterior and posterior. And the anterior petrosal is popularized by Professor Kawase, and generally it's a subtemporal middle fossa craniotomy that allows you to get to the posterior fossa by cutting the tentorium and drilling that anterior petrous apex to get to the posterior fossa. And a posterior petrosal approach is uh, generally what we call a pre-sigmoid approach where the window is in front of the sigmoid sinus and generally behind the otic capsule. So this is a uh, anatomical view showing the window between the fifth and the seventh nerves. You can see how it takes you right on that anterolateral surface of the brainstem between the fifth and the seventh nerves. You can also get to the mid basilar trunk and also extradurally you can get to the clivus. So these are the number of pathologies you can get to, a number of extradural, intradural neoplasms and uh, brainstem cavernomas as well as uh, upper to mid basilar trunk aneurysms. Um, this is another view showing that if you open up the porous trigeminus, this can allow you to get into the Meckel's cave. And then the advantage of this anterior petrosal is that you get a look backwards view on the brainstem. And when you do a retrosigmoid approach, you generally cannot look behind this area of uh, cerebellum that's wrapped around the tumor. And so this is an advantage of coming uh, uh, from the front 
through this anterior protrusal view. You can do it through a, a middle fossa craniotomy or alternatively a frontotemporal craniotomy. And um, head positioning is very critical. I think the, the rookie mistake is to position the patient complete lateral. And if you do this, your petrous bone is uh, facing uh, deeper away from the surgeon when you're looking at this type of view. So look, let's say, look, uh, see the anterior petrous apex here. Look how it's farther away from your line of sight and target. But if you position the patient's head so that you're about 30 degrees from horizontal, notice how the petrous ridge now is flat and the petrous apex is closer to the surgeon's tar, uh, line of sight and target. So uh, an option is to do a drop down zygomatic osteotomy um, if you need to get lower. Uh, I, I say in general this is generally not needed, but uh, I think it can be more useful if you're dealing with anterior infratemporal fossa lesions, and this is where you gain the most advantage. But if it's more posterior your infratemporal, uh, you could see the slope, it doesn't give you as much advantage. So we do this through a, a frontotemporal incision and interfascial dissection of the temporalis muscle. This allows you to protect the frontalis branch of the facial nerve. And then you can do this uh, uh, T-bone cutting, doing a drop-down zygomatic osteotomy. This brings the temporalis muscle more inferiorly, so it doesn't obstruct the surgeon's line of sight. You can see in this cadaver dissection we performed exposing this horizontal and vertical petrous ICA. See how the drop-down zygomatic osteotomy allows this temporalis muscle to come down even further so you have a flush view of the petrous ICA. And, and this gives you a more basal trajectory uh, to the middle fossa floor with less temporal lobe brain retraction. We then start to peel the dura off the floor of the middle fossa to expose the petrous apex uh, and, and you generally uh, will peel it from a posterior to anterior fashion and you want to expose this rhomboid structure and this is the key to understanding middle fossa. Uh, you don't use stealth or image guidance but you use anatomical landmarks and this is a, a nice anatomical landmark that was described by Fukushima back in the mid 90's. Um, it's formed by the posterior margin of V3 the GSPN, the arcuate eminence, and then the medial petrous ridge. And you could see on this cadaver dissection, here's that Fukushima rhomboid, and then here's Glasscox triangle outlined in blue. And if you take a uh, imaginary line and bisect the angle at the genicular ganglion, this gives you the rough idea of where the internal auditory canal is. And anteromedial to this is the cochlear angle, or, or in general, where the basal turn of the cochlea will reside. So this rhomboid will give you this landmark so that you can have x-ray vision to visualize where these critical neuroodologic structures are, namely the ICA of the petrous carotid and the cochlea and IAC facial and cochlear nerves. So when you drill, you generally want to drill from a medial to lateral direction. Um, we use a self-retaining retractor here, and you want to park it at the medial, park it at the medial petrous ridge, and you leave a little eggshell of bone on here so that your retractor can be held in place. Here is the fold of the IAC dura, and if you follow it distally, stay on the posterior side so that the cochlea is anteromedial to this fold and as you go on the anterior side we call this the premedial triangle you can drill this down to the inferior limit which is the inferior petrosal sinus and you'll see the clivus uh, deep here as you go posteriorly be careful not to violate the arcuate eminence where the superior semicircular canal is and maximize the drilling back here this is the postmedial triangle so if you don't open up enough of the postmedial triangle, there'll be bony obstruction here, and your window is limited. So in order to maximize this window, you want to blue line this area, blue line the superior canal, and really maximize both pre- and postmedial regions.
Know that if you mobilize V3 anteriorly, look how much more extra bone there is underneath the Gessarian ganglion. So there can be a lot of hidden bone in this area that you can uh, have additional exposure. And so um, this will also help maximize that window for you. In some cases, like chondrosarcomas, they tend to invade the uh, infrapetrous bone. And so you can mobilize the ICA from the carotid canal and get access to all this area. And this, is, uh, this comes from a study we did some years ago um, with Dr. Coldwell, my mentor, in exposing the petrous ICA. And, and this was largely out of interest of uh, a more of a historical bypass we used to do, which is the petrous to supraclinoid uh, bypass for giant cavernous aneurysms which are largely treated with flow diverters these days. But this is an important uh, potential bypass that, that can be performed if needed in certain situations. So when we open up the dura, we uh, go subtemporal, and we can open up the dura of the posterior fossa, and then ligate the superior petrosal sinus. And when you ligate this, you can then cut the tentorium towards the free edge of the incisura. When you do this, be very careful of the location of the fourth nerve uh, because this uh, you want to stay behind the entrance of the fourth nerve. But see how this gets you into this area of the brainstem uh, between the fifth and the seventh and fourth and fifth nerves as well. And here's another view showing the anatomical exposure nicely of the brainstem. And this gives you that anterior to posterior view of the brainstem the view that you don't get when you're doing a retrosigmoid approach. Uh, know that the sixth nerve will enter Dorello's canal here and it's a confluence of sinuses between the posterior cavernous, inferior patrols and superior patrols of sinuses. We can decompress the porous trigeminus to free up the fifth nerve and get into Meckel's cave in this area. So let's look at some case examples. This is a patient with this uh, uh, upper petroclival meningioma. It's uh, petroclival because the origin of the tumor is medial to the fifth nerve as you see here. And you can see it's uh, causing an indentation of the brainstem here. So we did this through a, a Kawasi's approach. This was a frontotemporal incision, frontotemporal craniotomy, and the first step we do is we ligate the uh, middle meningeal artery and then divide it sharply at the frame and spinosum. This will help untether te the temporal lobe and then we peel the, the temporal lobe dura off of the floor of the middle fossa from a posterior to anterior fashion, paying attention to where the GSPN is and uh, keeping the GSPN down into the facial hiatus. And then we can do the same and peel that dura propria off of the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. There's the foramen ovale where V3 is. And these periosteal adhesions tend to be uh, uh, very adherent. So you gotta use sharp dissection with a little uh, 15, feather, 15 blade using a feathering technique or sharp dissection with micro scissors. And I generally like to decompress the foramen ovale uh, just by following the V3 into the infratemporal fossa and this can help untether the nerve so that I can mobilize it anteriorly to get the anterior petrous apex. So there's the middle fossa rhomboid, there's V3, GSPN, arcuate eminence, and medial petrous ridge and then we'll begin our drilling from a medial to lateral fashion. So we'll start to drill uh, on the medial side and then this is the retrogasserian petrous apex and then we can thin this down using an eggshell technique with a high-speed diamond drill with a lot of copious irrigation and then there's the IAC dura and so now we'll go ahead and open up the subtemporal dura elevate the temporal lobe and there's the subtemporal portion of the uh, tumor this is the supratentorial component and so we'll go ahead and debulk it with an ultrasonic aspirator and then dissect around the tumor, peeling it from uh, uh, the rest of the temporal lobe and um, identify the origin here. Okay. 
we'll go ahead and debulk more of this tumor and then prepare to uh, cut the posterior fossa dura open and the tentorium so there's the medial uh, edge of the tentorial incisura here's the lateral edge of the tentorium which is the superior petrosal sinus you can uh, tie this off with a suture ligature or alternatively I like to just use a bipolar and seal off the entrance of the sinus I now can open up the posterior fossa dura which was exposed with our Kawasis drilling and then we cut the tentorium towards the free edge and now it expands our window and you can see there's Dandy's vein right here this is the superior petrosal vein entering into that tentorium and I'm just gonna coagulate it here but keep this flow here of this vein so I can mobilize this and, and get wider exposure so now we'll go ahead and open the porous trigeminus and that's the fibrous ring we can follow the fifth nerve into the Gasserian ganglia and this exposed Meckel's cave so there's tumor in Meckel's cave you can see we're working just behind the fifth nerve and uh, this is an excellent way of getting into Meckel's cave in my mind you can certainly do this through a retrosigmoid supramiatal approach as popularized by Professor Sami. Uh, but this gives you a different uh, uh, working corridor into Meckel's cave. And look how we're working all anterior to the fifth nerve. The seventh nerve is not even in our way. And we have the tentorial open, so we're, we're, we're pretty much working from above the tentorium, looking down into the posterior fossa. So different kind of perspective than what we're used to with a retrosigmoid approach. We peel the arachnoid off of the tumor capsule and then remove this portion of the tumor. There's the basilar artery. The brain stems nicely in view. The fifth nerve you can see is intact. And uh, reconstruction is very important. We do a multi-layered repair with a, a duragen with a little bit of fat graft to seal off the opening and then I think we do another piece of duragen here. And then I harvest a uh, large vascularized pedi pedicled pericranial flap that's pedicled posteriorly and then I can rotate that and swing that into position uh, to get a nice reconstruction. So here's the pre-op scan, here's the post-op scan, a complete removal, no deficits. Here's another example, this is a uh, trigeminal dum dumbbell trigeminal schwannoma large CP angle component with some indentation of the brainstem. Um, this I did through a, a Kawasi's approach with a zygomatic arch drop down and so you, here you can see we've uh, exposed Kawasi's triangle and uh, drilling out the anterior petrous apex from a medial to lateral fashion. There's the end of the drilling. We'll go ahead and open up the dura subtemporally and then open up the posterior fossa dura, incise the tentorium after ligating the superior petrosal sinus and now we're going to open up the porous trigeminus here this fibrous ring of dura and this will expose the tumor that's in Meckel's cave and there's the trunk of the trigeminal nerve we can begin to peel the tumor away from the arachnoid membrane so that the arachnoid membrane is mobilized towards the vascular structures Debulking the tumor is very useful as it collapses. Here's 7 and 8 going into the IAC. Look how the, the view of this 7 and 8 is much different than what we're used to with a retrosigmoid. And then we're peeling the tumor away from the brainstem here. And here's the trunk of the fifth nerve wrapped over the top of the tumor. When you're doing trigeminal schwannoma surgery, you want to preserve as many of the fascicles and the trigeminal uh, uh, trunk nerve root and so here is the uh, dissection of the tumor from these nerve fibers and there's the final removal you can see here's the fifth nerve completely intact going into the Gasserian ganglion here's the fifth nerve again and this was a nice uh, complete removal of the tumor and he only had very minimal facial numbness post-op it's been stable Here's an example of a, a large um, epidermoid tumor wrapped around the brain stem. You can see it's severely compressed, has gait ataxia and hydrocephalus from effacement of the fourth ventricle. And I like to use a Fiesta scan to look at the contents uh, of the tumor 
And so what is the surgical approach here? It's wrapped around the brain stem. My initial thought was to come in just through a simple retrosigmoid combined with a far lateral because it opens up frame and magnum and look how the tumor extends well below the tonsils uh, over the C1 uh, spinal cord. So I think extending this to a far lateral was very useful. There's the pearly whites of the tumor being removed and uh, at the end of the resection here um, you know I noticed that there was a nerve fiber here that was transected and I realized that that was the sixth nerve I must have evulsed it when removing these large chunks of the tumor but when you see this be very uh, vigilant in finding the other end because this transected sixth nerve can recover if you find the two ends and repair it so it's very critical that you find the other end now some people suggest just putting a, a fiber and glue over the two ends but um, I always worry about the wave of CSF crashing into the the non sutured anastomosis and and uh, washing the two ends apart and that would result in failure so I, I prefer and I would recommend just putting a suture and you just need a single suture this is a tenno a suture and, and you can reanastomose the nerve ends just with uh, a few few knots and um, just be careful as you're tying these knots you you don't you know, bang against the seventh nerve and you could rest the the nerve up against the petrous bone and then put some fiber and glue on, on that so this is the drawback of that retrosigmoid approach you see how you're looking parallel to the petra surface and you end up with this residual tumor on the back side and here she is at four months with some partial recovery of the sixth nerve and then here at seven months you can see she's starting to recover so quite remarkable the sixth nerve completely recovered by seven months uh, at nine months unfortunately you see the tumor starting to grow back and so now we're at a dilemma and which approach should we do this time should we go through the same approach again and this time I decided to come in Kawasi's anterior petrosal because of this viewing angle from front to back and I don't have to mobilize the cerebellum so we'll do this through a right-sided anterior petrosal approach there's the rhomboid and I actually extended it this is another way of extending and maximizing your anterior petrosal is I did a uh, mini petrosal where I skeletonized the otic capsule in order to allow me to maximize the um, posterior medial drilling and I can come around the corner of the otic capsule and, it, and uh, drill out more of this pre-sigmoid uh, petrous bone and, and this will allow me to cut out more of the tentorium and you'll see here in a minute why this was useful here we see the uh, tentorium and when we uh, there's the fourth nerve right here and when we cut the tentorium we land right on the superior cerebellar surface and look how we can get access to all this tumor just at the top of the cerebellum and then we're now looking back at that pocket of where that yellow arrow is that's where this tumor is just behind the 7th and 8th nerve complex. Very difficult to see with my previous retro sigmoid approach and then we can get a complete removal and save that 7th and 8th nerve. There's the 6th nerve that was repaired from 9 months ago. You can see it's uh, nicely uh, restored. And then there's the 5th and the 4th nerve looking higher up. And then here's the post up scan. You can see complete removal, excellent decompression of the brainstem. So let's look at some vascular lesions. This is a, uh, uh, a uh, uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage. You can see here, this is from an AVM uh, that was, um, I'm sorry, this is a, a mycotic, mycotic aneurysm from a distal SCA. You can see it's got this mushroom cloud shape of it. This is a, not a saccular aneurysm, but rather a pseudo aneurysm. And, um, you know, instead of doing this retrosigmoid, I felt that doing this Kawasi's approach, I can see the SCA in its longitudinal direction much better. So that if I needed to 
do an end-to-end -end anastomosis, I would be in better position to do so. So here is the Kawasaki drilling. And there's the uh, subtemporal dural opening. And so we'll go ahead and cut the tentorium to the free edge to open up this area. And now we'll open up the subarachnoid space. And uh, you can see there's the fibrin plug of that pseudoaneurysm. <clears throat> and you'll see that it'll spontaneously start to bleed here without really any manipulation. And th th this is very classic of pseudoaneurysms. There's, these are not true aneurysms. They're just a big hole in the artery with some clot forming the, the wall. So I um, try to stop some of this bleeding uh, with bipolar, and of course that's not going to work. So uh, I just kind of uh, put a clip on where I think the bleeding point is, and uh, here I just got lucky and I was able to stop the bleeding. But at least this gives you control, and now you can dissect under a more controlled situation. And now I find the proximal SCA. I'm going to put a temporary clip on the proximal SCA. And um, then find the distal SCA. So there's the distal SCA. And then now that I have uh, temporaries on both ends, I can take out the first two clips and then interrogate what's going on. Uh, look how this vessel is completely diseased. It's, it's almost as if a shotgun uh, uh, exploded through this vessel wall. And uh, I wasn't able to re this, but it was fine. The patient already had a, a, a existing SCA stroke from the initial hemorrhage. So we just sacked the, uh, the vessel distally and there was no residual aneurysm and no residual deficit. Um, this is a petrous uh, cholesterol granuloma. You can see it's indenting the brain stem. Uh, we largely do this through an endonasal approach now, but sometimes you can have these small difficult corridors uh, between the prepontine CSF cistern and the carotid. So it's a very difficult to get to this uh, cyst. So we'll do this through a middle fossa approach and then put a catheter in the cyst. And if you drill a hole between V1 and V2, this will access the sphenoid sinus and you could thread a catheter from the cyst into the sphenoid sinus and keep this area patent and we took it a step further and, and added a transmastoid exposure and uh, put the cath the the cyst catheter into the uh, mastoid cavity and so we call it this the call this the double exhaust technique and uh, you have two catheters that can drain the cyst contents into the uh, spaces and so um, this is the video showing uh, temporal lobe elevation there's the cyst contents empty out the cyst contents and you generally don't need to resect all of the cyst wall here if you do this you you can get a CSF leak and it defeats the purpose of doing this uh, catheter technique you really need to keep the drainage pathway open to prevent recurrence. And so I'm just cutting out the lateral component of the cyst wall, but leaving the medial component adherent to the posterior fossa dura. So there's the cyst wall being cut out. So now we're going to drill a hole between V1 and V2. You can see the sphenoid sinus is exposed now. There's the sphenoid sinus. And then we thread our, our catheters into that uh, sphenoid sinus. There's the catheter going into the sphenoid sinus. And uh, look at the post-op scan. This is a uh, patient's been 11 years now, no recurrence. Probably the longest, uh, longest one I've seen for a cyst that size. And his facial and hearing came back after this uh, procedure. Uh, the combined patrosal is sort of the, uh, the the maximal of the if the anterior co uh, patrosal. You can get more exposure if you add a posterior patrosal, and this is what uh, Professor Almefti calls the double martini uh, exposure. And you preserve the otic capsule to try to preserve hearing, but it gives you a presigmoid and subtemporal exposures. And we did this through for this recurrent brainstem cavernoma, the patient was treated with a previous retrosigmoid, 
at a different hospital and then undergone an endonasal transclival approach as a second procedure when the cavernoma recurred and it was still recurring and he was having uh, cranial nerve deficits, six nerve, facial palsy, hearing loss and so um, when I saw this patient you could see the cavernoma came up to the surface between the fifth and the seventh nerves and so when I see this type of picture uh, anterior petrosal is my my route of choice uh, there is a DVA here so you have to be careful not to violate that DVA and so I took his previous retrosigboid s-shaped incision and extended it behind the hairline and, and did a combined petrosal approach with the large pericranial flap and so we published this video not too long ago showing how to do this so we come in subtemporally elevate the middle fossa dura from posterior to anterior uh, there's the GSPN ligate the middle meningeal artery and then we'll continue the peeling of the dura propria off of the posterior cavernous sinus little venous bleeding can be contr controlled with surgiflow and then we'll go ahead and do our anterior petrosectomy like I had described and then we begin to do our retro labyrinthine mastoidectomy and then we can skeletonize the iota capsule here there's the superior semicircular canal and then we finish our uh, combined petrosal approach here open up the dura subtemporally and then we'll connect it uh, through a pre-sigmoid dural incision as well. We want to look for the fourth nerve underneath the tentorium before we cut the tentorium. And um, opening up the posterior fossa dura here. So there's the superior petrosal sinus. We'll go ahead and coagulate it. And then when before you cut the tentorium, we want to find out where the fourth nerve is. There's the fourth nerve, and we'll cut behind the entrance of the fourth nerve so we don't uh, transect it. And there's the fifth nerve now. And then there's the exophytic of the cavernoma just below the fifth nerve. So we try to go pre sigmoid, but it's very scarred in here. You can see the cerebellum is really stuck to the dura. So I, I changed my approach and I worked primarily through the Kawasis corridor. There's the cavernoma, the exophytic component. Removing it in a piecemeal fashion. Using a little bit of uh, uh, tension with a little bit of suction dissection. And then after we remove that component, you can see there's more cavernoma here in the brain stem. Some hemosiderin stained brain just behind this paratrigeminal area and then we can start getting into more of the cavernoma here you can see there's a nice gliotic plane here at the depths of our cavity and then we'll just carefully dissect around it and there's another mulberry lesion in this area that we'll remove now this was quite scarred in uh, patients had two prior surgeries so uh, the adhesions tend to be more uh, strict and uh, there tends to be stiffer uh, scar tissue in that bed of the uh, the brain stem so it can be a little bit more challenging and so I often will use a heavier curved scissors here by suctioning the cavernoma and then uh, cutting out that uh, scar tissue with the cavernoma now there's the DVA be aware of that DVA it's don't mistake in it for a piece of cavernoma and you grab it and then at the end I tend to use an endoscope to look around the corners look at the resection cavity you can see there's the fifth nerve and uh, you'll see there's the DVA uh, down in the depths and there's the fourth nerve so here's the uh, double patrosal corridor of access and there's the post-op scan you can see complete removal of the cavernoma and the DVA is nicely preserved interestingly his cranial nerve deficits all came back to normal uh, he just had very minimal trace uh, arm and leg weakness. Um, I like these combined patrosal approaches for large petroclival meningiomas like this that goes into Meckel's cave. We do it through a large uh, C-shaped incision 
there's the combined patrolsal approach and uh, this is the initial petrosectomy going retro lab and then opening up the dura like you saw before subtemporally ligating the superior patrolsal sinus and then going pre-sigmoid there's ligation of the superior patrolsal sinus and then we'll go ahead and cut the tentorium to the free edge and then we get wide access of the tumor this is the seventh and eighth nerves you saw there to the right here's the brain stem you can see we can land right on the brain stem and then we can finish the cutting of the tentorium towards the petrous apex and release all of this tissue there's the fifth nerve we can work above the fifth nerve just under the tentorium in that tight corridor and then use an ultrasonic aspirator to aspirate the rest of the tumor luckily this tumor was uh, soft and um, the um, the important thing is you get great control of that tentorium and oftentimes the blood supply is, comes from that tentorium and when you cut out that tentorium you really eliminate the blood supply and once that's done the tumor becomes a lot softer a lot less vascular and, and easier to remove here's the final view you can see a nice view of the brain stem nicely decompressed here's the post-op scan and the patient had an excellent outcome no neurological deficits here's another one compressing the brain stem this is a uh, enhancing trigeminal schwannoma we published this recently in operative neurosurgery you can refer to here's the otic capsule nicely skeletonized combined patrolsal there's the dural opening again I'll skip this since you've seen this already. Here's ligation of the superior patrolsal sinus and then cutting the tentorium to the free edge, paying attention to the fourth nerve. We'll then uh, expose the tumor here. You can see this is the trigeminal nerve. There's the trigeminal nerve and you can see wide access of this whole tumor coming from a left-sided pre-sigmoid window. We'll decompress the tumor here. Now here is the seventh and eighth nerve complex here we're working above seven and eight there's seven and eight and then we'll cut the rest of this tentorium to finish our exposure there's the uh, SCA there's the fourth nerve working at the top pole of the tumor and we'll open up the porous trigeminus here like we did before this helps us get into Meckel's cave and uh, remove all of this soft tumor and remove all of the infratrigeminal portion of the tumor working in between five and seven and six nerve is usually at the very end and um, you always have to be careful because uh, the six nerve can be injured and uh, there's the uh, basilar uh, artery in the brain stem and we'll remove this last portion of the tumor there's the basilar artery I'm sorry this is the true basilar and then there's the sixth nerve the abducens nerve a little bit of remnant of tumor on here that was stuck I just left a little residue behind and again using our endoscope we can nicely see all of the cranial nerves in the CP angle and so here's a nice complete removal of the tumor, nice decompression of that brain stem. So you should understand there are some variations. You can start with a retro lab, but if the you still want more room and still preserve hearing, you can remove the superior and posterior canals. This is called the transcrucial approach. This gives you more exposure. And you can um, do a full trans lab if the hearing is already uh, impaired. And then if you mobilize the facial nerve uh, 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 towards you, you can have access to the cochlea, making this a trans cochlear approach. But we generally don't do this because this leaves you with a, at least at best, a House Brackman grade 3 palsy. So here's an example where I use the transcrucial approach with this large petroclival. Look how the brain stem is wrapped around the back of the tumor. If you try to do this through retrosigmoid, you end up uh, uh, mobilizing and manipulating a lot of important tissue 
Uh, so if I come in anterior and posterior petrosal, it really minimizes that. And I'll just quickly show you the highlights of this. This is just the tentorial cutting, as you can see. Being careful to preserve those veins of labae posteriorly. Here we're putting in a suture ligature to ligate the superior petrosal sinus. And then there is the seventh nerve coming into view. And then we're, all, we're, we're working all above seventh nerve, you see. And the tumor here is nice and soft. There's the uh, brain stem being peeled away. And then there's the basilar artery up. There's the basilar artery at the depths of the view. And we're going to open up the porous trigeminus again like we did before, cutting that uh, 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 dura over the uh, Meckel's cave. And then you'll see here in a moment we're working underneath the trigeminal. Nice soft tumor. There's the trunk of the trigeminal nerve. And the difficult part here is the fourth nerve. It's wrapped over the top of this tumor, but look how we can keep those arachnoids and, and peel the arachnoid by mobilizing the tumor down. And there's the fourth nerve. You can see it draped over the top and we'll use the uh, micro scissors using sharp dissection, cutting the arachnoid to free it and then we'll remove the rest of this with uh, ultrasonic aspiration. There's the fourth nerve there. And again, using our scissors to cut the arachnoid to release the tumor, and this frees the arachnoid so you can mobilize that arachnoid towards the nerves and the vessels on the brainstem side. And so that's the technique. There's the last portion of the tumor. And uh, there's the uh, view endoscopically of all the cranial nerves and a closure with a uh, fascial lata graft, fat graft, and a, and a plate. Okay, and this was a radical near total. I left a little residue on the trigeminal rootlets, and uh, this has not recurred for the last four years now. And and then lastly, here's a, uh, a quadrangular cerebellum AVM being fed by this distal SCA. Uh, and uh, when we're doing AVM surgery, I, I think exposure is very important. Uh, instead of working in a deep hole um, uh, through a retrosigmoid, which you can do, uh, this one I had a nice wide exposure. You can see where we land right on the cerebellum here. So this is like very superficial in my exposure. It's not deep in the view. There's the SCA. And I was looking for small feeders from the SCA going into the AVM here of the cerebellum. And then you can see, watch how this uh, arterialized vessel now becomes blue as I'm devascularizing the AVM. And then the rest is just uh, dissecting around this area of char. It's, it's not a big AVM, it's a small micro AVM. Uh, and then we can continue to just work around that gliotic capsule using sharp dissection to cut the uh, cauterized feeders. And then there's the final view. You can see it's uh, uh, nicely charred. And there's the resection cavity. This is the SCA that's preserved and then uh, complete re removal, no residual. Uh, I'm gonna skip uh, this case for the interest of time, but this just goes to show you that you can use the coases combined with the orbitozygomatic approach for these sphenocavernous, uh, sphenopetroclival meningiomas. Uh, so I think in conclusion, the anti-petrosal approach is a versatile approach to access the brainstem, petroclival region, and Meckel's cave. And knowing that rhomboid structure, I think, is the key to navigating these neurotologic structures. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor, for uh, this uh, excellent presentation. Uh, there is uh, one question here and a question about. Is there any additional adverse effect after the sinus? coagulation? 
Um, I, I think you, um, it's important to study the venous anatomy ahead of time. Um, I, I think in general it's well tolerated, but you do have to be careful. There can be some risk of uh, venous infarct of the temporal lobe. Um, so you, you do need to know the venous drainage pattern. I, I think it's very important to preserve as many veins as you can in the subdural space. So for example, the veins of Labay, you have to protect with uh, you know, moist uh, bicol patties. And, um, but uh, for the most part, the, the superior petrosal sinus is, is well, well tolerated when they're ligating it. So, uh, which structure uh, you will preserve more, veins or, uh, or arteries? Well, I think you have to preserve, you know, all neurovascular structures. I mean, arteries are important because you don't want arterial stroke, but uh, the veins can, can bite you from behind. So you have to be very careful, try to preserve as many as possible. Um, I, I will take the superior patrosal vein uh, selectively, and if I do, I, I take it as close to the tentorium as possible and preserve any unpassage venous drainage so you can, you can maintain any alternate pathways of flow. Okay, thank you. Uh, what about uh, nerves? Uh, which uh, nerve uh, will be more fragile at uh, this point and uh, you will uh, care to um, not to be cut to, during your surgery? Well, we tried to not cut any nerves. <laughs> uh, certainly the eighth nerve I think is very sensitive. Um, sometimes you gentle manipulation or if you look at it the wrong way you you know can lose hearing. Uh, but but you should always preserve the eighth nerve because even if you lose hearing post-op, if the eighth nerve is intact, you can still do a cochlear implant to restore some hearing. Seventh nerve, you know, again, be very careful. The fifth nerve um, is very resilient, so you can do a lot of manipulation around the fifth nerve. And of course, the fourth nerve, uh, you know, be very gentle. It's a very fragile nerve. It's long and um, but if you transect the fourth or the six nerves, those can be repaired and you can have potential for full recovery, as I showed you. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, any more questions from panelists? Hi, James. Outstanding presentation as, as usual. Beautiful, beautiful. And uh, congratulations. Um, especially for young neurosurgeons uh, who, who decide to perform uh, her or his first anterior pet petrosectomy, I, I want to ask you two questions. Uh, the, do you use external lumbar drainage uh, um, prior to the surgery? This is the first one. And uh, the other one, the limits of the uh, anterior petrosectomy are uh, really clear in the superior border, in the medial border, and of course in the anterolateral border. But especially in the post posterior, posterior, um, lateral border, we need to take care with the internal auditory canal. Uh, if the if in the surgical room we have not a neural navigation system, we kind of what kind of uh, suggestion or. Um, or, or, or measurements we need to use uh, in order to avoid to enter inside of the internal auditory canal? Great question, Matthias. Um, I would say for, for the young people who are starting out, you really need to spend many times dissecting in the laboratory. And I, that's how I, I got comfortable. You know, I was actually doing many dissections in preparation for a publication and um, it helped me get comfortable with the anatomy so you you really need to know the anatomy but also when you're dissecting you're actually rehearsing the same technical movements that you would do in surgery um, I generally don't do a lumbar drain for pure anterior patrosal 
um, but I will do it for combined patrosal only because those combined patrols will have a higher risk of pseudomeningocele and so I like to have the lumbar drain already in place but I think if you're beginning and starting out a lumbar drain is not a bad idea um, in terms of the posterolateral lateral limit how do you know you're in the IAC um, well the um, as you're drilling from medial to lateral I look for the fold or what I call the funnel of the IAC dura so the IAC dura will be wider on the medial side and as you go from medial to lateral it becomes more narrow on the lateral side the other thing you should be uh, uh, to know is you go medial to lateral the IAC starts from deeper and as you go lateral the IAC becomes more superficial and if you don't recognize that you can injure the facial nerve especially the lateral aspect of the IAC the nerves are closer they become tighter and so it's more sensitive especially as you get to the fundus and also the labyrinthine segment I generally don't skeletonize the labyrinthine segment for these approaches it's not necessary because most of your tumor is going to be in the CP angle and the other um, method you can do is you can blue line the uh, superior semicircular canal so if you can blue line it uh, or if you work with an ENT they can help you with that this gives you an idea of the posterolateral lateral limit between the IAC and the superior semicircular canal we call that the post meatal triangle thanks Okay, uh, any more question? I don't see uh, any more questions. Thank you, uh, Dale, uh, Professor Leo, for an excellent presentation. Thank you all for joining us uh, today. It was an amazing uh, session and presentations, and I hope we will meet soon. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Sami. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.